Good morning, Colorado. This is the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. It is January 12th. This is our normal weekly hearing. We have a packed agenda, so why don't we go ahead and get started with the roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Bogue. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner Hackett. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven commissioners present. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Hearings Manager Larson. Um, you do have a little bit of feedback coming back um, with your mic. So just FYI, uh, we could hear you. It wasn't like a reverberating, but it was more of a uh, Charlie Brownish sort of scuttle sort of thing. So FYI. Um, Okay, uh, we start out the morning with commissioner comments. Uh, I know we've got an update from Commissioner Nanjapa on the Wildlife Biological Resources Workgroup later. So that's its own sort of agendized item. Does any other commissioner have comments for us? I know that all commissioners have been uh, deeply vetted with the financial assurance filings that we've had. Uh, we're working through those. We will start up financial assurances hearings uh, latter part of next week. Um, appreciate everybody's participation with us on the financial assurance uh, rulemaking. Um, a lot to dive through there. Uh, any other comments from commissioners? All right, seeing none, I will move down the agenda to general public comment. Uh, we had one person that signed up for public comment, that is uh, Linnea South. We also had a written public commenter, Karen Calafity, and we appreciate Ms. Calafity's written public comment that we've read. Uh, Ms. Larson or Ms. Uh, Amaro, are we able to locate Ms. South in the hearing? Yes, and she should be a panelist. Oh, there we go. Good morning, Ms. South. Nice to see you. Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Linnea South, and I'm the Assistant County Attorney for Route County. And this morning, Route County is seeking support from the Commission with respect to a well in Route County, which is threatening to operate without a county special use permit, but more importantly, threatening to operate outside the COGC regulations claiming that the regulations do not apply to this well and they are somehow grandfathered in and that they do not have to comply with any of the current regulations. The well is Dry Creek UTHD 31-1A pilot hole. The API number is 05107-61751. And it has COGCC permit number 91790. The operator is Ephitha LLC. It's a small operator, and this is the only well um, that we're aware of they own in the state of Colorado. Um, the history of the well goes back to 1991 when the well was drilled. Um, it had a COGC permit, but they had not obtained a county special use permit. But from approximately 2004 to the present, the well has been shut in and temporarily abandoned. And now 17 plus years later, Ephitha has stated it, 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 it intends to begin operations as early as today, January 12th. Um, Route County is preparing to file a complaint in district court um, this week, and we'll seek a preliminary injunction if necessary. But we truly do believe that action by the COGCC to simply state what the current regulations require of operations may go far in curbing Ephitha's threats. The county has spoken with the COGCC staff, and we definitely thank them for their time, cooperation, and frankly, patience with um, the county as we do not have a lot of oil and gas uh, issues around here, um, but we are at a critical juncture um, and it is our understanding staff 
is unwilling to notify FFA of the applicability of the current regulations. Um, I am trying to speak quickly, I apologize. Um, but with specifically with respect to the regulations, FFA has stated specifically in a, during, in a public hearing that um, they were under the assumption that the new regulations would not apply to them and specifically stated that this well will not meet those regulations. They have said that they've had discussions with COGCC and were told the new regulations would not apply. In writing, EFTA has stated that at no time has the state said they would be obligated to conform to the new COGC regulations and they express their intent to somehow seek to be grandfathered in to the old regulations. In materials they've submitted to the county, they make no mention of making any new filings with the COGCC or obtaining new approvals, but they do mention the possibility of flaring and fracking. Um, while I think there's several issues here, I would point specifically to rule 903D that comes into effect on the 15th, requiring a pipeline or gas capture plan. There has been no mention of any intent to or ability to comply with these requirements. These are threats to the public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. At a minimum, we're looking at an area where there are three houses within 2,000 feet of this well. There's a water well that services a subdivision in the area within 30 feet, about 38 feet. And there's another water well within 800 feet. Uh, the county's legal authority is only as, as to its regulations, with the, which at this point center around the fact that Ephitha has not obtained a county special use permit. And we do believe that the COGCC providing clarity to Ephitha would potentially avert this well from beginning operations without proper approvals and endangering that public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. South, for uh, the bringing this to our attention. Uh, we will, um, uh, as a commission, we don't have anything before us. And so there's no action item for us at this point in time. Uh, I feel we will probably want to hear from our staff um, relevant to this matter. And so I know that uh, staff has been listening in as well. I'm pleased to hear that staff has been working with your community on this matter as well. Um, and so we will hold the comments where they are right now, and um, we will uh, hear from staff. I'm sure staff will be getting back to you as well. Um, of course, uh, under SB 19181, a fair tranche of authority was provided to local governments. Um, and so um, I understand that you're taking what actions you feel are necessary for your community um, and are, you know, again, appreciative of that fact as well. So, okay, um, we didn't have anybody else sign up for public comment. So we will continue down our agenda. The next matter is the consent agenda. Did any commissioner have any questions with regard to the eight matters that were agendized on consent? Seeing no questions, do we have a motion to approve consent? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, uh, consent agenda, uh, any opposed? Seeing none, uh, consent agenda is approved unanimously. Continuing down our agenda, since we have a packed one, we will keep moving. Uh, the next matter is a, if there is an opportunity for a report from the director. I see Director Murphy is with us. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm getting feedback too. 
Can anybody else hear it or is it just me? You're sounding okay. Okay. Um, thank you all for the time. And um, I think the one thing that I do want to flag is that I will start and give most of the presentation on um, the orphan well thing with Scott and Jarrett as my support team in the upcoming um, agenda item. And I think the, the biggest update that we have, and this ties very much into the, up, the forthcoming update, is that we have announced that Dave Andrews will be transitioning from being our engineering manager to our orphan well program manager. Um, and I, it's an incredible opportunity for him. For those of you who don't know, um, Dave single-handedly built our orphan well program with um, approximately zero resources when he was a West Slope engineering supervisor in 2017 and um, did it all using different Google tools and has really been the visionary for the for the um, program. And I couldn't be more proud that he's taking over um, as we're looking to, um, I mean, he's already taken this program from being a half a million dollar program a year to a $5 million program a year. So I guess jumping from five to 10 isn't that, that, that daunting for him, I hope, but we're incredibly excited about that. And it does also create a vacancy on our management team, which we will be posting um, and filling hopefully in the near future. So that's the biggest staffing update. Um, I think that it, it is good to know, and we've been noting in different operator meetings that the 903 prohibition on flaring does go into effect on January 15th, which is just a few days away. Um, and that will you know change some of the course of business and will probably bring some matters to your attention as we move forward. I know that there are, there's at least one docketed item upcoming. Um, I think with that, Chair, I would um, turn it back to you and uh, look forward to the rest of the day. Great. Um, give me just one second. Yes. Sorry. Once again, I am babysitting a poodle puppy who was getting into a bag of chocolate. So um, that is no longer the case. The chocolate is on the kitchen counter and uh, we will be able to proceed. Apologies uh, in advance for the working from home too much information. Um, uh, Director Murphy, I do wanna uh, thank you for that uh, introduction um, and for that uh, information with regard to Mr. Andrews um, having served as director for a stint I relied upon Mr. Andrews quite a bit, and he is absolutely the perfect person for this uh, job. And um, the state is well served um, on having him there. And we look forward to uh, the continued work on the Orphan Well Project. So, okay, uh, with that, um, we will continue down our agenda. Um, Mr. Chair, a little ahead of time. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just had a question for Director Murphy. Um, and thanks for the presentation. I did just want to follow up to the public comment on the route county um, well, and um, particularly understanding that uh, the rule 903 does go into effect um, this Friday, I think, or the 15th. Um, I assume that we'll be following up to ensure that, um, and knowing nothing about this particular situation, um, that this particular operator is in full compliance with the rules. And yes, Commissioner, we're monitoring that situation very closely. I think that there are a litany of rules that rule changes that do apply to this operation. For example, the rule that you cited, my understanding is the well is not in production. Ergo, there's nothing to flare. Ergo, there's not an issue with 903 right now. Um, if the well does come into production, it will be an issue. I, I assume, I don't know. I mean, we need to, that's part of what the planning process is. I think the conversations that we've had around grandfathering relate to the fact that the well is drilled and therefore it doesn't need to go through an OGDP or two process. Um, but the operational requirements that you all adopted certainly do apply. Um, so there's, there's a, it's a big conversation. And, you know, we've been, I would, I think closely engaged with Route County trying to facilitate the, the dialogue around this issue. Um, it, I've been looped into it and AAG Stafford has been working with council for Route County on it. And so if, if there's more to discuss, happy to, um, but we are watching it, we are inspecting it and we are monitoring compliance with the rules as they exist today, not as they existed a decade ago. Thank you, I appreciate that response. 
Thank you, Director Murphy, for that response. Um, with that, we will continue down our agenda. Um, we have next a presentation on the new AQCC oil and gas rules and well liquids unloading by uh, Robin Willey, APCD Chief Strat Strategy Officer. Um, we are a little ahead of time, and so I would see if she is available. There she is. Wow. Thank you very much for showing up. We look forward to hearing from you. Are you ready to go? I know we're a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mimi, do you have my slides? Uh, I Let's see. I mean, I can... Um, I we can, can certainly... We can certainly run them for you and apologies. I just, I'm not seeing them right away. Let me ask Ms. Amaro if she has them. Ms. Amaro has them, so we can, we can run them for you. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Give us a moment and we'll get that up and running. While we're waiting, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce myself for <clears throat> those of you who don't know me. Um, my name's Robin Willie. I am the Chief Strategy Officer for the Air Division at CDPHE. Thank you so much for inviting me here today um, to commissioners and staff. Really appreciate it. Really excited about the level of coordination between our agencies um, and really appreciate the engagement of you know, Sean Hackett and all of the COGCC commissioners and staff. I um, last year helped develop the new suite of emission regulations adopted by the Air Commission last month. And the purpose of my presentation today is just to give you an overview and highlight a couple areas where our regulations overlap with work done by this agency and the commission. I'm gonna to try to keep my presentation to about 20 minutes so that we have time for questions and discussion. Um, next, I think my, did my slide presentation disappear for y'all? Cause I don't see it anymore. It did, give us one moment. We just need to get that going one more time. Apologies. Oh, you're fine. Just to know, I don't love PowerPoint presentations and when people read me the slides, so my slides are pretty bare bones. So I could probably do this without the slides if we had to. Um, Not a problem. We just needed to get into PowerPoint. I think we were pulling it up via um, PDF. So anyway. All right. Next go. slide, please. So the Air Division and the Air Commission had two primary drivers of this last rulemaking. First was to achieve the legislative directives from last session's Environmental Justice Act 21-1266 to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the oil and gas industry um, by specified percentages. So for the oil and gas sector, the percentages are 36% reduction by 2025 and 60% reduction by 2030 over a 2005 baseline. The other big um, priority, the other big driver was to pursue environmental justice by ensuring that the rules adopted by the commission include protections for disproportionately impacted communities. And I'll note that I'm very excited about the upcoming work of the Environmental Justice Action Task Force to help our agencies understand the differences and the scope of our protections for these communities and to help us reconcile them where that's feasible. Um, and when we're looking at reducing emissions from the oil and gas industry, we're also always looking at reducing ozone precursors because, as you know, we struggle here in the front range with ozone attainment. Next slide. The new regulations adopted by the Air Commission have three components. One is direct regulation, which is the more traditional command and control type regulations. You know, do this by date certain. Um, the other, a second is the greenhouse gas intensity program for upstream operators. And third is a process and a um, steering committee that will develop 
emission reduction plans for midstream fuel combustion equipment. Next slide, please. I'm gonna walk through just at a high level some of the direct regulations, which are found in the Air Commission's regulation number seven. So first, as they relate to air pollution control equipment, some of these provisions apply to all air pollution control equipment and some apply only to enclosed combustion devices. The Air Commission's new rules ensure that all air pollution control equipment used to comply with regulation seven is subject to weekly visual inspections. Um, the new rules also require the use of flow meters and periodic performance testing of most enclosed combustion devices. Another provision relates to emissions off of separation equipment. So previous air commission regulations required capture or control of gas coming off separation equipment where the well was drilled, fracked or refracked after August 2014. You know, following this commission's mission change rulemaking, the Air Commission revised its rules to ca require capture or control of gas coming off all separation equipment unless venting is authorized by this commission pursuant to a variance. Um, you know, our rules wouldn't allow control where this commission's doesn't allow control. It just makes sure the primary reason we did this was to ensure that all control equipment used off separation equipment was subject to the Air Commission's requirements for like inspection and maintenance of that equipment. Next slide, please. The Air Commission really significantly expanded the frequency of leak detection requirements. Um, new sites must conduct monthly inspections for the life of the site. So inspection frequency would no longer step down um, based on emissions level. And that, that's unless the site is developed with specific design alternatives, like a tankless facility design. So if there are no hydrocarbon liquid tanks on sites, with the, the exception of like a maintenance tank, um, and no gas-driven pneumatic controllers and some other requirements around um, certain types of engines, then the site has a um, reduced inspection frequency. The, the idea being that that removes the potential for these emissions from some of this equipment. If you don't have a storage tank, you're not gonna have open thief hatches or you know, overpressurization of the tank. Um, existing sites also have more frequent inspections. Um, and here the commission had a, a really big focus on more inspections and faster repair timelines for sites in disproportionately impacted communities or within a thousand feet of an occupied area. Next slide, please. The commission also adopted more best practices and some capture and control requirements for emissions during well unloading and well swabbing activities. The capture control thresholds are based upon the frequency of unloading activities that result in emissions to the atmosphere. Um, and the free, you know, the thresholds are also dependent on whether the site is located in a disproportionately impacted community or not. The Air Commission did adopt an exception to control where control isn't technically feasible. The issue we need to work through with this commission is an existing requirement of this commission for operators to use enclosed combustion devices instead of allowing for um, the occasional use of open flares where necessary. Um, we, we'd like to work with staff in this commission to develop a more comprehensive approach to ensuring more control of unloading emissions. Um, I think we can all agree that reducing, you know, having the gas vent directly to the atmosphere is not the ideal result here. Um, and so we have some time before this new rule begins to implement in 2023. So um, part of why I'm here today is to ask that, you know, we, we set up some sort of process to work through um, how to ensure more capture or control. The Air Commission also adopted new requirements for midstream operations, <clears throat> ensuring capture from pigging and blowdown activities. The rule allows for control in certain cases, instead of capture, but does set forth a clear regulatory preference for capture of the gas. There are also some best practices for pipeline blowdowns. Next slide, please. One important new rule is the Air Commission corollary to this commission's Rule 904, 
or cumulative impacts report. The Air Commission now has its own annual reporting rule and the Air Commission ensured that information reported annually to the Air Commission is provided to COGCC for COGCC staff to determine whether and how to include that information in the annual Rule 904 report to this commission. The, um, this rule, the Air Commission's rule, differs from Rule 904 in that there isn't one packaged report that goes to the Air Commission. Um, it just ensures that information is reported annually. So for example, every October, the Air Division does a big briefing to the Air Commission on ozone. Um, this new rule ensures, <clears throat> excuse me, that that reporting is provided to COGCC. Um, you know, there's uh, existing statutes and regulations that require the Air Division to present annually to the Commission on um, greenhouse gas progress. Um, and there are other Air Division programs such as the new community-based monitoring program for air toxics, um, you know, that we wanna ensure that this information is provided to COGCC after it's provided to the Air Commission. So we'll be working with the Air Commission in the coming weeks to evaluate the appropriate schedule for this reporting. And we'll work with this commission and staff to ensure that we get you the information you want and that you need to prepare your 904 report. Um, we anticipate working with your contractor as well and have been for the past few weeks to work on this year's report. And hopefully you feel that that process has been going well and um, you know, kudos to Sean for, you know, keeping us on task and making sure like we get you the information that you want in that report. The Air Commission also revised its annual emissions reporting section. So the report that oil and gas operators submit each June discussing and identifying their previous year's emissions. Um, and we ensured one change that we made was to ensure that the COGCC location ID is reported on the Air Division's forms. And, and the one primary driver of that is to help our agencies coordinate and compare and understand, you know, when we're looking at a facility to get sort of a 360 view based on information held by both, both agencies. Right now, it's pretty challenging to track a specific well or well site between the agencies because we all have our unique identifiers. I think we continue to recommend that COGCC consider having sources report their air division identifying information where they have it, like such as the AIRS ID for the same reason, to enable the comparison and sharing of data. Um, I do think it's our understanding that your new consultant will help us help the agencies evaluate the benefits and needs of data sharing. Uh, next slide, please. The Air Commission also adopted a greenhouse gas intensity program for upstream operations. An intensity program, an intensity standard is essentially an emission rate. So it's the amount of emissions per unit of production. In this case, it's all of the greenhouse gas emitted by a company's upstream operations divided by the oil and gas produced, which is converted to barrels of oil equivalent. And there's different standards for a company has its own intensity standard that steps down over time to meet those statutory goals I'm, I discussed at the beginning. And there's also more stringent standards for new development and even more stringent standards for new development in the front range and disproportionately impacted communities. The Air Commission will be conducting another rulemaking in 2023 to determine how to best use top-down monitoring data to ensure accurate reporting of emissions for purposes of compliance with this program. Next slide. As I briefly mentioned before, the Air Commission created a steering committee and a timeline for development of a midstream segment emission reduction plan to address large fuel combustion equipment at midstream sources, boilers, heaters, engines, turbines. And um, this program is designed to lead to an additional rulemaking in 2024. Next slide. This rulemaking process also focused on climate equity and environmental justice. 
in both process and substance. So we held a significant number of additional meetings, large and public, small and targeted, with community members, representatives, and residents of disproportionately impacted communities, those economically dependent on oil and gas operations, and the public at large to inform how best to protect folks and serve the needs of these communities. Our rules in each section, as you can kind of see on this slide, again, I'm not gonna read this to you, um, include additional protections for disproportionately impacted communities. And we believe this is an important area of focus for both our agencies um, now and ever more so in the future. Last slide, please. So with that, I'll wrap up and um, happy to answer any questions that y'all may have and you know, wanna focus um, I'm making sure I get you the information you need about these new rules. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Wiley, for the presentation um, to us this morning. Um, looking to my fellow commissioners, do anyone, does anyone have questions? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thanks for being today and, and summarizing. I was peeking in on some of their deliberations and it was, um, clearly uh, a lot of work <clears throat> and a lot of um, working with stakeholders. I was taking notes during the intensity piece and I think I missed, um, so the, the intensity, the goal, we measure it um, company-wide greenhouse gas emissions compared to the oil and gas produced. Is, is there an overall goal in percentage of reduction? And you may have said it, and I'm sorry. And I, I think I was taking notes and couldn't keep up. Sure, so the, t the intensity targets, um, we have a 2025, a 2027, and a 2030 company-wide intensity target, and those step down over time, and those are designed to ensure that we meet the percentage reductions from the Environmental Justice Act that I talked about in the beginning. So how we set those up is we looked at um, the amount of um, emissions that we that the legislature directed we reduce to. So how, how much emissions do we can we have or allow in this segment to meet the statutory targets? And then we looked at the our projections of production um, in oil and gas from the state. And from that, we created an intensity target that amounts to a 30%, 36% reduction by 2025 over the 2005 baseline, a 50% reduction by 2027, and a 60% reduction by 2030. And so that's how we set those targets. And then we reduce those targets by like 21% for new facilities. So when you when you develop a new facility for the first two years of operation of that facility, it has to have an even more stringent intensity. Um, and, and that's designed to ensure that new, new production is the cleanest that it can possibly be here in the state. And there's an even more stringent new facility intensity target for new sites in the front range in DI communities to ensure that new sites that are permitted to develop in those communities are even cleaner. Thanks, and I um, look forward to the discussion around um, liquids unloading and reducing emissions and what we need to do to support the goals. So thanks for putting that Yeah, together. I mean, I, I would love to um, have you guys, you know, let staff know what's the best process to have those discussions with you guys, whether, um, you know, it's a commissioner-led process or a staff-led process, you know, just to, so that we just keep the discussions ongoing. Um, and, I'll, and I'll just note, that EPA um, last fall proposed new requirements for oil and gas operations and its new source performance standard, Quad O B and Quad O C, and some of those relate to liquids unloading and some of other some other operations. So I think it probably would be good for the agencies to talk about how those new proposals. You know, they're not final yet, so it's just you know consideration. But you know, just to keep the good conversations and good work going. And I, uh, I'll stop, I'll stop there. So I, I appreciate you guys willing to work with us. Great, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, further questions from commissioners? 
Commissioner Hackett. I don't have any questions. I just had a quick comment. Um, wanted to note that these rules were definitely a, the culmination of a lot of hard work by a lot of people, not just at the state, but the rulemaking parties and the public commenters who contributed as well. And I, I did want to say specifically to you, Robin, and your colleague, Steph, Steph Rucker in the Air Division, you really did go above and beyond the call of duty here to get these over the finish line. So just wanted to let you know we're all really proud of you and sincerely appreciate the presentation today and all you've done over the years to improve Colorado's air quality and combat climate change. Um, we're excited to see the enhanced coordination that will result from these rules that were adopted in December, and also excited to see where the Air Division decides to go next to build on all this progress that's been made. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Here, here. Thank you for that, Sean. All right, um, seeing no further questions, uh, we will let you go your merry way for today. And again, thank you for the presentation. We look forward to the continued coordination. Yep, thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Okay, um, with that, moving down our agenda, we next had on the agenda a staff presentation on an update on the Orphaned Well Program. However, we've kind of already gotten that a little bit from Director <laughs> Murphy. Go ahead. Uh, apologies, Mr. Chair. I, I got myself a little confused. Director Murphy actually will be coming back and giving a further update and presentation on a matter related to the Open Well Program um, rather than Deputy Director Cuthbertson. So we'll be hearing from Director Murphy here. Um, okay, great. Director Murphy, the floor thank is you. yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to pop this out. Um, hopefully, there we go. So um, I had planned in my director remarks to give an update on the Infrastructure and Jobs Act component and the funding that we and we, we had set the staff level anticipate flowing through to our open well program um, and then kind of late in the game realized that it's also the orphan well update. So let's just combine them. So that's hence the little bit of confusion bear with us. Um, so we wanted to talk first about what are the funding opportunities from the infrastructure and jobs act and what are the criteria for them? Go briefly through the planning and implementation as we see it today. Um, and then kind of close out with a discussion of the orphan well program staffing. So in the infrastructure, the infrastructure act or the, um, I think that's probably what I'll refer to it from this point forward. There are three different grant opportunities um, with five different funding mechanisms that are available to the state of Colorado. I, I also want to be clear that within the act itself, there are different provisions for funding for the federal government, for state governments, and then for tribal governments. And so what I'm speaking to right now are specifically those available to states like the state of Colorado. Um, so again, there are three grant programs, the initial grant, the formula grants and then performance grants. Within the performance grants, there are regulatory improvement grants and also matching grants. And then within the regulatory improvement grants, there are two different categories. Um, one of the categories is a grant for strengthening plugging standards and procedures. In my, um, because I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done at this organization, I think that what we did with our wellbore integrity rulemaking um, is would satisfy the requirements to qualify for this grant. And I also anticipate that given the hard work that this commission and Colorado stakeholders are pouring into our financial assurance rulemaking, that will help um, us qualify for the grant improvements for programs um, to programs that are designed to reduce orphan well burdens. So I, all in all, I think Colorado is extremely well poised um, because of our forethought. And next, so the grants specifically must be used to plug, remediate, and reclaim orphan wells located on state or private property. We can also use the grants to some degree to identify or characterize undocumented wells, um, to rank orphan wells, and to make information available, and then to measure and track emissions um, or contamination. So I think that there's a broad swath of what we have available to us at the state to do with these funds. However, it is really keyed into wells that are orphaned. And from my, from my perspective, what that means to us is that there is not a viable operator either because the business, well, I think there's kind of three different buckets of that. One, we have a well for which there is no owner of record, right? It predates all of our record keeping. 
Um, two would be the operator has dissolved or is no longer functioning. Or three, it's been through our enforcement process and the operator hasn't been able to come forward um, and um, comply, be in compliance with our regulatory requirements. In the, this last major bullet point is pretty important as we get to the end of the presentation. There is a cap on how much of the grant money can be used for administrative costs. Um, you know, kudos to our partners at the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Land Management who are, um, as the state of Colorado has recently experienced building a ship as they're flying it, um, they're putting together guidance for what it means, what administrative costs are, and they're putting this program together in real time right now. So we're in close coordination with them, making sure we understand what the expectations are. Um, but I certainly empathize with them for um, having the opportunity to build something that is going to put out a significant amount of money in a very short period of time. Um, sorry, Mike. Um, so I want to now jump into the different grants. Um, the first one is the initial grant. And as is relevant to the state of Colorado, because we are a member of IOGCC or the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, up to $25 million is available to us. We can request up to that cap. Um, the application deadline to make that request is May 14th of 2022. Um, the law requires that we will receive funding within 30 days of receipt of an application, meaning, which I infer means that the federal government will send us a check or some sort of funding around June 14th of 2022. There are some pretty important limitations on this. And again, we're planning for these. It's, and the most important in my mind from an administrative standpoint is that the state of Colorado will use obligate 90% of the funding requested to issue new contracts within 90 days of receipt. Um, and that's important because there is a real limit on the throughput, for example, of contracts, of personnel, et cetera. Again, we are planning for this um, and, and um, to fund our fiscal year, have those contracts put out in the first effectively 90 days of the fiscal year, um, a little less than that. Um, any unobligated funds must be returned one year after receipt, and then we need to report back to the federal government within 15 months after receipt of funds. So again, if we think about May 14th to request, June 14th to receive, um, September 14th to obligate 90% of the funds of 22, and then September of 23, we will need to report out how and what we spent um, from that initial grant. Again, um, as will be clear later in the presentation, you know, Colorado is building, trying to build out a consistent year over year program of around $10 million. So that's kind of what we're anticipating requesting in the initial grants. And again, I'll get into that later. And I should acknowledge, I should have acknowledged at the beginning that, excuse me, Jared Ellis on our team has been incredibly integral in terms of formulating how, how we can do this. And then Scott Cuthbertson has also been critical visioning out how we can administer the funds. So the second um, grant opportunity are the formula grants. Um, again, for all of the states in the United States, $2 billion is available um, and it will be administered or distributed to the states based on the number of orphan wells in the state, um, the estimated cost to plug and reclaim and plug, reclaim, remediate those sites, um, and then the number of oil and gas industry jobs lost in the state between March 1st, 2020 and November 15th, 2021. I think, uh, I mean, this to me is a great opportunity. And um, if we go to the next slide, the notice of intent to request the, to apply for the formula grant was due on December 30th. Colorado submitted our um, documentation on time. Um, I think we either submitted it late on the 29th or very early on the 30th. And these are the numbers that we reported. Um, we reported 625 orphan wells to plug and or reclaim and remediate. What's very important about this number is that it is significantly bigger than what you see on our orphan well webpage. And that's because largely um, there are 
orphan locations that we are continuing to perform work at or need to perform work at on which the well has been plugged. So for purposes of the federal funding, we needed to count the well to be able to consider the site or the location. So I hope that that's clear. Um, and then we, you know, Dave Andrews worked tirelessly to get an estimate for what we think the average cost to plug, remediate, reclaim is, um, which we reported. And then using um, Nate Pearson at EDO was helpful trying to figure out what, what the job losses were. And I think he used both state and federal resources on that number. Um, we expect to hear from the Department of Interior how much we will receive no later than January 29th of 2022, which I would note is in the middle of our financial assurances rulemaking, um, which is important when we're talking about um, funding for orphan wells in that context as well. Um, but this has been a, a really exciting and dynamic process. And again, at the end of the month, we'll, we'll be able to get a better sense of um, how and what funding Colorado will receive as we move forward. Um, as I said, DOI is currently developing the grant program um, and including the application process for the formula grants will receive funding within 60 days of receipt of the application. Um, given that I think we intend to use the initial grant to fund our 2022-2023 operations, we would be submitting our formula grant the actual application to receive the dollars sometime in 2023. Um, and then there is a five-year term um, to use these funds after which um, we would need to return any unobligated funds. And also the state is required to use any available financial assurance on, on an orphan project before we can use federal funds, which is um, entirely consistent with how we currently administer um, financial assurance for an orphan site and spend it before we spend um, the levy or other funding designated for the orphan well program. So now turning to the last um, grant opportunity, the performance grants, again, I noticed noted that there are um, a couple of different options, um, for, two for regulatory improvement and then the third for a matching. And we and we see, we understand that there's up to $20 million available to states meeting each of the two criteria um, for a total amount of $40 million. Again, um, we've strengthened our plugging standards and I think we've also, we um, have and will continue to make improvements to our financial assurance regime. So I think that those will be able to satisfy those criteria. And again, this has a longer horizon for spending. And so we would look to this kind of at, at, as the initial grant is spent down and the, the formula grants are spread, spent down. Again, DOI is also currently developing this grant program. My recollection is that these performance grants um, can be used to, again, for an organization to improve how it can do these things. So if a state needed more resources to develop regular rules to accomplish both of these um, bullet points. I think that there's more flexibility in, in these grant fundings. Again, I think Colorado has done these, so we would be looking to apply all of these funds directly to the orphan well program. Um, and then again, the kind of running through the eligibility, it begins 180 days of receipt after the initial grant. We, have, we will receive funding within 60 days um, an important component as we are planning for our regulatory future under these performance grants, there's a clawback provision so that if, if we request these funds, if we, I mean, if we went through a regulatory improvement process, requested the funds and then spent them and then went through another regulatory pr process to um, weaken said regulations, we would need to repay those funds to the federal government. Um, we're, again, the program is still in development. So we're trying to under, we still don't know if we can um, only request 20 or a lesser amount and how that's gonna work. And I, I think that, you know, that will become clear over time as the federal government develops its process. Um, the last um, subcategory of funding opportunities within the performance grant category is a matching grant. And this is up to $30 million available. And so again, this to me is if, as we kind of, you know, flow through these dollars towards the end, we will also have the opportunity to um, match state dollars with federal dollars to create a more, a bigger um, 
revenue stream to perform orphan well work as we go forward. DOI again is currently developing the grant program and the application process and deadlines. Um, so we'll be continuing to monitor this and see how it flows through. So that's a big chunk about how we understand the infrastructure bill to work as it relates to states, the state option for funding for orphan wells. I can pause here for questions about this, or I can jump into how we kind of see this actually working on the ground for funding in Colorado. Um, what's your pleasure, Chair? I would ask that you keep moving forward and sort okay. of how that is gonna play out would be important before we get into q and I think that makes sense as well, but I know I've talked a lot and that always makes me nervous. Um, sorry, I forgot this kind of closing out the performing grant slide, um, their annual grants, and it's based on the average amount spent from 2010 to 2019. And the good news is, is Colorado has a pretty good program. Um, so planning and implementation. Again, we're planning for approximately a $10 million a year um, per fiscal year program that allows for a consistent workload. We can plan for it. Um, we can have the right staff in place. We can have the right expertise in place and have the workload in place. Um, we anticipate that we will be expending grant funds from fiscal year 22, 23 through fiscal year 2030, 31. So we're talking about almost a decade of funding. Um, the modeling assumptions that Jarrett has put together for this is requesting approximately $11 million in the initial grant. Um, I don't think we are poised to spend or obligate $25 million or 90% of $25 million by September of 2022. Um, so we've really looked at kind of, again, this building a consistent pipeline of work and um, funding to be the most efficient program we can. Um, given that these dollars will become available to us in mid-June, we've started the planning process, of which, which is the close of my presentation around how to build out our staff in the next six months so that we're ready to, you know, really hit the ground running on June 15th. Um, next, we assume approximately $12.5 million in formula grants. This is based on kind of a preliminary estimate of the amount available for Colorado. Um, we, of course, don't know what other states have submitted or provided in my conversations with IOGCC. I know that compared to many, many other states that have oil and gas activity, Colorado has um, a very minuscule number of orphan wells. And, um, and so I don't know how that all works together. I also know that $2 billion is a really big number. Um, but you know, understanding how job losses affect different states and also how costs affect different states will, will kind of play out. Um, so again, that 12.5 will be ground truth on or around January 20, 29th of this year. Um, and that will affect our model once we receive that final number. We do anticipate requesting the full $40 million in regulatory improvement grants um, and requesting matching grants. Again, looking at these numbers, keep in mind that the federal government expects 90% of these funds to go into projects and 10% into administration. Um, and so we will likely, as, as you get to that very last bullet point, we anticipate spending approximately 700,000 or one point to 1.3 million per year of state funds, which would be generated by mill levy um, penalties or other fees on industry um, to cover that those additional administrative costs. So here, for those of you who prefer numbers to words, this is what we anticipate it the flow through to look like. Um, I think the important number for me is always the bottom line, right? And so like the bottom two lines, what do we anticipate obligating per year? Um, and you'll look, you can see a fairly consistent, um, close to $10.5 million a year. And again, that would be separate from the personnel costs. And Jarrett's thought through how to flow through all kind of the different dollars over that period of time. Um, and I'm happy to send these slides around. I don't think anybody wants to you know, work on the algebra in real time during this presentation, um, but we will make these slides available too. And again, I think it's important to keep in mind that you know, what we receive in the formula grant bucket, which is if you go down to the section on obligated by year, the second line item, 
we're projecting about $10 million in the 2024 fiscal year with another two and a half in 2025. Those two numbers could shift dramatically at the end of this month, and that will affect kind of the rest of the planning. Um, but that to me is the, you know, I'm grateful that we should have that information by the end of the month as we're planning moving forward. Um, so that's the, what do we think we're gonna do? Um, or how do we think we're gonna spend the dollars? And now into the like, how are we actually gonna be able to do this on the staffing side? As I announced earlier today, Dave Andrews is taking over management of the Orphan Well Program team to increase the program throughput from approximately $5 million a year to a $10 million a year will require additional staff. So um, what we anticipate doing is ensuring that we continue to maintain our existing Orphan Well Program staff. Um, we did reallocate an existing vacant um, full-time employee as a dedicated program manager, which is the position Mr. Andrews filled. And then we anticipate adding an additional six full-time employees or FTE to the existing Orphan Well Program staff. Um, for those of you who are deeply integrated in the state budgeting process, these would be non-appropriated federally funded employees, and they would also be ter term limited temporary employees. So they're kind of separate from our long, the best way I can describe it because I'm not great at the budget thing is um, they're not part of our long bill appropriation, um, but separate from it. And that's in part why they're both term limited. Um, and so we would anticipate expending that 10% of administrative costs allowable under the federal program for administrative costs on those F six FTE, and then continue again to pay for the existing FTE um, out of our current um, budget, again, which is funded by mill levy penalties um, and fees on industry. Um, so if we want to look at what that looks like, again, I think kudos to Jarrett and Scott for putting together both words and numbers or words and pictures, depending on how folks can um, read things. This is the team we anticipate building un with under Dave. Um, with red text indicating the new federally funded FTE, black text indicating those that we already have um, approved um, through our budgeting process. Um, I don't think I need to go through this in great detail. Again, we'll make the slides available. And so with that, I would say, um, we'll close it out, talk, take questions. I know this has been a really important issue for everyone in the state of Colorado to understand what it means for us, how we're gonna do it. Um, and I'm really proud of the work. I'm grateful for the leadership at, among, you know, IRGCC and the Environmental Defense Fund who really visioned out how this bill could work and helped get it successfully through as part of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for not just Colorado, but also the nation. And we're doing our darndest to make sure that we're well poised to, um, to use these funds to the, to the nth degree or to the max that we can in Colorado. Um, Dave certainly has an incredibly tough task in the next couple of months. He needs to make sure that we have everything prioritized, all of our work prioritized, um, contracts ready to go, and then he's got to double his staff. So if anybody wants to send him flowers or chocolates or whiskey, please do. Um, he's got a lot to do, but I know he's also eminently capable. So with that, Chair, I mean, for real this time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Director Murphy. Um, Dadgum, that was an awful lot of information. Um, yeah. And so we really appreciate that. Um, I think it would be helpful to probably post that slide set somewhere so that folks can dive into it at their pleasure. Um, I'd like to spend time with it as well. Um, you know, I kind of note with the uh, this happening with our financial assurances rulemaking happening with the contemplated orphan well fund and the change to that happening there's a whole lot of movement going on amongst all of those pieces. And um, I appreciate your staff and yourself and Mr. Andrews's nimbleness as we sort of think through these sorts of things. And I would remind all of our stakeholders that, uh, you know, we're doing everything we can to ensure that we're, we're moving in the right direction with um, all of these moving parts. Um, and so bear with us as we, you know, move forward um, contemplating the direction of the Orphan Wealth Fund that we're contemplating in the financial assurances rulemaking versus these funds versus, you know, there's the several different categories, et cetera. So yeah, um, thanks for trying to summarize a whole lot of information from the federal government. And um, 
looking around to see if anybody has questions since I'm just sort of talking without questions. Commissioner McGowan. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks for the summary. It's super helpful because I think it was kind of hard to understand what was happening. I think what I'm still kind of getting stuck on um, and maybe going back to your spreadsheet of when we think funding is going to come in and we might be able to spend it. It, does that mean that some of these funds are one-time one time funding, one and done, and then other pieces are in perpetuity for 10 years, maybe just the 10-year time frame, and then would have to be renewed um, from the feds? I'm just wondering if you could kind of explain which ones are, or clarify for me, which are just kind of one-time expenditures and which are going to be ongoing for um, some sort of time frame. Sure, sure. So the initial grant, which is if we go awarded by under the award by year, um, and I'm pointing to my screen that nobody else can see, but um, if you can see my arm moving, that's what I'm doing. Um, so the under the awarded by year, the initial grant, that first line item of $11 million and 22, that is a one-time funding piece. And that is, we have the opportunity to request up to $25 million. We anticipate requesting 11, and that's the one-time um, one time funding that has we've got to return any funds not expended within 12 months of receipt. Um, if we go down to the formula grant, that is also a one-time um, lump sum payment to the state that I believe we have five years to spend. I would need to go back, but I, I think we have about five years to spend it. I think that's from receipt. So I think we could spend it on all the way out for a couple of more years. If you look at the spreadsheet, um, not just through 2023, the performance, Regulatory grants are also, I think, one-time lump sums, but I, I believe we have a decade to spend them. So we can, when we receive them and when we spend them can differ. Um, and then the performance matching grants are the are kind of the year over year where we can request it annually for a period of time. Uh, and I, I'm just checking in with Jarrett who very graciously sent me an assist and the one-time matching grants are annual grants for a total of up to a total of $30 million. Uh, I think they're also again in this 10 year horizon. So that's, that's driven part of our thinking around the 10 year, 10 year program. Thanks. That's super helpful. And then not being discussed here is a portion that the feds are going to be implementing to for similar purposes for wells on federal property. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. Correct. And tribal. So there's and two tribal. other, buckets of funding available to different governmental entities that could be applied within the state of Colorado. And we will be in, certainly in coordination with BLM, we've had some initial conversations about how we can um, work together collaboratively um, on, on, on these approaches. Other commissioners with questions? Commissioner Messner, and then Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> and thank you, Director Murphy. Uh, it was a super good overview of a complex um, topic. I did have just a couple of questions. Um, so the there was a requirement to provide uh, a list of our orphan wells uh, end of the year last year that a certain amount of these funds would be utilized to address, but I'm assuming that some of the performance matching grants um, or even maybe some of the formula grants may be able to be used for wells that um, become orphaned over the next 10 years. Is that true? Commissioner Messner, a couple of things. I th the, the federal government didn't require us to provide a list, only a number. Okay. And that, as I understand it, is so that the federal government can apportion that two billion dollars across the states in a in a fair way, um, considering the number of orphans each state has, the cost each state expends in plugging, remediating, reclaiming, and also the number of jobs lost. Those were the kind of criteria for um, dividing up those funds. And I think Jarrett knows the actual proportions of what what piece of information counts for what in that in the federal government's formula if you want to know that um then so then transferring separately 
we can expend any funds received on any orphans. It's not tied to our initial list. Okay. All right. That, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then assuming, I'm assuming um, that the performance matching grants require a match. Mm -hmm. And do you know the details on what that match requirement is? Um, like, is I, it I assume one? We would be utilizing our orphan, existing orphan well program for that match. Is that right? Yes, I would anticipate generating revenue for the match through um, an annual, you know, orphan well fee, if that's what the commission adopts in a few weeks, through mill levy, through penalties. I think that we have, um, we have that, those tools available to us. The important thing is that the match is limited to the average amount that we spent between years 2010 and 2019, which Jared has flagged for me is around a half a million dollars. So we put in a half, so I think it helps build out about a million dollar a year program. Can we ask for that 5 million if we don't have, if we're only doing a 500,000 match? Um, I think over time we can build up to that amount, right? This is the annual okay. request piece. Okay. Um, and is there any, is there, and I, oh. and I understand the, the, the parameters and, and the challenges around, um, both the initial grant and the formula grant regarding timelines, but understanding that those don't have matching requirements. I, I imagine there was some debate as to how much to ask in the non-matching stuff versus the matching requirements uh, with, with, the, with the federal matching funds. And um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, are we sure? I mean, I imagine we're pretty confident that we're asking the non-matching stuff to the max of our ability at this point, because it seems like that's better money than the matching. I, that's true, except for the initial grant, right? With the initial grant and its incredibly tight timelines, um, I want to make sure we feel very confident that we can get as much of that, we can get 90% of it obligated in that 90 day time period, right? So this is really tied to pro program performance for me um, because I don't, I, I it's, and so that's why we're targeting requesting 11, not 25. For, for the formula grants, yes, I wanted to make sure that we, um, we understood the definition of orphan wells broadly, which is why we included, again, wells that were ultimately plugged but continue to need orphan well work on our list of orphan wells to make sure we correctly represented the scope of the issue in Colorado. Um, and that to me is kind of the biggest question mark of, of, of this entire model in terms of what, what will flow through. I do um, want to clarify one thing, and I might want to pull Jarrett in on this, is that um, we would need, for the matching component, we would need to put in that half a million dollars a year. And then the federal government will make up the delta of what we plan to do um, instead of like a direct dollar for dollar match. I, I, I misrepresented that. Okay. Okay. Uh, my last question, um, is there any indication in any of the allowable utilization of, uh, of these funds uh, that we would perhaps be able to utilize funding for ongoing um, monitoring of, of existing orphan wells? I think, yes, um, or at least remediation and methane monitoring. And I can go back up to that slide if that'd be helpful. Um, I'll go back and read the slides if, okay. if you had mentioned it. So I must have missed that. So um, thank you. I appreciate the, the information. Thanks, Chair. And thank you, Director Murphy. Um, great presentation. There, there's a lot that I've, I've got scribble notes on that I'm trying to, to reconcile. Um, so so the number that, that that stood out to me was kind of our current outstanding I'm going to use liabilities and air quotes, but but outstanding costs for plugging reclamation and remediation of those, I think 628 wells, don't recall if I had that number correct, um, being about $47.3 million. Um, and so kind of kind of looking at that, you know, that, that's the cost for basically cleaning up the entirety of the historical orphan wells in Colorado from inception of drilling to present. Yes. Um, okay, so, so that's a number that I wanted to make sure that I, that I understood clearly. Um, 
the next, and this was, in, I think it was in one of your previous slides that I may have missed and didn't get down in my notes clearly, but I'm curious what the forecast is for our spend. Could you highlight that for me? Um, the, what, what we're forecasting our ability to execute on this program on from a spend perspective from the Orphan Well program. Um, was that in your previous slides or, or did I kind of fill that in on my own? I, um, you're using magical words to me that I don't totally understand. I think we're projecting to be able to obligate around 10, 10 and a half million dollars a year. And okay. I think that's the answer. So um, this, this second to, to bottom line here, the grants obligated by year yes. is really what COGCC as an agency under the Orphan Well Program is planning yes. on spending every yes. year. Yep. Okay. Yep. Getting under contract and then monitoring the work. And again, we've been working closely with DNR's procurement folks to make sure that everything's lined up to get that done. Okay. And so are we anticipating after we spend this 47.3 million, get everything cleaned up to present, um, kind of get to that net zero? Of course, you know, it's an evergreen process. There's more orphan wells um, flowing into the system that we anticipate a, a need to be spending $10.3 million um, after we've, we've kind of caught up on that amount? I think if we got to zero, um, which I think is everybody's goal, um, there's no longer a need for the program. And we wouldn't be able to, I mean, I think we'd be precluded from using federal funds. We're precluded from using federal funds on anything that's not orphaned. Yeah, and, and I get that part, right? I understand the limitations. I understand kind of giving the money back from the grants. I'm just trying to kind of reconcile it with, with, with how we can forecast the use of this money. So, um, so that's helpful. I appreciate that. It's gonna, you know, give us some things to think about as we're working through, you know, FA um, here this month and in the next month. Um, so I appreciate it. Uh, helpful numbers. Look forward to going over the slides. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you so much, Director Murphy. Just echoing what everybody said. It's just um, really great information. Um, just one question on the matching funds. So uh, there are, I'm assuming that it could be any non-federal dollars. Uh, so in other words, if there were, if there was a, uh, an enforcement action and perhaps in lieu of a, a penalty payment, uh, an operator could contribute directly to something like this potentially? Um, that's a fantastic question. I mean, the most straightforward way for us would be to collect a penalty and then apply it to this. That said, um, I don't know if Jarrett wants to jump in and uh, provide any insights. And well, what he to uh me is that a lot of this program is yet to be defined, and so we may have a better answer to that question as BLM or DOI works through the process. Okay. I was just curious. I know a lot of other federal programs that require matches, you know, it, it's typically non-federal dollars, but there have been a few exceptions here and there. And so I was curious about, you know, where, whether there were sideboards that we knew of yet um, in terms of, you know, where those funds have to come from. I mean, from our budgeting standpoint, I think it's important to remember that Penalties flow into our program, but we're very limited on how we can spend penalties. And so they primarily go to funding orphan well work because that's most clearly aligned with what the statute requires for us spending out of that um, line item or that account. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's, you know, we're continuing to look at on the internal, on the, on the state revenue side, understanding where penalties are going to flow as part of um, planning for the federal funding, planning to cover those additional overhead expenses, and then managing our own revenue streams and budget as well. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? All right. Uh, thank Director Murphy. You have exhausted us. Uh, thank you again for that great information. Uh, very exciting times. Um, so we will look forward to next steps. Um, okay. So with that, um, we have exhausted the update on Orphan Well program. I believe we have one other matter before we take our morning break, and that is an update on the Biological Resources Working Group from Commissioner Nanjapa and COGCC staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you everyone for um, allowing us a little time on the agenda. I know it's a it's a big day today, so 
uh, we'll try to work through this as quickly as possible. Um, I know for, especially for the commissioners and, and some other folks who've been listening, I've been giving some brief updates um, over the past uh, couple of hearings, um, but one major point that I just wanted to cover is that in the statement of basis and purpose that, that kind of uh, established the charge of this working group, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, there was a uh, January 15th deadline for completing the work. Um, this was not set in rule, and so uh, we are taking this opportunity around that deadline to provide, provide basically an overview and a little bit of a preview of the full narrative report, uh, which I will talk about in a little bit uh, with these slides. Uh, but there will be the full narrative report coming to you all um, and be released to the public sometime in the next month or two. Um, and just given the actual uh, products that were required in rule by January 15th, and of course, uh, the upcoming rulemaking that we are all about to jump into, uh, it made sense to kind of uh, delay this just a little bit in terms of the, the specific narrative report. Um, so. I will give you a quick overview. And I wanna just quickly recognize that uh, we had support from, from staff and in particular AAG Mercer, who also uh, had some uh, additional assistance from AAG Scott Schultz and environmental manager, Greg Duranlo. So they will both be, uh, AAG Mercer and Mr. Duranlo will be presenting a little bit here as well. Next slide. So just briefly, why are we even contemplating biological resources with the amendment of the Oil and Gas Conserva Conservation Act with SB 19181? The authority was granted to us to contemplate how we could uh, protect biological resources. And AAG Mercer will dive into this a little bit more in, in her portion of the presentation, but I just wanted to put that up here in, in terms of kind of framing the, the overall context. Next slide. So this is the charge for the working group that appears in the 800, 900, 1200 series statement of basis and purpose. And what I have uh, emphasized here in blue is just a little bit about you know, what the working group was intended to do. Uh, what you will note is that a lot of it sort of emphasizes data sources and, and sources of information because our primary goal is to identify data sources that operators could consult and be able to use when they are looking at ways to, to protect or otherwise avoid, minimize, or mitigate impacts on biological resources. Um, so next slide. Before I get too deep, I want to acknowledge the working group members. These are folks that were recommended to me um, or had volunteered to participate in various contexts there were several other names that were provided and in contacting some folks, um, some folks preferred to kind of uh, be in, uh, partic participate in more of a review capacity. Uh, but these are the folks that were involved and they were all, uh, they included representatives, as you can see, from biological, wildlife, ecology and conservation groups and from the oil and gas industry. And they were all engaged based on their relevant expertise. Um, I want to note in particular that we did have uh, via recommendation from Brett Ackerman, who was really instrumental in our wildlife series rules um, from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Uh, we were able to engage Brian McGee, who is currently the Southwest Energy Liaison, as well as Raquel Wurzbaugh, uh, who is the Natural Areas Program Coordinator. Um, and as you can see again in looking at the the folks who were engaged, we have a, a wide variety of folks and and folks also that were uh, representing different parts of the state as well. Next slide. So before I get too uh, deep into this as well, you if you noted in the statement of basis and purpose text, um, there was nothing about the working group establishing a definition. However, in order to identify data sources, we needed to know what the biological resources would encompass. Um, so we did create what we're calling a working definition. Uh, Mimi, if you could please advance. And I just wanna really emphasize here <laughs> that what is shown here will not be finalized um, and could be further refined through a fully noticed rulemaking 
Um, I will also note that the working group is not recommending a particular time frame for rulemaking, but if if a definition were to be adopted, it would have to go through that process. So this is just a working definition that provides um, a little bit of framing for what we were thinking about when we were uh, identifying data sources. There are several additional caveats and um, explanatory notes that will appear in the final report that are not shown here. Uh, but a couple of points to note is that um, you know, we have already in our rules defined wildlife resources, and you see that capitalized in this uh, working definition. Um, also in our rules uh, appears undesirable plant species. So those are terms that were already defined. And then aquatic nuisance species and pests are defined in Colorado statute. Um, so we were trying to, to refer to things that were already um, you know, formalized uh, as well as considering you know, other aspects of, of biological resources that we may need to consider. Um, one other note I will uh, mention here is that we, we did have some very good discussion on soils, topsoils, et cetera. Uh, and what we agreed was that in terms of protection of, of topsoils and, and soils and related components, uh, this would more come into play in a reclamation context when you're sort of uh, restoring a site, um, not so much in a new location context. Um, but there were definitely, you know, components that we wanted to consider uh, in any sort of permitting review process. Uh, please advance, Mimi. And then as noted, there were several other folks that were identified as, as people who might be interested. And so we, we kind of, uh, created a larger group of folks that were engaged for looking at this definition, not to review the definition, but to help us consider what data sources might be relevant, publicly available and accessible. Um, so that again, we could ensure that operators would have a good set of resources that they could be looking at um, should this proceed in a rulemaking. So that is currently in progress. We have sent, um, this definition and some additional notes to folks to, um, to be able to provide us with additional information on data sources that might be relevant. And we are looking um, for those responses here towards the end of the month. And I'll talk a little bit more about the timeline um, a little bit further into the presentation. Next slide. So these are some very high level recommendations um, first would be to adopt a definition that captures the intent of SB 19181. Of course, again, that would be done through a rulemaking. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are not recommending any particular timing for that. Um, some considerations that we discussed were, were the idea that biological resources, generally speaking, probably encompasses wildlife resources. However, given some of the um, definitions of authority in terms of what we have defined in statute. Uh, there may be instances when wildlife resources should or could be separate from biological resources. Um, and by that, I mean Colorado Parks and Wildlife has the authority to protect uh, vertebrate animals and mollusks and crustaceans. And that is what is specifically defined in statute for their authority. Um, and then other than those species, unless there are species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened or endangered. Um, so that would be inclusive of plants or invertebrates, et cetera. Um, then the Fish and Wildlife Service Authority would, would uh, be engaged at, at that point to um, you know, be able to regulate those species. Um, but we do not have a state authority currently for the protection of plants or invertebrates specifically. There are protections that are identified or um, uh, intense for uh, conservation and for you know, um, management of um, plants and invertebrates in the State Wildlife Action Plan, for example, but there, there aren't uh, specific statutory um, protections uh, that are currently uh, in any sort of regulatory context at this point for, for some of those. Um, other species. So those are considerations that would, would need to be taken into account. And that kind of plays into the, the next point here, it, which relates to the consideration of a, of a species list. 
um, especially for scenarios that might involve consultation. Uh, and so there again, the, the statutory authorities are gonna be important. Um, also data availability on distribution, on impacts from oil and gas activities or other development activities, and also opportunities for mitigation. Those are gonna be important considerations as um, if this proceeds in rulemaking. Um, we are not as a group recommending a particular list, but we will kind of note some of these considerations in the final report. And then uh, of course, as noted, you know, we're receiving some input now on data sources. So we will, um, we will put forth a set of data sources that we have identified, but in rule or at least in guidance, um, one recommendation would be to include some specific data sets, uh, data sources that um, again, are readily available for, for operators to consult, especially in a, in a desktop review. Um, and we would like to see that there would be contemplation of, of specific scenarios where there would be third party on the ground uh, surveys, really. I, as I'm looking at this, I, I maybe consultation um, uh, creates a lot of consternation um, in terms of a term here, but really what I'm talking about is, is the ability to engage uh, third party um, uh, environmental consultant or type groups uh, to be able to come out and do um, surveys uh, in certain contexts. So thinking about what those scenarios might be. Um, so in, in general, in thinking about all of these, it's important as I've already kind of touched on to think about the, the legal and the implementation context. And so now I will pass it on to Assistant Attorney General Mercer uh, for the legal and regulatory review, and then following her will be our environmental manager, uh, Mr. Greg Duranlo. Uh, so AAG Mercer. Thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa. Um, as Commissioner Nanjapa said, I am AAG Lauren Mercer. I'm here to just briefly address a few of the legal and regulatory considerations related to the work of the working group. Um, as Commissioner Nanjapa explained, Senate Bill 19181 amended the Oil and Gas Conservation Act to change the commission's mission to include the protection of biological resources. As you can read here on the screen, as amended, the act now states that the commission shall protect against adverse environmental impacts on any air, water, soil, or biological resource resulting from oil and gas operations. So although the term biological resource appeared elsewhere in the act prior to SB 19181. Uh, this is the first time that the commission has been expressly vested with broad authority to regulate for the protection of biological resources, um, which as Commissioner Nanjapa explained is sort of the whole reason behind um, the, the working groups project. Next slide, please. Um, despite that being new to the agency's statutory mission, Consideration of biological resources has really been baked into the commission's rules since long before mission change. Um, and I put together this slide to provide some examples of rules that currently require the commission or operators to consider and protect biological resources. I'd emphasize that this is certainly not an exhaustive list um, and just designed to give some examples. Some of these rules use the exact term biological resource, while others address protections for components of the broader term um, uh, biological resources, such as habitat, soil, invertebrates, and other related elements. As shown in this slide, consideration of biological resources appears in the regulatory definitions throughout our permitting and operations rules, and features particularly heavily in the Environmental Protection and Reclamation Series rules. Um, so in the event of a biological resources rulemaking, all of these rules and more could become relevant. I also included the 1200 Wildlife Series um, in this list. And just wanna say that, you know, as Commissioner Nanjapa noted, wildlife is one component of biological resources and there's a lot of nuance around the treatment of wildlife resources for which we already have a robust regulatory framework versus biological resources. Um, and I know uh, Mr. Duranlo plans to touch on those sorts of concerns in his presentation as well. Um, that said, I did want to include them here uh, because the wildlife series rules, in addition to providing protections for wildlife specifically, 
some of those rules may, may include protections for biological resources more broadly, components such as habitat and the like, um, and therefore uh, will be highly relevant during any rulemaking. Um, so with that, um, I will hand it off to Mr. Duranlo, who was a participant in the working group and will share staff's perspective. Thank you, AAG Mercer, and thank you, Commissioner Nanjapa. Um, so my name is Greg Duranlo. I'm the environmental manager here at the commission. And during the biological resources working group, I represented staff. Um, my input to the meetings was primarily related to implementation and process as the group deliberated the working definition and discussed application of protection for biological resources. And it is from that perspective that I present today. Um, as mentioned before, um, I am going to talk a lot about wildlife resources in, in, in my portion of the presentation um, to emphasize the structure and processes that exist for that subset of biological resources and the significance that there's no similar structure for biological resources. But I do want to be clear that the Biological Resources Working Group did not propose that we develop or adopt the same structure for biological resources. And while that particular structure may not be appropriate, ultimately it is clear that some structure is necessary. So before I dive into a few slides, I wanna underscore that as AAG Mercer described, biological resources has been considered by staff in our oversight of oil and gas operations since before Senate Bill 19181. For example, as mentioned, our reclamation rules, including stormwater management, surface disturbance minimization, weed management, interim and final reclamation are all integral to our protections of public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife resources. And they've incorporated the conceptual protection of biological resources since 1996. Also starting in 2008, COGCC's review of the proposed surface disturbance through the Form 2A process has provided an avenue for the protection of biological resources, even if it was primarily by way of protecting wildlife resources, as I'll describe. So biological and wildlife resources can't be treated as an equivalency. The Biological Resources Working Group wrestled with how biological resources should be defined and protection managed and there are some notable differences that need to be kept in mind. As AAG Mercer discussed, biological resources is used in our regulatory framework, though it is not defined, no explicit, no explicit protection processes are provided, and no resources or data are specifically identified. Alternatively, wildlife resources has a statutory definition, a 100 series definition, we have a structured regulatory framework, which includes consultation with our partner agency, Colorado Parks and Wildlife during the permitting process. And there are established data, which we call high priority habitat. So the protection of wildlife resources does serve to protect some, but not all biological resources. Next slide, please Mimi. So I'll discuss my, or I'll start my discussion about implementation considerations by looking at wildlife resources and high priority habitat. Again, though, I will caveat that the way wildlife resources is handled is not the biological resources working group's proposal for biological resources, nor is it necessarily appropriate for the broader category of biological resources. The Habitat Stewardship Act is fundamental to the protections afforded to wildlife resources. It's enshrined within the Oil and Gas Conservation Act in uh, Colorado Revised Statutes 34-6-128. And among other things, it establishes Colorado Parks and Wildlife as COGCC's consultation partner. This is important because it provides the statutory mandate for CPW to participate in the COGCC regulatory process and it ensures that resources are made available by the legislature to carry out the mandate in accordance with CBW's mission. This is a unique relationship between the two regulatory agencies, one that's not mirrored in COGCC's relationship with other partners, such as other federal, state, or local government entities, or conservation groups, or non-governmental organizations. 
The overarching goal of the Habitat Stewardship Act is to minimize Im impacts to wildlife resources. That is, as we've previously mentioned, only a part of what it takes to protect biological resources. And the statute also provides for a timely and efficient permitting process. It's out of this provision that our consultation process with CPW was developed in the rulemaking of 2008. It's important that a clear and well understood process is established for all parties, for the regulated community, for surface and mineral owners, as well as government agencies, whether the, they be federal, state, or local governments. And then finally, when the act was modified by Senate Bill 19181, and by the act here, I mean the Habitat Stewardship Act, it addressed a provision for compensatory mitigation, which had been nearly impossible to implement previously. And that gave rise to co the compensatory mitigation program in rule 1204. Next slide, please. So to review, during the mission change rulemaking, the commission established three types of habitat. The habitat included those requiring consultation under rule 309E, and then the specific subsets of no surface occupancy and density determination habitats that are listed um, by species in rule 1203C and D. The high priority habitat were included in the rules for three primary reasons. First, the availability of good geospatial data. Second, a body of evidence that demonstrates that oil and gas development does have a detrimental effect on the species, either directly or indirectly. And third, that there are well-established evidence-based protection strategies for the species and habitat. I think I said in the rulemaking, we know where the critters are and we know how to protect them. These factors are critical to ensure the effectiveness of COGCC's regulatory program with respect to wildlife resources. Um, and next slide, please. So all of that brings us to the question of how do we implement an appropriate program for the protection of biological resources? First, there's no comparable programmatic structure in place for biological resources as just described for wildlife resources which is not to say that they can't be protected, just that no state level program has been established. There are no standards by which to enforce. Neither the statute nor rules provide the necessary tools for COGCC and the regulated community to implement protections and have the confidence that the measures they are taking are effective and will be considered protective. During our discussions, we learned that there are numerous sources of really good data and information about biological resources, with much of it being highly specialized, very well developed, and studied in detail. And while there are some good sources of amalgamated data, there is no single clearinghouse from which consistent and reliable maps and information can readily be obtained. And finally, considering how the protections of biological resources is effectuated, through the COGCC permitting process raises several questions. Is the protection of biological resources a site selection tool? Is it a site evaluation tool? Is it an operational implementation tool? And can impacts to biological resources be effectively mitigated? In closing, I, I think the Biological Resources Working Group as, as uh, Commissioner Nanjapa described the members is comprised of a very appropriate group of, of, um, of folks with a variety of expertise to dig into these questions and determine the most appropriate path forward to recommend. But these conversations will take time and they will be challenging. And then uh, as in closing, I'd just like to thank Commissioner Nanjapa for her leadership to date and her commitment to thoughtfully facilitating this work. It was a big lift to get those meetings off the ground and keep them you know, very focused and productive. So. Um, they were they were really um, they were great meetings. And with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you so much, Mr. Dronlo, and I'll uh, send that check in the mail for uh, your <laughs> comments there. Thank you. Um, I, before I proceed too far, I wanted to just make see if any of the commissioners had any uh, questions for either AA Jean Mercer or Mr. Dronlo, and then I can talk a little bit about next steps, or we can leave those all for the end. Uh, it's your pleasure. Okay, um, so seeing none, just a quick overview of the next steps. So as I mentioned, we have an external group of stakeholders um, 
who are uh, currently providing input on data sources. And so we're in that phase until uh, the end of January, uh, January 26 to be exact. And we will have uh, additional COGCC staff review some of the suggested data sources and, and determine which ones make the most sense uh, to include in the final report. Uh, and then around um, early February or so, uh, I'm hoping to have a set of draft, uh, a draft of the recommendations report to be provided back to the working group uh, for their review. Um, and you know, we'll incorporate the data sources that, that we reviewed and recommended uh, or that we will, um, that were re recommended by the external stakeholders and that we have reviewed, uh, we'll incorporate those. Uh, we'll also incorporate, of course, any other working group uh, feedback. Um, and then sometime in around mid or late February or possibly into March, just given all the things that are happening, uh, we will finalize that report. And then around that same time, we'll provide a more in-depth uh, presentation here to the commission that, that can get into a little bit more of the details and, and um, provide some additional context. Um, so uh, with that, I, I, was, I am remiss in, in saying in particular that you know, the group was, as Mr. Duramlo just mentioned, you know, was very engaged. We met four times between September and December and uh, I think almost every time we had almost every single participant in each of those meetings, um, with just a couple of exceptions. And uh, but everybody was very engaged. Um, there was exceptional feedback um, and input and considerations that were provided. And so I just want to really thank uh, the group that we engaged in and um, look forward to presenting you all with the final report. So with that, any questions? Great, thank you for that report uh, from yourself, Commissioner Najapa and staff. Um, looking to see if commissioners have questions. All right, you must have done a really good job because I'm not seeing any questions. So uh, thank you for the continued work there. We look forward to uh, next steps uh, from you and your group. And thanks to the stakeholders that are involved um, with this project. We appreciate it. Okay, um, we have come to, I believe, our morning break. So let's take about 15 minutes and return at uh, around 11 a.m. and then we'll continue forward with the rest of our agenda. It is All right, it is 11 a.m. We will return to our agenda um, and move forward. Uh, at this point, we are taking up a matter titled Enforcement Defaults Orphan Wells, Wolverine Resources LLC, operator number 10677, docket number 21060093 in Moffat County. And I believe our staff is Mr. Kirshner, uh, one of our enforcement officers. Mr. Kirshner. Thank you, Chair Robbins. Um, just a brief clarification. Um, I'm aware that on the agenda, this is characterized as an enforcement default. Um, the order before you is actually a stipulated order finding violation, which means that it's a negotiated resolution between commission staff and Wolverine to um, arrive at the relief that we've shown here. So um, a default would be more of a unilateral action in which you've notified the operator, but just, um, just a brief clarification. So to kind of describe the, the matter before you today. Um, this matter began with a series of field inspections in 2020. Uh, one of staff's field inspectors visited several of Wolverine's locations. During those, location, during those visits, she observed uh, a number of issues at the locations, most notably um, conditions at the wellhead that led to venting and uh, a hissing sound observed from that wellhead. Now, during and following those inspections, um, staff made numerous attempts to contact and to work with Wolverine um, it was represented to staff that those conditions would be corrected. Um, and throughout the summer, um, essentially no work was ever done. Wolverine was unable to, correct, uh, to complete those corrective actions. Um, staff ultimately issued NOAVs here. And then finally, in the summer of 2021, staff engaged our own contractor to go out there and to correct the conditions that were observed at the wellheads. Um, Wolverine did engage counsel. Um, and through the negotiation process in this matter, um, it became apparent to staff that Wolverine is essentially unable to continue operations in the state of Colorado. 
Now, given that um, staff elected to pursue a resolution here that's similar to that that the commission approved uh, in October in, for instance, the Sandra Woodard matter. And what that resolution looks like is as follows. Um, the assessed penalty here is approximately $1.1 million. Uh, staff elected to suspend that entire penalty um, given Wolverine agreeing to no longer operate in the state of Colorado. Wolverine also elected to um, transfer its wells and its assets into the orphan well program. Um, and staff will claim Wolverine's bond to begin the process of plugging the abandoning and addressing any of the issues that staff may find at those locations. Um, the order does provide that if Wolverine wishes to operate again in the state, Wolverine must first pay the uh, assessed penalty amount in its entirety. And then uh, Wolverine must come before the commission directly with that request to operate once more. And the commission may do with that request what it will. Um, I wanna point out here that ultimately um, in a matter like this and in this matter specifically, it's staff's belief that the ultimate outcome here is going to look like this resolution, like this stipulated order. Um, whether it's arrived at through an adversarial process, whether it's arrived at through the negotiated process that we engaged in here. Staff believes that the stipulated order finding violation in front of the commission today is simply the most efficient process to um, cease Wolverine's operations in the state of Colorado and to get these assets transferred into the orphan well program to claim the bond and to allow staff to begin uh, plugging and abandoning these wells and addressing any conditions that may exist at the locations. So with that, um, staff is asking you today to approve the stipulated order finding violation entered into by staff and Wolverine. Thank you. Um, I see that we have a uh, council for Wolverine with us. Uh, would you like to make any statements at this point in time? Um, uh, Brent Chicken, Steptoe and Johnson, PLLC, on behalf of uh, Wolverine Resources. Um, I, I think Mr. Kirshner has, uh, has very accurately described the situation. Um, Wolverine simply does not have the, the resources um, to maintain these wells in compliance. I will tell you that as we sit here right now, uh, all Wolverine wells are currently shut in. Um, and have been rendered, uh, you know, been rendered safe. So uh, as far as we're concerned, there's no pending uh, issues or concerns with any of that. Um, you know, the, the, the fine here is, is in excess of, of, of Wolverine's, the, the company's lifetime revenues. Um, so uh, it, it's obviously not something that the company is going to be able to, uh, to, to meet. Um, and uh, Wolverine does agree with uh, staff and Mr. Kirshner that um, we save we save everybody a lot of of time and effort um, not going through an adversarial process um, because we're going to be in the same exact spot that we're in right now. Um, and so this is this is intended to uh, move those wells um, into that into the program quicker um, so that they can be addressed. Um, and also to uh, obtain the uh, agreement of, of Wolverine and its principal, uh, Shane Reeves, um, that you know their, the operator number is going to be terminated, their Form 10s are going to be terminated, their bonds are going to be uh, taken by the, uh, the Oil and Gas Commission, um, and uh, Wolverine's not going to be an operator in the state of Colorado going forward. So we are in agreement with staff um, and I'm happy to answer any, any specific questions, but I, I think Mr. Kirshner's kind of wrapped it up nicely. Um, and you can see from the SOFB, we're dealing with about, this matter deals with about four wells. Um, and, uh, but this, is, this order is effectively going to cover all Wolverine wells and facilities in the entire state. Um, we're just, this 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 is the way this is the way to to to, to resolve this um, as far as staff and uh, and and the hearings division is concerned. Thank you, Mr. Chicken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Do commissioners have any questions for either party? All right. Um, seeing no questions, uh, I believe. We are looking for a motion to approve the matter before us, the stipulated order finding violation. Do I have that right, Mr. Davenport? 
That is correct, Mr. Chair. So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the stipulated order finding violation. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? There are none opposed. The motion carries unanimously. The stipulated order finding violation is approved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kirshner, for the good work here. Thank you, Mr. Chicken. We will now move forward. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Larson. Uh, thank you all. Yep, thank you. Uh, we, our agenda calls for lunch break at this point in time, but we just took our morning break. We're a little ahead of time. Uh, do you know if the parties that are involved with the docket on, on the Wild Earth Guardians petition, are they available and ready for presentation? You're on mute, Ms. Larson. Well, she's on mute. Uh, sorry, this is uh, Kate Merlin with um, Wild Earth Guardians. I'm one of the parties. Um, I am prepared to go forward. However, I would request, since this was a little unexpected, um, five minutes for just a bathroom break. Let me just, just a second, Ms. Merlin. Let me hear Thank from Ms. Larson. Ms. Larson. The, the, the parties were notified this morning that we were running ahead of schedule and they are ready to participate at this time. Okay. And I see uh, Mr. Martin on behalf of Noble. Are you ready to go, Mr. Martin? Uh, hearing officer, or uh, hearing officer Larson, if you could add uh, Mr. Greg Nybert and Ms. Elizabeth Joyner? Yes, we, we are bringing in um, those part, individuals and also staff at this moment as well. Great, thank you. Ms. Mercer, are you ready to go? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that AAG Scott Schultz is uh, being made a panelist. Looks like Ms. Larson is busy making that happen. Why don't we uh, accommodate the five minute request for a break? Uh, let's return at 11.15. Give Ms. Larson the opportunity to gather all the parties, um, and then we will reconvene at 11 15. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is 11 15. It looks like we have the full suite of attorneys and parties for this matter. Um, <clears throat> this is the Docket 21080126. Uh, Ms. Larson, am I correct that I am operating under the tenets of the final pre hearing order in terms of what we're going to hear this morning? Correct, and also the time allotments. Okay, so looking at that order that I have before me, um, uh, let's see, the parties may provide oral argument, the parties may make witnesses available to answer questions. There will be no direct or cross examination of witnesses. <clears throat> uh, petitioner will be allocated a total of 25 minutes for argument and rebuttal, five minutes to present each main argument. Uh, petitioner may allocate the remaining 10 minutes for rebuttal. Staff has allotted 25 minutes for presenting its response. Noble has allotted 10 minutes if it desires to use them. Um, Ms. Larson, you'll be keeping track of time. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, so I believe we will start uh, with Ms. Merlin, the petitioner in this matter. Is that accurate, everybody? All right, Ms. Merlin, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, um, uh, Chair Robbins. Uh, I have a quick question about um, the order of operations for this hearing. Um, there are sort of three different matters broken down into this hearing. There is a list of 103 wells. Um, there are um, individual complaints against four separate operators for, um, uh, we believe, failing to conduct uh, mechanical integrity tests. And there are, there's the noble matter. Um, would the commission prefer to, uh, for me to break these down and, and pause for questions and the rebuttal from uh, staff or noble? Uh, or would you prefer that I go through the entire presentation that I have prepared. Uh, looking at my fellow commissioners, if there's any desired sequence, I'm comfortable if you just want to present your case and then, you know, we'll be able to 
dissect through it as need be. Okay. Anybody have any concerns about that? Seeing none, I think you can just move forward. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Catherine Merlin. I'm uh, here on behalf of Wild Earth Guardians. Um, I'm here to discuss uh, uh, mechanical integrity tests. And if you would, I'd like to share my, my screen here. Um, so um, mechanical integrity testing uh, is an important rule of the commission. The guidance governing mechanical integrity testing was last updated 2015, in which the commission described mechanical integrity testing as a critical aspect of ensuring well war integrity tests. Um, there are a number of different circumstances in which mechanical integrity tests are required. And when they, are, when they become required, when the requirements are triggered, um, the rules do not permit an operator to place a well back into production in lieu of performing um, a mechanical integrity test. The enforcement guidance around mechanical integrity tests was also last updated in 2015, stating that the commission will seek penalties that eliminate economic incentives for non-compliance. Mechanical integrity tests have been used by the commission as a way to evaluate operators as well. Uh, they're, uh, it was one of the criteria which uh, the commission looked at to determine whether an operator was financially distressed. It's among the commission's simplest rules um, in that uh, it's a simple comparison between two dates. When was the requirement for mechanical integrity test triggered? And when was the last performed mechanical integrity test? Um, since they are a lagging indicator of distress, um, we believe that compliance should be monitored in real time with automated processes and, um, and enforcement should be sought promptly. There are currently uh, over 11,000, almost 11,500 wells that are subject to mechanical integrity tests, most of which are shut in wells. So in order to put these complaints together, we relied heavily on COGIS, which is the database for all public documents related to oil and gas operations. Uh, we understand that the commission has documents which have not been uploaded to COGIS yet um, because they've been in the process of review. Um, but in, in reviewing the documents, we discovered thousands of wells where there's no record of a mechanical integrity test at all. And in other cases appear to be years overdue. The um, process of staff review prior to publication of this data can explain some of the issues with these findings. But there, there are many other findings where there's affirmative evidence of the issues. Um, so it's not an absence of evidence, it's an evidence of absence. Um, here's just an example of some of the wells that um, we found belonging to different operators that had no mechanical integrity tests. So about 2,500, uh, the largest number of which belong to a noble under their alternate agreement. We also found 237 wells with expired mechanical integrity tests. And again, this complaint was filed last summer in June. So we're just talking about the numbers as of um, that time. So of these 237 wells, 90 had an idle status date of more than a, a decade. And many of them had not produced um, ever <laughs> or, or many uh, for more than a decade as well. Um, so I just briefly want to uh, go over some of the issues that we found. Um, of course, with 103 wells, I can't dive into all of them. Um, so um, you see here the, the, the second well on this list was shut in um, between 1999 and 2007, um, produced, uh, produced uh, less than 200 um, MCF of gas, was shut in again, received a warning letter, in 2012, then produced in 13 and 14, again, less than 200 MCF, received an NOAV for open venting in 2019, but no, no NOAVs for that well related to MITs. Um, many instances, these wells, you see uh, warning letters that are sent years after the date of violation, um, and then NOAVs, um, uh, much beyond the six month warning period um, if they were if the NOAVs are ever sent at all. Um, so many of these wells also had other issues. Um, this um, Argali well, uh, the last document filed by Argali was filed in 2014. Uh, inspectors were unable to access the site for inspection the last three times they attempted to go out there. Um, and the last uh, the last four out of five inspections had corrective actions required. So I have many pages of, of these types of issues. Again, I just don't have time to go into all of them. Um, I will um, 
file this later with the commission for you to review. I, I can bring it back up if you have more questions about those. The response from staff indicated largely that, um, that the vast majority of these wells were actually in compliance with COGCC rules and that the reason for their apparent non-compliance was that there was data not available to the public. Um, they did say that four wells were not in compliance, um, but they did not say which <laughs> were or uh, explain the serious deficiencies we found with the other wells. We identified wells that were operated by defunct operators who no longer exist, operators who stopped contact with the COGCC years ago, who are still not in the orphan well program. We have warnings issues years after the date of violation and NOAVs that are issued much later than six months after the warning letter, if at all. And important forms are absent that can't be explained by simply being in process. Again, there's actual affirmative evidence um, that they weren't filed. Ms. Merlin, apologies for interrupting, but you have gone over the five minutes. Um, I'll allow uh, hearing officer Thomas to correct me, but I, I believe if you keep going, that will eat into your um, time for rebuttal. So I'm, I'm sorry, um, Ms. Larson, but I thought that you wanted me to go through the entire presentation. Perhaps Ms. Um, Hearing Officer Thomas can per, um, ensure that I'm reading the order correctly. Uh, my understanding was that there was five minutes for a lot of guardians on this first matter, and then staff would have its opportunity for a response and then we would have the opportunity for rebuttal and we would do that for the two other um, matters, Fram and then Noble. Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I will wrap up this section to just state that um, uh, we believe that the there are many operators failing to perform mechanical integrity tests. Uh, mainly we're concerned with the process um, of identifying and enforcing these violations. Um, uh, we think that the commission should shift a focus uh, uh, shift resources to information management, streamlining oversight and enforcement procedures, accelerating enforcement, and crafting simple rules um, that are easy to implement in the future, um, given the difficulties with implementing a uh, simple rule that just compares two dates. Um, I'll stop there. Ms. Mercer? Ms. Uh, Merlin, if you could stop the screen share, that would be Helpful. Yes, uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, I've got a, there we go. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will share my screen now. All right, can everyone view my presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Hello, commissioners. I'm Assistant Attorney General Lauren Mercer, appearing on behalf of COGCC staff. I'll address the portions of WEG's petition related to the list of wells and the Noble Alternative Program. I'm joined by AEG Scott Schultz, who will address the complaints related to FRAM, PCR, Citation, and NRG. We are also joined by Director Murphy and members of COGCC Engineering and Enforcement staff, who are available to answer the commission's questions in the event that Scott or I are unable to. Staff's position is that WEG's petition should be denied in full on both substantive and procedural grounds. I'll begin by providing a brief overview of staff's MIT compliance process before diving into the specific allegations in the petition. MIT testing is an enforcement priority for staff and ensuring that MITs are completed on time and in compliance with the rules is a responsibility that staff takes seriously. To monitor compliance with MIT testing re requirements, twice a year, COGCC engineering staff initiates extensive and comprehensive audits. Staff runs a query that scans COGIS for any late or missing MIT-related form submissions, which results in a list of wells that are potentially out of compliance. Staff then conducts a well-by-well -well manual audit to validate the query's result. For each well on the list, Staff reviews any relevant information provided by the operator and validates that data based on staff's internal records, including inspection reports, in-process forms, and staff notes in the well file. Ms. Merlin noted in her presentation that staff communicated to WEG that they relied on data that was not available to the public in reviewing MIT compliance. And this is true. 
All form submissions are reviewed by technical staff to ensure compliance and accurate reporting prior to being approved and posted to the public facing database. And that's because although the COGCC has a forums based compliance system, that system depends on the human beings who work for the agency and are experts in engineering, geology, and other subject matter. So forms are reviewed and then they are posted after that review. Um, although I can understand the desire to have everything available to the public as soon as it's submitted, doing so could result in confusion or inaccurate information, given that, that those forms would not yet have been reviewed and validated by staff. Returning to the audit that um, engineering staff conducts, um, staff also communicates as needed with field inspectors, enforcement staff, the Orphaned Well Program, and other relevant staff members to complete their review. After completing the review, staff then initiates the enforcement process for all wells that are out of compliance. Staff will typically send these operators a warning letter that includes a corrective action due date for completing the MIT. Warning letters begin a dialogue between staff and the operators and usually lead to the operator completing an MIT prior to the corrective action due date. As the commission is aware, compliance and not the issuance of NOABs or the collection of penalties is staff's top enforcement priority. Warning letters serve this priority. After the correction, corrective action dates specified in any warning letters have passed, staff conducts a follow-up audit to verify that the MIT, MITs have been completed. Any wells for which operators have not timely completed the MIT are then escalated to enforcement staff for the issuance of an NOAB. Later in today's hearing, AAG Schultz will discuss several instances where MIT testing violations that were identified through this process are being prosecuted. With that background, I'll address section one of WEG's petition. The commission should deny the request for relief in section one of the petition for three reasons. First, WEG fails to point to any decision by the director that could be fairly characterized as clearly erroneous. Second, WEG never filed an underlying complaint regarding these allegations, and therefore they are not properly before the commission. Third, much of the requested relief is unavailable under the rules. For these reasons, the petition should be denied. As set forth in Rule 510G, which I'm sharing on my screen, it is WEG's burden in today's hearing to demonstrate that the director's decisions on its complaints were clearly erroneous. This is a high bar that WEG cannot meet. The clearly erroneous standard is a high one, and a decision is clearly erroneous if it finds no support in the evidence in the record. Courts have made clear that this is a significantly deferential standard. And in the statement of basis and purpose for the complaint and rulemaking, where the rule 524 was last substantively amended, the commission made clear that it selected the clearly erroneous standard for petitions of review because, quote, investigation and enforcement decisions contain elements of discretion that absent a clearly erroneous outcome should not be disturbed. All of this is to say that clearly erroneous is a high bar and a significantly higher one than the uh, preponderance of the evidence standard that this commission applies in most matters. In section one of its petition, WEG challenges staff's decision not to issue NOABs for four wells that staff determined to be out of compliance after reviewing WEG's list of 103 potentially non-compliant wells. This decision was not clearly erroneous. When WEG reached out to staff with concerns that a list of wells were out of compliance with MIT testing requirements, staff took those concerns seriously and informally agreed to audit WEG's list to determine if those wells were in fact overdue for MITs. To vet WEG's list, engineering staff followed the same process that is used in its, its um, regular audits. Staff checked WEG's list, which was based on publicly available data, against internal data and in-process forms. Engineering staff also discussed issues with other staff members to validate the data where necessary. Staff noted the outcome of this audit on a spreadsheet, which staff submitted as Exhibit C to its response to the petition. In this spreadsheet, staff noted the reasons why it was determined that either an MIT was not in fact overdue for a well, or 
if there were other reasons not to take further action at this time. For instance, if a well was located on tribal lands, part of the orphaned well program, or already subject to a pending enforcement action. Staff identified only four wells out of the list of 103 that were actually overdue for MIT testing and not already subject to a warning letter or NOAB. Staff communicated this conclusion to WEG and explained that these wells would have been captured in the next routine MIT audit and would be subject to warning letters as is staff, would be the subject of warning letters as is staff's typical process. The determination to treat these alleged violations consistently with other MIT testing violations and to issue warning letters, a proven compliance mechanism, is well within staff's enforcement discretion and is not clearly erroneous. Second, section one of WEG's petition should be denied on procedural grounds for failure to file a Form 18 complaint. It is clear from Rule 524 that the filing of a Form 18 complaint is a jurisdictional prerequisite to a petition for review. Therefore, these allegations are not properly before the commission today. Rule 524 sets out the process for filing a complaint and the petition for review process. 524 establishes that any person may initiate this process by making a complaint using a Form 18, alleging a violation of any of the act or commission rule. Then, as she did here, the director will investigate the complaint and take appropriate action. If the complainant disagrees with the resolution of the Form 18 complaint, then the complainant may file a petition for review. Rule 524C is even more explicit on this point. It provides the complainant who has filed a written complaint on a Form 18 may file a petition for review. This language indicates that a Form 18 complaint is a prerequisite to filing a petition for review and that a person who has not filed a Form 18 may not compel a petition for review hearing before the commission. And this limitation makes sense. Form 18 complaints serve an important notice function. To read the Form 18 requirement out of Rule 524 would allow parties to file a petition for review anytime they had expressed displeasure or criticism to staff in any forum, which could lead to a flood of petitions. Additionally, eliminating the Form 18 requirement would rob staff of notice of the party's intent to challenge its decision and deny the director an opportunity to review the matter and issue a final decision. Because WEG failed to file a Form 18 complaint related to the allegations in Section 1, the Commission should deny that portion of the petition. Finally, much of the relief WEG requests in Section 1 and throughout the petition is unavailable under the rules and must be denied. Rule 524C sets out the two permissible purposes of a petition for review. A petition can only be used to object to one, the director's decision not to issue an NOAV for an alleged violation specifically identified in an underlying written complaint, or two, to object to the terms of a final proposed AOC settling a violation, again, arising directly from the Form 18 complaint. It follows that the relief available in a petition for review hearing is limited to the scope of the relief the petition is authorized to seek under Rule 524 that being the issuance of an NOAV or the amendment of an AOC. The specificity of Rule 524 and 510G, combined with the SBP for the complainant rulemaking, demonstrate that the Commission intended petitions for review to serve a relatively narrow purpose. Nothing in the rules or the SBP suggests that petitions for review are intended to be used to seek wide-ranging policy changes, as WEG does today. Such changes are better addressed through rulemaking or other processes that allow for a dialogue among the commission, staff, and stakeholders, not through a narrowly confined adjudicatory hearing. With that, I will close this portion of our argument um, by addressing the specific requests for relief in WEG's petition. Now, just to underscore one more time, our position is that all of these requests are barred because WEG never filed an underlying Form 18 complaint. And there are also additional reasons for denying each of the individual requests. WEG's first two requests ask for the provision of certain data related to um, staff's review of the list of 103 wells. 
This is not relief that is contemplated by Rule 524. But even so, staff elected to provide that information as attachments and explanation in its response to the petition um, in order to um, share its process with WEG and the, the commission. Therefore, these requests have already been satisfied and no further action is necessary. The next two requests seek specific amendments to the 2015 enforcement guidance that governs all COGCC enforcement matters. As I've discussed, a petition for review hearing is not intended to address wide ranging policy matters. And more importantly, this isn't the best forum to have these sorts of discussions. While staff does not disagree that a, um, an update to the 2015 enforcement guidance would be a good idea, such an update should be comprehensive and should take into account all of the needed changes post mission change, more rather than one off um, amendments as proposed by WEG. Moreover, it should be done through a comprehensive and a process that allows dialogue between staff, the commission, and potentially other stakeholders. Finally, WEG asks that the, the commission order the director to issue NOABs for those four wells that were determined to be out of compliance. As, expl as I explained, this is not appropriate, first, because WEG never filed a Form 18 on these wells, and second, because staff's decision not to issue those NOABs was not clearly erroneous. Thank you. Ms. Larson, am I now providing Ms. Merle a rebuttal on this issue? Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, and just so the parties know, Ms. Merlin, um, you have 18 minutes and 51 seconds remaining. And staff has, um, forgive me one moment, 11 minutes and 28 seconds remaining. Thank you. It was not Guardian's intent to have to use the complaint process to have these concerns heard. However, um, there was a lack of other available mechanisms. Um, Guardians originally filed this uh, form, the, the list uh, engineering responded. Um, that is correct. Uh, the staff was the party that chose to respond to this list and categorize it as a complaint. Uh, in their response, um, the staff responded to the list, the specific complaints against four operators and the complaint against Noble in one consolidated document and to treat them the same. That is why we filed the petition for review. Um, we have continually sought uh, interaction with staff to understand and work through um, the concerns about mechanical integrity testing. And um, I will um, note that the forms, the exhibit C, uh, which Ms. Mercer referred to as an exhibit, um, provided some explanation as to why um, a, a warning or NOAB was not issued, but I will, I will read you um, a few of them. Um, operator has current NOAB for multiple wells instructed not to issue another. Um, there is no rule which states that it, an, an operator has a maximum number of NOAVs that can remain pending, and therefore they should not be subject to an additional NOAV. Uh, it, it, the, there was no, uh, yeah. Um, I, we agree that there were some, some wells within this list where documentation did appear. Um, to have been in process. However, as I explained before, this does not explain all of the deficiencies in the mechanical integrity testing. There were numerous wells where me uh, mechanical integrity testing uh, was deficient and staff simply chose not to um, proceed uh, with enforcement against those violations. Um, that was the basis for our complaint. Um, we think if the if staff is choosing to selectively enforce, we should bring that to the commission's attention. We're seeking enforcement against those wells. Um, I apologize if this is not the you know correct procedural mechanism. And if you want to dismiss my my petition for review on procedural grounds, 
I understand, however, the substantive concerns remain and they should be addressed by this commission at some point. If not today, then I'd like to know when and I'd like to know how, because these are serious uh, issues and I'll reserve the rest of my time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do, do you want to address the other issues, Ms. Merlin, at this point? Or do commissioners uh, have questions for either party on this first issue? I'm not seeing any questions. Proceed, Ms. Merlin. I have nothing to add. The, the three points which Ms. Mercer um, brought up is that um, there's a manual audit. We, we don't deny that. Uh, we're alleging that it's inefficient and fails to catch um, violations. Um, or if it does, then it's, it's ex at much later points in time. And we think that that's well demonstrated by the list, which clearly shows that the data violation um, was well in advance of, of the date of any warning. And in many cases, the date of warning was well in advance um, uh, of any uh, NOAV. In some cases, NOAVs were not issued at all. Um, the, we found in, in one case uh, where, um, uh, I'm sorry, that was from the, the other complaint. Um, that there is affirmative evidence of violations here. Um, the decision is clearly erroneous um, because it is not supported by evidence in the record. Um, in order to uh, receive deference for your um, administrative decision, it has to be supported by some competent evidence and there's no evidence here supporting the decision that was made. The relief being unavailable, uh, the relief is available, this commission can proceed with issuing NOAVs against operators who are delinquent for mechanical integrity testing. To answer your question. Okay, do you have anything further than Ms. Merlin for us on your petition at this time? Not on this list. I still have issues related to the specific operators as well as the noble, uh, MIT exemptions. Okay, so uh, I'm a little confused, but perhaps you could move to your these other two matters at this point. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I was waiting to see if there were any questions. There did not appear to be any questions. Okay. Oh, actually, there is one. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this, this question actually might be for Ms. Mercer. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding how the complaint process might work. So had Ms. Merlin submitted a form 18, does it have to be an, an NOAV that has already been um, given by the commission or can the complaint also be related to one that they think should have been given but never was? I, the way that you're presenting almost makes it seem like it's some, someone who disagrees with how an NOAV has been addressed. Can it also be one that's lacking? Yes, uh, Commissioner McGowan, thank you for that question. Um, yes, so a complaint can be filed either to ask the director to issue an NOAV where none has been issued, or so that, that's a yes to your question basically. And then the second circumstance is if there's an NOAV that's already been issued and staff, um, and staff is in the process of negotiating an AOC with the operator, um, a complaint can be used to ask for revisions to that settlement agreement. Okay, thank you. Okay, I believe that is the sole question that we had at this point. So Ms. Merlin, if you'd like to proceed. Thank you, I'll uh, return to screen sharing. Sorry for the lack of efficiency having to switch between views. Uh, well, I'm in presenter view now that will have to do. Um, so um, Wild Earth Guardians filed um, uh, complaints against four separate operators for failing to perform required mechanical integrity tests. 
The operators were Natural Resources Group, FRAM, Citation, and PCR. With regard to the Natural Resources Group complaint, the director has now uh, requested um, her own order fi finding violation against um, Natural Resources Group. Um, this application was filed on December 21st of last year. Uh, it was noticed for today. Uh, it's actually, I didn't see it on the agenda for today. I don't believe that uh, any discussion of this or any other um, uh, matter which has been uh, uh, requested an order finding violation does violate the, the ex parte rule since um, the request for the order finding violation is uncontested. This hearing was noticed to all parties and is on the public record. Um, our complaint also precedes, uh, predates the other matter. Um, so we filed a complaint against um, Natural Resources Group for 12 wells, um, which uh, were overdue for mechanical integrity tests, um, some by as many as uh, more than uh, 4,000 days. So um, this well, the Garcia 3414, um, number seven, um, has an official shut-in date of 2017, uh, but in their uh, production reports, you can see they were actually shut in um, in 2015. Um, their last mechanical integrity test was performed in 2003. Um, there, um, there are three NOAVs pending related to MITs, um, but um, not all of the one of the wells is listed as being in the orphan well program. Number nine, the Garcia 3.5 is not listed in any of the NOAVs. So um, why did Guardians file a complaint against this? Well, we saw that there had been a lack of mechanical integrity testing, that some mechanical integrity testing was due for a very long time, that some overdue wells uh, had multiple NOAVs pending um, for that single well, while others uh, apparently overdue wells had none. Um, because mechanical integrity testing is a crucial aspect of ensuring well bore integrity and is also a critical indicator of operator financial distress, um, we are concerned about oversight that appears to be uh, random and spotty. Um, there were um, other violations as well, um, failure to allow access for inspections, no notice of subsequent abandonments, failure to perform corrective actions, and over 100 required corrective actions failure to report production and uncontrolled venting at one of their wells. The next operator was FRAM. This has also been noticed for, uh, this has also uh, had an application for an order finding violation. Um, same- I'm gonna object. This is, this is Scott Schultz, Council for the Commission, and uh, Council for Staff, I'm sorry. I'm gonna object to this. Um, I, I believe this is getting to some potential ex parte communications. Uh, or these, these are, both these cases will be heard by the commission next week. Um, I don't think it's appropriate to really get into the details. That's, I don't think that's part of the record. Um, so that's my objection is that I believe this is um, some ex parte, uh, getting into some ex parte issues. And again, these specific FRAM and um, NRG are noticed for next week and will be in front of the commission. Uh, I think that's the appropriate forum for this discussion. And if I may respond, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Guardians did file these complaints on Form 18, which does give us procedural rights to participate in these matters, including um, moving through enforcement. In fact, we would object to having been excluded um, from the director's uh, request for an order finding violation. Um, with respect to staff and their diligence, their matters were noticed very late last year, only, only a few months ago. In fact, with, with a Natural Resources Group, that was only noticed in December, at the end of December. Um, it appears, in fact, um, it could be argued that it might appear to some that these uh, orders finding violations requests were filed in order to uh, attempt to invoke an ex parte hearing to prevent me from raising these concerns today, which is, concerning. Um, we, <laughs> uh, we're not trying to, th these, these hearings um, have been noticed for a very long time. Our complaints were filed back in June of last year, which is also prior to any uh, request for an order finding violation by the director. Um, that that's my record. We, we had a, we had a right to actually participate in those orders finding violation under um, 
the sorry i don't have the rule at hand um under the complaint the the uh, the rights of complainants um to participate in that can i ask a question and um this will i think it's to mr schultz but so the the matters are going to be heard next week by the commission is that right they're docketed on our agenda that's correct okay and will and i don't know the answer to this but i'm just asking will miss merlin have an opportunity to be a part of that discussion or consideration we we don't i guess i wouldn't object to that she's never asked for that um the specific portion of Rule 524 about complaints is in regards to AOCs. This is not, these will not be AOCs um, involving NRG and FRAM. They are bankrupt entities um, and they involve uh, OFVs, proposed OFVs. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, object to her participating next week, but we've heard nothing from Ms. Merlin regarding that. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily appropriate, but. I guess I wouldn't necessarily object. So, so we received no notice of those applications. Um, the the application was filed December twenty first um, regarding natural resources group um, and was noticed for a hearing today. Um, so we, I wouldn't say we've actually had fair notice. Um, regardless. Um, but, but yeah, the, Merlin, those matters are uncontested, so I, I'm not sure since, since those matters are entirely between staff and the commission and so both staff Merlin, and the commission are here today. What is your ask on this point at this point sure. in time, given that these are about to come before us for hearing, which is it appears what you're seeking from the sure. outset. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, I was going to get to that point. So first we have the, the two operators. Um, natural resources group um, and um, and and uh, Fram who have pending um, requests for orders find, finding violation. The third operator was actually the subject of an enforcement um, action. Uh, 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 sorry, um, I have them slightly out of order. The slides. Um, PCR had its uh, operating license revoked in October of 2021. It had similar violations to the other operators. Um, out of 163 wells, we identified 63 wells that were overdue for mechanical integrity test. Um, this, this relates to the remaining, um, the remaining operator citation. So citation, we could not find, uh, we, we reviewed the in pending enforcement matters. We could not find pending enforcement related to citation. So the, the ask here, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that you're in the final stages of enforcement against um, FRAM and Natural Resources Group. However, there's a remaining operator citation. Um, citation um, did some mechanical integrity testing and plugged some wells in 2001. Oh. I'm going to object again. Um, again, this is an active enforcement case. I don't think it's proper um, for Ms. Merlin to get into these details. I think it is ex parte uh, involvement. Citation was not noticed of this case. Um, so that's my objection. Um, this is an active enforcement case that staff has issued NOAVs for. So, yes, citation has NOAVs. Um, we we filed our complaint against citation. We, we, filed, we filed our complaint against citation for having overdue mechanical integrity testing. They do have some NOAVs. Um, they did not have NOAVs related to all of their wells. There were additional NOAVs that could have been issued. Um, we did properly file our complaint. We did properly file the petition for review on the hearing. We did properly notice the hearing. Um, I did attempt to search for any active um, docket numbers related to those NOAVs and did not find any. If Mr. Schultz has a correction for me on that point that there are active docketed enforcement proceedings against citation, I can revise that statement. Um, however, I don't believe that there are. Um, they do have three pending NOAVs related to their MITs. Um, our point with relationship to, to citation is that they're playing catch up on their mechanical integrity testing and their plugging. Um, however, 
um, they are, still have many risk factors um, related to um, these mechanical integrity tests. These three other operators, which I was go going to attempt to discuss in some kind of order, have very similar violations. The problem is, is that with those three other operators, the commission did enforcement too late. You didn't go after them. Now they're bankrupt. They're headed for orphanage. There's nothing we can do. With citation, it's not too late. There are indicia of distress. And we appreciate that citation is attempting to catch up on their overdue obligations. Um, however, um, we believe that that additional, that that enforcement on those NOAVs without additional delay is appropriate and that they should negotiate, that you should negotiate a plugging schedule with citation as part of your enforcement action because they have current resources to do the plugging, um, but they might not in the future. Um, they're only financially assured for about $6,000 per well. To my they objection. They have 180 wells. Ms. Marilyn. Sorry? I continue my objection of getting into the merits of this case. Uh, filing an NOAV is commencement of an enforcement action. These are active enforcement matters that will very likely be in front of this commission. Um, so for that reason, I object to this sort of testimony. Okay, I'm gonna uh, give the floor to AAG Davenport. Can you help us through this matter at this point? I mean, it seems to me that with regard to several but not all maybe not the citation one that there are active noav enforcement matters going on and it, it almost seems to me this is moot at this point but uh aag davenport thank you mr chair uh yes i i tend i agree in the sense that in regard to the the specific matter that we're here today, the petition for review, I'm not sure in regard to the ongoing enforcement matters, what the request is in regard to the very specific petition for review that we're hearing. So in that regard, if there's an ongoing enforcement matter, in my view, the merits of those should be dealt with in that enforcement matter. Um, and this matter should be limited to whether or not there is still outside of the enforcement matters, some erroneous decision by the director in that regard. And so my view is it's appropriate to limit this discussion to the petition for review, whether or not there's something erroneous the director did in regard to matters that are not subject to an ongoing enforcement action. Hey, sorry, Mr. Davenport, if you could clarify what is an ongoing enforcement action in your opinion? My understanding is in regard to the three, well, all four of the operators that I believe have been mentioned have had, there is a, an NOAV that's been issued that will be heard by the commission at some point in the future. I consider that to be an ongoing enforcement action. So I'm gonna sustain the objection to the extent that uh, we do not wanna get into the specifics on an ongoing enforcement matter. Um, Ms. Merlin, if you wanna finalize okay. your argument on this point and then we can turn to the noble point. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> And we would just like to register objection. An NOAV is not an ongoing enforcement action. Uh, if, it's, if it's docketed, we can respect that point. However, um, an NOAV does not create any um, deadlines. It is not um, being heard by anyone. Once a matter has an NOAV pending, the director has an unlimited uh, amount of time to uh, prior to actually seeking enforcement. Um, against the operator. So citation um, does have wells which are overdue for mechanical integrity testing, which have not been the subject of any of the three other pending NOAVs. The three current NOAVs relate only to these specifically enumerated wells. 
McCormick, Bledsoe, Arapaho, MPU, Schneider, Dickinson, Arapaho Unit 146, and Mount Pearl Unit 1325. Um, these other wells, the White 22, the Frontera Unit 33, the Kern 43, the um, Mount, the other, um, that might have been a typo. There might be the Dickinson one might actually be. Oh yeah, sorry. The NOAV has been issued here. The ones that have the NA in front of it is where the NOAV has not been issued in, for that particular well. Um, so, and the plus symbol indicates that that is ongoing um, uh, overdue with no NOAV pending. So with relation to um, not issuing NOAVs for those uh, wells, we believe that that decision is clearly erroneous. Um, we believe that uh, NOAVs should be issued with regard to wells where um, MITs are clearly overdue um, per commission rules and commission policy, which states that um, mechanical integrity tests are critical to wellbore integrity um, and, um, and that enforcement should be sought to prevent the, to prevent the economic benefit by the operators who fail to do mechanical integrity tests. That is the commission's own um, formal guidance, which was published in 2015. It has been the commission's um, formal policy for six years now um, that mechanical integrity testing is a serious violation and should be treated with seriousness. Um, so we, again, um, believe that NOABs should be um, issued and enforcement should be sought against citation and that the commission should proceed with enforcement and negotiate a plugging schedule um, or MIT schedule um, with citation. Um, and additionally, you know, possibly even raise the financial assurances. They, they uh, failure to perform mechanical integrity test has been used by the commission as an indicia of financial distress. Um, and we, we believe that their, their current willingness to plug and abandon and perform these overdue MITs mitigates the potential for harm, but it doesn't eliminate the risk. That's what we have. And, oh, sorry, I, if I, one more point. I'm so, so sorry about that. But um, uh, one more point with, uh, with um, sorry, with uh, PCR, which is the operator against, against which you had uh, finalized your enforcement. So sorry, my computer's acting up. Um, PCR did already have its license revoked. There's no um, possibility of ex parte communications there. They had these similar violations. Um, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. I, I apologize for interrupting. Um, I, I don't know if there's any way that that council could have been aware of this, but PCR is actually still ongoing to the extent that PCR has filed a request with the commission to review that default judgment. And there's um, active litigation in that regard as well right now. Okay, so then we should not get into that matter at this point in time? That's my opinion, yes. Okay, so ordered. Uh, let me hear from Ms. Larson and then we'll hear from Ms. Merlin on the noble matter and then Ms. Larson, Ms. Mercer on the noble matter and then we will move toward deliberation. Ms. Mercer, do you have anything to add at this point? Um, AEG Scott Schultz uh, will actually. Oh, sorry, AEG Schultz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this would be pretty quick. Uh, you've heard some of the issues already in my objections, but as Liz Lauren indicated right off the get go, staff, staff takes um, allegations of MIT violations very seriously, and it is an enforcement priority. Um, we talked about PCR. The, the commission uh, issued an order regarding PCR very recently. Natural Resources Group Incorporated, a bankrupt entity. You, you, I'll be before you next week regarding the um, proposed order funding violation. Frame Operating LLC, again, I'll be in front of you next week and regarding a proposed order funding violation. And we did move up these defaults in, our, in terms of our enforcement priority to try to get these in front of the commission as soon as possible. Um, lastly, Citation Oil and Corp, uh, and Corp um, otherwise known as Citation, NOAVs have been issued um, regarding that operator, and those will be dealt with uh, appropriately, and those will likely be in front of um, this commission uh, in, the, in the future as well. 
So as I indicated, these are ongoing enforcement matters that are already scheduled or maybe before you in the future. Um, happy to any, answer any other questions you have, but these are active enforcement cases. Um, I think that illustrates how staff, CRC staff um, takes these MIT violations. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Ms. Merlin, uh, I don't know how much time you've got left, but do you want to do any rebuttal on that point or do you want to move to your final point? Um, I no rebuttal on that point. Okay. You have 10 minutes and six seconds left. Let's let you move on to the noble MIT exemption that you have on your slides. Mr. Chair. Yeah. Sorry, I'm guessing that you can't see everybody. Um, I'm wondering if Sorry. I can ask a question of Mr. Schultz. Go ahead. Thank you. So, um, if I'm understanding correctly, Ms. Merlin has submitted a form 18 for these four operators, um, all of them under some sort of NOAV or enforcement issues that may or may not come before the commission. For citation in particular, it sounds to me like part of her complaint is she has specified wells for which there has not been an NOAV submitted for a mechanical integrity test done timely per our rules. So for those specific wells that Citation owns, is she allowed, or in your opinion, can she request the relief that she wants for those particular wells, the ones that were not have not been given NOAVs for MITs for Citation that are late? It, are you asking whether I believe Ms. Merlin followed the proper complaint process for that? Yes. So based on what Ms. Mercer said before, <laughs> the complaint can involve something that the complainant thinks should have happened but didn't. So in this case, it would be those wells. So I, I understand that there's NOAVs against some of the wells. Not all of them were given NOAVs for non-timely MITs. And that is the complaint, correct? That they should be have been given NOAVs. Right. Either of you can answer, but I, I'm just trying to figure out like this narrow slice of, we're not right. supposed to talk about some things and it's okay to talk about some. If the NOAV hasn't actually been given for some of those wells, then is there is there not an ex parte issue here? Right, this is, it's definitely a sticky issue. Um, I believe that Ms. Merlin, uh, her complaint was was proper um, in that identifying the citation, you know, alleged violations. But then we still get to what is the procedure, the, the proper, um, I guess, burden of proof that she has to prove that staff and the director were in error. And that's clearly erroneous. Um, as the commission knows, we have, a lot of enforcement cases. And um, again, going back to the issuance of an NOAV, that is commencement of an enforcement action. When we look at rule 523, little c, three, big A. Um, service of an NOAV cons constitutes commencement of an enforcement action um, or other pr proceeding for purposes of 3461.15. So, um, Yes, Ms. Merlin's complaint regarding citation, I think was proper, but I don't think in any way she can meet, she has met her uh, legal burden of proof, proof of clearly erroneous that staff has not yet, um, you know, negotiated at AOC um, or regarding this matter. I, I don't believe that's an extremely high burden. Um, and again, staff has issued NOAVs for this. They have to have the enforcement discretion to prioritize some of these cases. Um, we did prioritize FRAM and PCR and some of the other bankruptcy proceedings um, that I brought before you a few months ago um, and rushed those to get those in front of the commission and get those onto the orphan well list. We, we did prioritize those, um, but everything can't be a priority. Um, so I, I don't believe that Ms. Merlin has met, can meet her burden that us not yet negotiating an AOC regarding um, these alleged violations by citation is clearly erroneous. But I believe again, that the filing of the complaint, um, I think she met her procedural portion on that um, regarding citation. And I hope if I can quickly respond to that. 
I, yes, I do want to express thanks and appreciation for um, the, the work that has gone into uh, these complaints by staff um, and the Attorney General's office um, and moving up these bankrupt companies, um, which was part of a discussion that we had uh, last year. It, thank you. That, yes, um, that's, I think, what the everyone wants to see here is um, uh, things moving. Specifically, the, the relief sought um, included the issuance of NOAVs for um, wells that have overdue mechanical integrity testing um, for which no NOAV has yet been issued. And the reason that we requested that is because um, enforcement and penalties are tied to the issuance of an NOAV. Um, and we, if, if, if the operator is not given an NOAV for a particular well, the enforcement action will reflect um, a smaller number of violations than if the appropriate number of NOAVs or NOAVs that include the appropriate number of counts of violation um, are issued. So specifically uh, where uh, mechanical integrity testing is overdue um, and has not uh, yet resulted in mechanical integrity tests, um, if the, um, you know, we believe that NOAVs should be issued. If I could just real briefly respond is um, we did move these defaults up at the commission's request. We were trying to listen to the commission and we understood that they wanted these defaults as, as soon as possible. That's why you heard Smith Energy. That's why you are going to hear FRAM and NRG um, next week. And Citation is, is not um, a defunct operator at this time. Again, I don't want to get into the, the details of Citation, but um, that is, again, part of the prioritization. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Ms. McGowan, follow-up, Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Merlin. I, do, you, do you believe that um, enforcement staff maybe has a bigger picture than you're focused, you're, you're solely focused on the enforcement of the MIT part of the rule and I think that enforcement staff maybe looks at an operator um, with a larger view in mind and, and an, an eventual kind of enforcement, um, trying to get to the end of an enforcement issue with an operator. And so uh, in your opinion, I guess, or looking at our rules, uh, is there not some discretion for our staff to say, here's where it should apply, here's where we're going to look at using th this rule or a different rule because there's a bigger picture with what's going on with an operator and an end goal that we need to get to for compliance and or enforcement. Um, thank you, Commissioner McGowan. Um, I, I, I think I understand what you're getting at, which is that it's, it's, a, big, it's a big picture. And uh, if you're looking simply at pushing enforcements, you may be missing the big picture um, with regard to particular operator. Um, I don't believe that's correct. Um, with the enforcement actions give the commission and staff the ability to um, negotiate with operators um, and to issue um, um, binding um, resolutions. I understand that um, in some cases um, there may be, it's a little hard for the public to suss out. I'll, I'll, I'll put that forward. Uh, is staff having a conversation with an operator that may be overdue and saying, hey, you know, look, things happen, get back on track, we'll work it out, you know, get back to us in six months, let us know how you're doing. And, you know, uh, we'd like to see some progress. We don't wanna have to issue NOAVs against you. That really constitutes the good guy discount. It's not anticipated in the rules anywhere. It really creates uh, an arbitrary system of regulation uh, where regulations aren't really binding, um, they're sort of, guidelines for staff as to what they should talk about with operators um, when they talk to them. If an operator has viol violated a rule and the enforcement policies say that the violation starts on the day <laughs> after uh, that rule is violated, as your guidance for mechanical integrity testing enforcement states, the violation starts on the day after the mechanical integrity test is, is uh, missed by not engaging in enforcement, um, you're not providing the opportunities for, uh, for example, for the commission to review these decisions. They're, they might be made by staff, you know, in informal discussions, informal negotiations, 
that aren't really binding. And it really deprives the public of the ability to understand what's going on with these wells. It deprives the commission um, of some ability to understand what's going on with these operators um, and the state that they're in. Um, and we believe that going through formal enforcement proceedings is the correct um, avenue. Uh, if there's negotiating and big picture to be done, um, it should be done on, on after the NOAV is being issued. That's actually the purpose of the period of time between the NOAV being issued and the proceeding of uh, enforcement, um, sorry, I won't call it enforcement actions, but docketing the enforcement action. Um, the enforcement guidance says that that's supposed to be time for the director to negotiate with the, a resolution with the operator. So uh, again, we think that the, the issuance of those NOAVs up front um, provides the public and the commission with an important opportunity to understand uh, what's going on and create some formality in the process. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm not seeing further questions. Um, at this point, I believe you've got, uh, let's do a time check, Ms. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, one moment. Uh, Wild Earth Guardian still has 10 minutes and six seconds remaining. Staff has 10 minutes and eight seconds remaining. Okay, uh, Ms. Merlin, if you would like to move to your last, the last point of your petition, please. Thank you. I'll try not to use up that entire 10 minutes, um, but we, we filed a complaint against Noble's um, alternate program, um, which is essentially an exception um, to mechanical integrity testing requirements for a number of their wells. So um, just to avoid confusion, Noble was acquired by Chevron and combined it now, I believe owns uh, uh, this 6,358 wells. Um, however, in the COGAS database, uh, Noble's wells are still um, um, cataloged as belonging to Noble. And so, um, and because Noble was the operator that was subject to this original alternate agreement, um, I will be just referencing Noble and I hope that doesn't create a lot of confusion. So uh, Noble itself has 4,343 wells, which are not plugged and abandoned. And of those, uh, 2,450 are shut in or temporarily abandoned, which is more than half of all of its wells. Of those uh, more than half, 1,382, um, are in this alternate program. Uh, Noble has the largest number um, of idle wells of any operator. Um, the next largest occidental um, has both a lower absolute number and as well a larger, a smaller uh, portion as of a total of their wells. Um, the uh, alternate, just for some background on the alternate program, um, the alternate program was requested by uh, Noble um, after the entry of a consent decree between the state of Colorado, the federal government, and Noble. Um, in, that, in that situation, Noble had been found to be violating emission limits um, on its separator tanks. Um, I'm sure they'll correct me if I get any of this wrong. Um, and uh, as, as part of that settlement, uh, Noble um, shut in some of their wells to give them time to um, replace some of those separators and come into compliance with the consent decree. Because of the um, uh, influx of wells that were subject to this consent decree that had to be um, idled while um, Noble determined whether to bring them up into compliance, um, uh, uh, with the upgraded equipment requirements or whether to plug and abandon, they uh, requested from the that the commission approve this um, alternate program. The alternate program um, was a list of, I believe about 2,300 wells, um, which they uh, requested an exemption to mechanical integrity testing for um, these enumerated wells. They, um, promised to plug 222 of them by December um, 31st um, of uh, 20, 2019, um, and, um, and promised to um, continue to prioritize plug and abandonment. Um, however, there were no, in this alternate program, there were no hard um, deadlines for plugging the wells subject to this program. Uh, it was stated that uh, the wells would remain in this program um, until they were plugged, 
Um, so no end date and no plugging schedule was incorporated into this alternate program. The program does require frequent periodic reviews with staff. Um, and staff has expressed their support for this program um, and believe that um, Noble has been complying with the um, spirit of the agreement, although they did um, concede that some of the wells uh, were not um, fully plugged and abandoned um, of those 222 um, by the requisite date that was part of the formal agreement. Um, so um, the reason why uh, Wild Earth Guardians is concerned with this is because um, Noble's plugging program has fallen off uh, sharply. Um, this uh, is a uh, chart reflecting their, their plugging operations. You can see that they uh, began to significantly ramp them up in 2012. Um, they peaked in 2019. Um, 2021, um, they've only filed the plugging uh, reports, it appears, through September. So we prorated 2021 to reflect that number, there was a sharp decline. Um, so uh, the consent decree between Colorado, the federal government and, and Noble was uh, essentially punitive in nature for violations of state and federal emissions rules in a non-attainment area. Um, um, they suggested uh, when they put forward this alternate program that the program um, would essentially be self-limiting um, as they were engaging in major plugging operations. Um, the, the alternate program uses Braden head testing in lieu of mechanical integrity tests for all the wells that are subject to um, this agreement. Um, however, there's no data to support um, the idea that Braden head testing is an adequate substitute for mechanical integrity testing. And the COGCC has called mechanical integrity testing, again, a critical aspect of wellbore integrity. Um, so uh, additionally, the lack of diligence in performing mechanical integrity tests has been used as an indicator of financial instability and is a known risk factor associated with increased risk of orphanage. Because the rate of plugging has slowed, there's no minimum plugging rate specified in the program, no end date for the program, and all uh, wells in the program at inception remain until they're plugged. We believe that this alternate program is not in the public interest, um, that important environmental and public protections are being sacrificed. Um, well bore integrity is not being assured as the wells continue to age. Um, we believe that there was clear uh, error in the staff's decision because um, the decision does not ensure the protection of public health, safety, and welfare. Um, however, Guardians in this matter does not seek an NOAV. We um, do agree with staff that um, the uh, other than those 222 wells, a few of them missing deadlines for plugging, um, that you know Noble has done what's required under the agreement, um, mostly, um, but that's largely because the, the program is very um, non, is very uh, discretionary with regard to things like the rate of plugging. Um, so we, we do ask that the commission um, revoke this alternate program agreement um, and instruct the director to negotiate a new program um, that at a minimum includes a, a guaranteed plugging rate uh, and or a specified end date for the program. We believe given Noble's uh, number of um, idle wells um, that it's important that um, they do uh, continue to make steady progress on plugging these wells um, or, um, uh, uh, or, having, or returning them to service um, after um, mechanical integrity tests has been performed. Um, so the, lastly, I just wanted to address whether a complaint was the appropriate avenue to seek review. This has been a theme um, throughout this, today's hearing. Um, and I just wanted to note that the public is somewhat limited in its ability um, to seek review of a matter that's um, before the commission. The alternate to raising these issues of public concern in an administrative forum is a move to litigation much more quickly in order to protect public health, safety, and welfare. We don't believe that administrative avenues um, to challenge these should be foreclosed um, procedurally. Um, um, Guardians has had other matters of serious public concern dismissed on procedural ground um, where the commission doesn't really review the merits um, or the substance of the, the, the public uh, concerns. Um, complaints are intended to be uh, for the public 
to bring matters of public importance before the commission. And so we believe that um, this is the appropriate way to um, address uh, the perceptions of deficiency in the Noble Alternate Program um, and to request relief from the Commission. I'll end there. Okay, thank you, Ms. Merlin. Uh, which of the AAGs is taking this matter up? That would be me, Mr. Chair. I recognize Ms. Larson. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. The director's decision not to terminate the alternative program was not clearly erroneous. And I'd like to start uh, staff's response by emphasizing the question that is before the commission today. And the question is not whether today's commission would approve entering into the alternative program as it is, or whether the program is perfect. The question is whether the director's decision not to terminate the alternative program in response to Wegg's complaint was clearly erroneous, um, which as you'll recall, means that it was completely unsupported by the evidence in the record. Uh, Ms. Merlin did a, a good job of uh, summarizing the alternative program, so I won't dwell um, too much except um, to make some important points. Um, one of those is that the alternative program was established through an agreement uh, between the director and Noble. Um, and that agreement established or includes a termination provision. And that termination provision explicitly states the director can revoke approval of the program, and I'll quote, in the event the director identifies material deficiencies with Noble's implementation of the alternative program, end quote. So after receiving Wegg's complaint, the director in investigated the facts and reasonably determined that based on Noble's implementation of the program to date, there were not those material deficiencies at this time, and it was therefore not appropriate to terminate the program. This conclusion was based on input from in engineering staff who closely monitor Noble's compliance with the program. Also, I'll also stress that both rule five, or sorry, rule 326 um, and current rule 417, those are the MIT testing rules, specifically allow the director to approve an, to approve an alternative test or combination of tests to satisfy an operator's MIT testing obligations, as the director did here. I'll also note that it's rare that a COGCC rule will specifically allow for this kind of alternative compliance. Um, so this provision in the rule indicates that the decision to allow alternative MIT compliance was intentional. In allowing alternative compliance, the commission implicitly recognized that there could be situations where it is either not feasible for an operator to comply with the rule as written, or where requiring strict compliance may not be the most protective of public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources. Now, um, I was going to give, well, um, I was gonna give a little more background on the program, but I will skip through that in interest of time since um, Ms. Merlin gave a good background. Um, but I would like to focus on um, the allegations in the petition and um, the discussion that, uh, by Ms. Merlin of the list of wells that Noble committed to either returning to production or p and by the end of 2019. Um, and I'll refer to that as the priority well list. Um, so Wegg's complaint asked the director to order that any wells remaining on the priority well list would be p and immediately. Upon receiving the complaint, staff checked the plugging status of those wells and determined that they had all already been plugged and abandoned. Um, Ms. Merlin also pointed out that a number of those wells, um, I believe it was 30, were um, plugging and abandonment was completed later than December 31st, 2019, which was the date that was specified in the agreement. Um, for most of these wells, no Noble had already completed the downhole portion of wellboard plugging in 2019, uh, but then the final cut and cap was delayed past the end of the year due to issues that arose during plugging operations. Noble proactively communicated with engineering staff regarding these delays, and staff approved revised timelines for plugging and abandonment of the wells, reasonably determining that it was more important to ensure that plugging and abandonment was completed properly than to require it to be done by a predetermined deadline. Um, so the director's decision that these delays related to those wells did not justify terminating the entire program 
was not clearly erroneous. Additionally, to speak sort of just overall to the program, as Ms. Merlin mentioned, um, staff through the agreement has quarterly meetings with Noble to monitor compliance with the program and address any issues that may have arisen. At those meetings, Noble and staff um, walk through a spreadsheet that tracks the PA status of all of the wells remaining in the program and prioritizes wells where there may have been issues. Um, throughout these check-ins, Noble has, consisted, has demonstrated consistent implementation of the program. And on that basis, the director did not find that there were material deficiencies in implementation that justified revoking approval. Finally, to the extent um, that WEG argues that the director should terminate the program either because Noble has a high total number of in inactive wells or because Noble's plugging activity has slowed down, the director reasonably determined that neither of those allegations justified terminating the program at this time. Again, I'll remind the commission that the alternative program only includes a fixed set list of wells. That list never grows. It only shrinks as what wells are either p and or returned to the program and then removed from um, the alternative pro or sorry, wells are p and or returned to production and therefore removed from the program. So the total number of um, inactive wells that Noble um, owns is really not relevant to the question of whether they are diligently implementing the alternative program. Um, and I'll also note that Noble's wells outside of the program are subject to the COGCC's routine MIT testing requirements in Rule 417. Staff also reasonably found that Noble's plugging activity, that Noble was making good progress on the list, uh, despite WEG's allegations that plugging may have slowed down over the last year. Um, I think as, we, as we're all aware, um, activity throughout the industry has, has been in flux um, over the past couple of years due to pandemic and supply chain issues. Um, and staff feels that Noble is doing a good job, all things considered, in making progress through the alternative program. So I will wrap up by just again reiterating that we are not, we're not here today to litigate the merits of the alternative program or even for the commission to decide whether at some point the commission wants to learn more about this program, um, which staff would be happy to schedule for a different time. What we're here today is to have a decision on whether the director's decision not to terminate the program at this time in response to WEG's complaint was clearly erroneous. That is a high bar and it is one that WEG has not met here. Thank you. Ms. Mercer, uh, Ms. Larson, um, quick time check for Ms. Merlin and rebuttal. And before we, or as you're looking up that, um, I do note that we have Noble's uh, outside counsel and inside counsel with us. If either of you desire to make a statement now, we'd be happy to hear from you. And uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Merlin has one minute and 43 seconds remaining. Okay. Uh, Mr. Martin, Mr. Nybert, did either of you desire to make any presentation? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Noble has opted to rest on its briefs in this matter. They filed a both a response to the motion and a motion to dismiss, as well as an argument that, in fact, the Wild Earth Guardians has failed to demonstrate that the uh, director's decision was clearly erroneous. Both outside and inside counsel are available to commissioners to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Martin. Uh, Ms. Merlin, as was noted, you have a minute and change if you desire any final rebuttal. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think I'd prefer to, to uh, have my rebuttal address the, the sum of the complaints that we've filed uh, regarding mechanical integrity tests. Um, and that is just that mechanical integrity tests are a, a very important part of ensuring wellbore integrity. The commission is responsible for um, overseeing the wellbore integrity relating to over 11,000 wells um, via mechanical integrity tests. Um, we have a very large number of idle wells in this state. Um, they continue to age. Many of them are already uh, very old. We believe that this is an issue that is deserving of more commission attention. 
We don't believe that wholesale variances to um, mechanical integrity tests um, are appropriate. Um, Noble's alternate program exempts 1,300, more than 1,300 wells at the moment from mechanical integrity tests with no specific end date in mind. Um, we believe that uh, the commission should um, terminate that program as against public health, safety, and welfare, um, but understanding the difficulty of bringing that many wells back into compliance, um, negotiating another a, a, a schedule of compliance um, pro probably would be appropriate in that case. Um, the, proced the, the procedures and processes that it requires for staff to identify um, these mechanical integrity tests, as we heard at the beginning of the hearing, does require manual audit of information from several different sources, um, both inside COGIS, as well as um, in apparently paper files um, and, and, and possibly other sources. Um, this inefficiency, this inefficiency makes it uh, uh, all but guaranteed that there will be wells that fall through the cracks with regard to mechanical integrity test compliance. Um, um, you, your time has expired. Okay. Thank you. Wrap up. We, we believe it's very important for the commission to focus on uh, streamlining the processes that um, staff uses to implement their rules and to adopt simple rules that can be implemented effectively. Um, this is one of the simplest rules that the commission has to implement. It, it's simply a comparison of two dates, essentially. Um, and we see how much time and effort it takes to implement a, a, a rule this simple. Um, we believe that that has lessons to offer for the commission's other rulemakings moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Merlin. Okay. Um, I'm looking to my fellow commissioners. Does anyone have questions at this point in time before we sort of close the record? Okay. I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, I believe that uh, this matter is now fully submitted to commission. Uh, commissioners, looking to you, it is 1238. Do you want to take a, I think we had set aside about 40 minutes for a lunch break and then come back and deliberate? Um, or do you want to dive into deliberations now? I'm kind of in favor of the former, of taking a, a break and then coming back, but I could be persuaded otherwise. All right, I'm not seeing any, so let's take a break. Um, 1240, let's come back, 110, does that work? 30 minutes? Okay, 110, we'll be back on the record. Uh, commissioners, we'll give Jeff just another minute or two. I know he had a conflict between 115 and 130. So um, as soon as he gets back, we will get started.
All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Apologies that I had an unintended uh, need to attend something else, but we are all back here now. Um, I've got my five, our five commissioners are here. Um, we have the parties present, um, but we have um, moved into the deliberation phase um, of this matter. And so with that, um, we'd look to see if any commissioner would like to provide his or her initial thoughts. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I appreciate the party's presentations here today uh, and the arguments that were made. Um, I've got my thoughts broken down into three different sections. Uh, which in the pre-hearing statement seemed to uh, be how things were structured. Um, and so I'll just go through some of my thoughts on that. Uh, in the first section, um, it appears to me um, that in this particular argument, um, the, the argument is better made in a petition for rulemaking I think that there's both procedural and substantive problems with the petition for review. Uh, I think there was no Form 18 filed. Um, I don't think the relief requested is available in the petition for review. Um, uh, I think the petition was premature uh, and somewhat unclear and lacking in specificity. Uh, I do think uh, and appreciate the intent, and I do think that that intent uh, can be best presented in a petition for rulemaking, which is clearly available to citizens and organizations in Rule 529, uh, which does offer a pretty broad ability for uh, folks throughout the state to be able to ask the questions that are being asked in this particular petition for review. Um, this commissioner would move to uh, dismiss this section uh, of the docket. Um, in section two, which is the noble alternative program section um, in my notes, uh, I do think uh, that ultimately the goal is to plug in abandoned wells, uh, which is the best way to accomplish protection of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. Um, it appears to me from staff presentations and the information that I've read that noble has been diligent and communicative. Uh, regarding this alternative program that was developed. Um, there have been some revised timelines that COGCC staff has approved uh, through consistent communication with Noble, ultimately now Chevron. Uh, and I do think that the, the communication and the fact that we are progressing and what I would argue is the most important goal, which is the plugging and abandonment of these wells is uh, happening. happening. Uh, I see no basis uh, put forth that would indicate the, to this commissioner that the director's decision was clearly erroneous. Uh, and in section three, um, I think generally speaking, uh, staff has already issued NOAVs to the issues that are being brought up here. Uh, and so, um, Short of any outstanding issue that um, is not clear to me at this point, I think it's important that we allow the NOAV uh, process to continue. Uh, and so it appears that that uh, petition for review um, was also premature uh, in the process. Um, and so that's where initially I'm standing uh, in my thoughts on this. Thank you, Commissioner Messner. Others with thoughts? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in general, I agree with much of what Commissioner Messner has laid out. Um, section one, I think, is more of a policy discussion than an actual complaint or NOAV discussion. Uh, I'm not unsympathetic to some of the issues that uh, Ms. Merlin has brought up, and I think that we as commissioners even have, have experienced the difficulty of navigating COGIS and trying to figure out what is, what is timely, um, the consistency with which some rules have been applied, 
and the accuracy of the data that you can find on our public site. Um, that being said, and I think this is related to the, the NOAVs, I do think our rules also allows us some staff discretion as a whole um, and that that is important because we don't necessarily know what else is going on with an operator. Um, and I think that that piece for me uh, makes it clear that there's there's not a clear erroneous decision, decision that was made by the director. And as far as the noble piece is concerned, I think that was an agreement that was already um, put together under a previous commission. And I think from what I see, noble is still working uh, in good faith to meet the expectations of that agreement. And I think our staff, um, given that they're having regular meetings and going through the agreement and what's what the status of the wells are and the progress that's being made, um, I don't see an erroneous decision from the director to um, start again and, and get rid of that agreement at this point in time. So I'm pretty much thinking along the same lines as Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Commissioner McGowan. I am here. I turned my video off because my internet's shaky, but I can see all of you. Um, others with thoughts? Commissioner Nanjapa? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I tend to agree with my fellow commissioners. Um, and I, I uh, my internet blipped out there just for a second, so I don't know if Commissioner McGowan mentioned this at this point, but during the her questions and um, during the, the party presentations, you know, um, in speaking in particular about uh, the Section 3 issues and the NOAVs um, and, and how, you know, staff approaches those from um, kind of looking at a, a broader picture, I think is, is an important thing to, to also think about because, um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're choosing one thing and there's something else going on or there's several things happening, you, you kind of have to strategize and, you um, determine your timing on, on some of those things in a strategic manner. Um, so I, I also agree with Commissioner McGowan's point that I, I'm, I'm not unsympathetic um, to the issues that Ms. Merlin has raised and, um, and that there are, you know, there's room for improvement, but I also agree that, that this is more of a policy related um, consideration for the commission to take up potentially in rulemaking at some other point. Um, so beyond that, I'm in agreement with, uh, the commissioners. Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, yeah, I'm not going to say too much more. I agree with my fellow commissioners. Um, I don't believe that the decision by Director Murphy and staff was clearly erroneous. Um, and so I also agree with the commentary from Commissioner Najapa and Commissioner McGowan uh, about some of you know, the limitations with COGIS. Um, they exist, but also the importance of considering staff's holistic approach to enforcement and not just looking at it on a piecemeal basis. Um, or, or looking at kind of one aspect of enforcement. So in that regard, uh, that's where I stand on this. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, I echo the points made. And so I think we're all in agreement on this matter. Uh, the only other commentary that I would make is, you know, I don't think this is what the petition for review process was supposed to do. Um, and I don't, so that's point number one. But point number two is I want everyone, um, we've got 107 parties listening in, you know, if, if folks have a concern about the COGCC, about staff, about staff's actions, or about staff's inactions, reach out to the commissioners. All of our information is online. Our cell phones is online. Our emails is online. We're, you know, again, a five-member full-time commission. Um, so rather than resorting to, you know, legal approaches to things, if you think that something's not going the way it ought to be going, I, at least as one commissioner, I'm happy to have a discussion. So, and I, you know, I also know that you can reach out to Director Murphy, but um, we five are kind of over here and we're happy to take those calls. And I'm, I'm speaking for the rest of my commissioners, but I bet they would nod their heads up and down. Um, that they would be in the same place. So I just throw that out there, what it's worth. Uh, at this time, I think we're looking for a motion. Commissioner McGowan. 
Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm ready to make a motion yet. I, I guess I just want to respond a little bit to your thoughts, which I I, I think that the, the complaint avenue is um, an avenue that we want to protect and respect as commissioners, right? I think the, the process and the point being there needs to be some transparency in how things are or are not happening within the commission and with our staff. And I think that that is an appropriate avenue for folks to take if they legitimately are concerned that something is or is not happening or they can't get access to data to show that something is or is not happening. And I think that that is an appropriate tool to be used and for us to use. I also think that it's appropriate for folks if they think that something is lacking or that we need to make improvements. Yes, we're all accessible and we're here, but it's also another tool to request some sort of a rulemaking to make adjustments or improvements. Those are all tools I think that we have in front of us to ensure that we're holding ourselves accountable and we're being transparent and we're providing information that needs to get provided. And I think we can do better. Uh, and I think that we need to work on those pieces. So sorry, I, I just wanted to put that out there. I, um, I think there are pieces here that were done appropriately and points well taken and that we need to heed those, those points. Further discussion? Does anyone want to make a motion? Commissioner McGowan. Okay, so I'm not sure it's an appropriate, I'm, I think I would need some guidance from uh, AAG Davenport on the appropriate motion to make here, and then I will make a motion. <laughs> but I, what, Commissioner, uh, AAG Davenport, I, I, my motion would be that I, I don't think that the director was clearly erroneous in her decision in regards to the mo motion put forth by Wild Earth Guardians. So I, I'm sure that I need to say that differently. Uh, thank you, Commissioner McGowan. I, I, you have adequately stated, uh, the commission as a whole has adequately stated its rationale. So your motion does not need to include your rationale necessarily. Uh, I think it is sufficient for you to move to deny Wild Earth Guardians petition for review, if that's your pleasure. That is my motion, thank you. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, do we have further discussion? <clears throat> Seeing not, oh, Commissioner Nanjapa, did you just, no. You are about to vote. Okay, um, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, thank you to the parties for the presentations. And um, with that, I believe that concludes that matter on our agenda today. And I am looking for my agenda. I think we're now are turning to docket number 21080031. Uh, this is a matter involving Karis Piotz LLC. Um, so if we could get the appropriate uh, uh, representatives to the fore for this matter, um, that would be great. All right, and seeing a few people. Uh, Ms. Larson, I think I printed off the case management order, but I don't know that I printed off the final pre-hearing conference, which may dictate sort of the, uh, the line of activities that we're gonna hear. Can you help me with that? I certainly can. I'll refer that to you. And then in the interim, um, we're going to begin this matter with a determination if any commissioner has a conflict of interest. We'll then move into opening statements by the parties, and each party has five minutes for opening statements. And then we'll move into the case in chief, um, and each party has two hours for their case in chief. Okay, so uh, do we have any uh, commissioners with conflict of interest? Thank <laughs> you. 
do any of the parties believe commissioners have a conflict of interest? Because in the absence of us saying we don't, it looks like we all feel qualified to hear the matter. The petitioner does not believe there is a conflict of interest. Sure. Great. Mr. Kirk? <clears throat> There's no such concern from staff. Okay. Um, all right. Well, do we want to roll into opening statements? Um, hear from you and your client first, Mr. Messler? Yes, Chair Robbins. <clears throat> if I could clarify at the beginning, um, my opening statement is going to last more than five minutes. My understanding is that the additional time beyond five minutes will simply come out of our two-hour allocation. Am I correct? That is correct. Yes. Yeah, okay. that should be correct. And Ms. Larson, has she has done throughout our hearings will be the official timekeeper. And if at any time either party desires to know what time allocation remains, just ask and you shall be told. Well, good afternoon, commissioners, and happy new year. I'm Dave Neslin. With my colleague, Michael Goals, I represent Karis Peons, LLC, the applicant. The general counsel of Karis Allison Woolston is with us, but won't be speaking. At the outset, I want to emphasize that Karis is a good environmental steward who cares deeply about regulatory compliance and environmental protection. It spent tens of millions of dollars reclaiming more than 130 sites since 2017. It spent millions more last year remediating 83 legacy sites it acquired from other operators, and it employs a holistic grazing program to promote wildlife habitat, enhance forage, and reduce fire risk. During the past decade, Karis acquired thousands of producing wells from other large operators, including PDC, Noble, and Encana. These acquisitions include the well sites at issue. Initially, this case involved three well sites in a remote area of Garfield County called the Rhone Plateau, the G21, the D28, and the H29. Last month, the staff rescinded the corrective action for the G21, so you don't need to address that site. The D28 and H29 were constructed by Encana in 2006 and 2007 on a historic mine bench site. According to the limited information available, interim reclamation occurred at the H29 in 2012, and Karis suspects that interim reclamation occurred at the D28 at or about the same time. The COGCC inspected the sites in 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. One inspection report for the D28 noted bear cut slopes, but didn't impose a corrective action, perhaps because that was typical of the area. None of the other inspection reports for either site made a similar observation or raised any issue regarding revegetation or stormwater management. All but one of the reports specifically approved the stormwater BMPs. Based in part on these reports, Karis reasonably understood that the two sites satisfied COGCC interim reclamation and stormwater requirements when it acquired them from Encana in 2017. Last year, for the first time, the COGCC alleged that the two sites don't comply with revegetation and stormwater requirements and issued corrective actions. These inspection reports and corrective actions raise three important policy issues, which are the reason Karis applied for this hearing. First, can operators and prospective purchasers rely on prior COGCC inspections? Here, multiple inspections over many years didn't identify a deficiency in revegetation and approve the stormwater BMPs. The regulations weren't amended and no written guidance is issued. Inspection results shouldn't change because the inspector changes and new requirements shouldn't be imposed years after the fact. The frequent turnover in COGCC staff underscores the importance of this issue. 80% of the compliance group and all of the reclamation inspectors joined the agency after interim reclamation occurred in 2012. This issue also has implications for the statute of limitations if the subsequent inspection leads to an NOAB. Second, what ability do surface owners have to direct the reclamation of their land? The two sites are part of the 60,000 acre North Parachute Ranch that Karis and affiliates own and operate, which is roughly the size of Salt Lake City. Karis uses this land for range and wildlife habitat. Additional interim reclamation would disrupt this use 
and intrude on the space needed for ongoing remediation and future well maintenance at the H29A. The ranch is not open to the public. The sites contain mature vegetation that mirrors the native landscape, and there is no risk to state waters. Under these circumstances, Rule 1001C authorizes Keras as the surface owner to waive additional interim reclamation. Third, what deference is due the stated intentions of the commission when it adopts or amends rules? When your predecessors adopted Rule 1002F governing stormwater management in 2008, they specified that the test is whether the operator has exercised a good faith effort to implement BMPs and that the staff should apply a reasonableness standard. They didn't adopt a performance standard and they didn't prohibit erosion. The two sites contain a variety of stormwater BMPs, including grading, ditches, culverts, and vegetation. These BMPs, which Keras actively maintains in good faith, are exactly the type of reasonable conduct that the commissioners intended. My colleague, Michael Goals, will discuss the regulatory standards that apply to these issues. Keras will then call four witnesses to testify. First, you'll hear from Lindsay Ryder, the environmental health and safety manager for Keras. Lindsay has more than 15 years experience implementing and managing compliance programs for reclamation, stormwater, and other environmental requirements. She'll testify about the inspection history and current condition of the sites and the robust stormwater management program that Keras employs. She'll explain how the sites comply with the revegetation and stormwater requirements and how Keras satisfies the surface owner waiver requirements. Next, you'll hear from Beth, Brett Middleton, the environmental health and safety lead for Keras. He too has more than 15 years experience with environmental management and compliance, and he currently oversees Keras's extensive remediation program. He'll testify about how additional interim reclamation at the H29A would interfere with ongoing remediation work and future well maintenance. Next, you'll hear from BJ Russell, the Western Slope Operations Manager for Summit Services. Summit Services provides stormwater compliance assistance to oil and gas operators, utilities, construction companies, property developers, and local governments. BJ is a certified inspector of sediment and erosion control who has conducted more than 10,000 stormwater inspections. He'll testify about the numerous stormwater BMPs at the sites and how they continue to minimize erosion, protect waters of the state, and satisfy the stormwater requirements. Finally, you'll hear from John Andrews, the ranch manager for Keras. He has almost 20 years experience working on rangeland health, livestock grazing, wildlife programs, and habitat improvements in the Rhone Plateau. John is responsible for overseeing the North Parachute Ranch and implementing the company's holistic grazing program. And he's visited the area in question about 150 times. He'll testify about the current use of the area and he'll explain how additional revegetation would do more harm than good. The testimony of these witnesses will demonstrate that Keras is entitled to a declaration of compliance with rules 1003E and 1002F and rescission of the corrective actions. Rule 1003E is satisfied because the sites are adequately revegetated and compacted to stabilize them and minimize erosion with the consistent with the requirements of the rule and because additional interim reclamation would interfere with remediation and production at the H29A. In addition, Keras, as the landowner, may waive further interim reclamation under Rule 1001C because it owns the land and the work is unnecessary to protect the public or the environment. Rule 1002F is satisfied because the sites reflect a good faith and reasonable effort to implement and maintain a variety of BMPs to control erosion. This was true when the prior inspections occurred and it remains true today. If you decline to issue a declaration of compliance, you should still grant Keras a variance from the corrective actions. Keras made a good faith effort to comply with the rules. The corrective actions would cause disproportionate environmental disturbance and Keras shouldn't have to expand upon interim reclamation and stormwater BMPs that the staff previously accepted. Before concluding, I'd like to briefly respond to several points made by the staff in their pre-hearing statement and petition. First, the staff argues that the prior inspections should be ignored because they were conducted by field inspectors 
not specifically evaluating compliance with the 1000 series rules. But several of the reports address Rule 1003 in one manner or another, and all but one of the reports address Rule 1002F and approve affirmatively the stormwater BMPs. The staff may also argue that many of the inspections occurred when snow cover may have limited the inspector's observations. But while several reports note the presence of snow, many others do not, and two of the inspections occurred in the spring and summer. Second, the staff touts the expertise of the reclamation staff who inspected the sites last year. But Keras witnesses have equal or greater experience with reclamation and stormwater management, particularly in the Peons Basin. And Keras's witnesses also have much greater familiarity with the area. Third, the staff points to a 2003 Division of Minerals and Geology report. But the issue isn't the use or condition of the mine bench 20 years ago. It's the condition and use of the well sites now and in the future. And again, Rule 1001C authorizes Keras as the landowner to waive additional interim reclamation so long as the public and the environment are protected. Fourth, the staff suggests that Keras was uncooperative and recalcitrant in responding to the corrective actions. But as Exhibits 7 and 24 demonstrate, Keras promptly communicated its concerns by letter to the staff. Keras has also asked that the corrective actions be deferred and that no further action be taken until after this hearing. Staff characterizes this application as an attempt to go over their head. In reality, the inspections raise issues relevant to hundreds of sites, and Keras seeks clarity from the Commission to inform its ongoing efforts to comply with the 1000 series rules. That concludes our opening statement, Commissioners. I'd be happy to answer any questions or turn the mic over to Mr. Kirshner. Okay. Um, I'll look around and see if anybody has questions on the opening statement. Normally, we just take opening statements and then reserve questions for witnesses, I think. But someone has a question. All right. Seeing none, um, we would then recognize Mr. Kirshner. And again, just as I mentioned earlier, my internet is spotty. Um, I have kids now that are using my internet, and so I'm turning my video off, but I am here. So go for it, Mr. Kirshner. Thank you, Chair Robbins. Um, I'm going to attempt to keep our opening to five minutes. Uh, as requested, I'm also going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll um, address the details of our case in chief uh, later. Obviously, Karis is going to present his case in chief first, and um, I'll address that kind of in a brief reopening at the start of our case in chief. But thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Steve Kirshner. I'm one of your enforcement officers. Today, I'm going to be presenting staff's petition in response to Karis's application for various forms of relief intended to relieve Karis of compliance with rules 1002F and 1002.3 at these locations. Now, Karis first asked the commission for what it calls a declaration of compliance. It asked that the commission declare that contrary to the observations made in the field by expert reclamation staff, Karis is in fact in compliance with rules 1002F and 1003. Karis asks that you relieve it of the corrective actions assigned by staff to get these locations back into compliance with the rules. Now, I wanna note briefly, uh, the, the statements made by Karis in its opening statement are, are inaccurate as they apply to the previous inspections uh, of the locations and what, if any, precedent that would set for the current inspections. But we're going to get into that in our case in chief. Now, your reclamation staff visited these locations twice in 2021. Staff documented those visits in inspection reports and extensive photographs. Now, Karis is asking, based on the filings and the testimony you're going to hear, that you should evaluate the complex conditions on the ground at the locations and ultimately overrule decisions made by your staff on the ground based on their expertise, their experience, and the evidence. Your staff asks that you deny this request and simply enter an order requiring CARES to complete the corrective actions as assigned in the inspection reports. CARES asks next for a surface owner waiver that would relieve it of its obligation to comply with Rule 1003. Um, I would note at the outset here that surface owners cannot waive compliance with Rule 10 through F. So as we're speaking of the surface owner waiver, this would apply only to Rule 1003. Now on screen here is Rule 1001C. This governs surface owner waivers. As you listen to Karis's presentation today, 
I would ask you to, to keep in mind the standard set by the rule. In order for a surface owner waiver to be granted, Paris is required to demonstrate to the commission that compliance with rule 1003 is not necessary to protect the public health, safety, welfare, including prevention of significant adverse environmental impacts. Again, Keras bears the burden of demonstrating this to the commission's satisfaction. After evaluating the materials submitted by Keras, it's staff's position that Keras cannot meet that burden in this instance. And staff asks that you deny this request for a service on the waiver. Finally, Keras is asking today for a variance that would relieve it from its obligations to comply with rules 1002F and 1003. On screen here is rule 502C. This rule governs variance requests. So as you listen to Karis's presentation today, I'd ask that you keep in mind that pursuant to the rule, Karis bears the burden of showing that their variance application meets all of the five elements listed here. Based on expertise, experience, and evidence, staff determined that Karis's application does not meet all five elements of this rule. And as such, the commission should deny Karis's application for a variance. Staff looks forward to presenting its detailed information on the history of the locations and on conditions during the inspection, as well as a detailed evaluation of the requests both for a surface owner waiver and for a variance. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Nislin. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kirshner. Um, just looking real quickly to make sure we don't have any questions. All right, I'm not seeing any. Uh, Mr. Neslin, if you would proceed with your first witness. Certainly, uh, Commissioners, before we uh, introduce our first witness, my colleague, Mr. Goals, is going to speak to you about the relevant regulatory standards. <clears throat> Mr. Goals. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Michael Goals, and I represent Karis alongside Mr. Neslin. Today, you will hear testimony and review exhibits about on the ground conditions involving reclamation, hydrology, ecology, and other technical areas. Staff will certainly argue as they already have that they're the experts and thus deserve your deference. However, staff's expertise is only as good as their interpretations of the commission's rules. Thus, CARES would like to begin by clarifying the applicable standards. As we will show, staff has misapplied the regulations and issued corrective actions unsupported by rules 1002 and 1003. As we explore these standards, remember that the plain language of the rules governs. Staff may offer explanations of how these rules are applied in practice, but such application must first and foremost be consistent with the plain language of the rules. I'll address interim reclamation first. The inspectors rule 1003 corrective actions in this case focus on revegetation of the sites and staff emphasizes that vegetation must reflect conditions prior to oil and gas disturbance. However, rule 1003E contains alternative standards under which interim reclamation must be considered complete. Once surface disturbing activities are complete, the plain language of rule 1003E2 requires the commission to consider interim reclamation complete when either one, the operator achieves 80% vegetative coverage of disturbed areas or, or two, when all disturbed areas have been either built on, compacted, covered, paved, or otherwise stabilized in such a way as to minimize erosion to the extent practicable. Under the language of the rule, these are alternative standards, and the inspector in this matter failed to recognize that compaction and graveling can satisfy interim reclamation. If you find that Keras has compacted a portion of a site or applied any other method that stabilizes that area, you must consider interim reclamation complete. Even if the commission deems the language of rule 1003 ambiguous, at the very least, under any fair reading of the rule, compaction is appropriate for areas still reasonably needed for production. If you find that Keras does reasonably need portions of a site, such as for ongoing remediation or for well maintenance, you must conclude those portions comply with the interim reclamation rules. Turning to the, the option to revegetate portions of a site, where operators choose this option, the revegetation standard also contemplates alternative options for compliance. Specifically, vegetative cover can be based on either pre-disturbance conditions or reference area conditions. Staff does not get to pick and choose here. If you find that vegetation of a disturbed area reflects the condition of reference areas, you also must consider reclamation complete. There's no ambiguity in the language here. 
And as you evaluate this standard, consider the naturally erosive and unstable conditions of the canyons in which these sites lie, as well as the historical impacts of mining. The mountains are falling apart in this area, both naturally and as accelerated by Unical, the mining company. I'll reiterate that what is at issue here is interim reclamation. Harris absolutely under, intends to undertake final reclamation and concerns that these sites will be abandoned and unreclaimed indefinitely or unfounded. Were the commission to nonetheless deny Keres' request for Rule 1003 declaratory relief, the surface owner waiver provision of Rule 1001C plainly allows Keres to waive further interim reclamation here. Again, the language of the rule is unambiguous. The commission shall not require compliance with Rule 1003 if Keres can demonstrate to the commission's satisfaction that additional interim reclamation is not necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare including prevention of significant adverse environmental impacts. Rule 1001C also references an agreement between the surface owner and the operator, that the operator has entered into an agreement with the surface owner regarding topsoil protection and reclamation of the land. That provision would be superfluous here, where the surface owner is the operator. An agreement between Keras and itself would make no sense. If you find that additional revegetation is not necessary to protect the public and is not necessary to prevent significant adverse environmental impacts, you must respect Karis' wishes, Karis's wishes regarding use of the North Parachute Ranch. Relevant to this standard, you will see that substantial revegetation has occurred, that the well pads have already been substantially reduced in size, and that the areas targeted by the inspector comprise less than an acre among private land holdings in excess of 60,000 acres. Staff has failed to grapple with Rule 1001C in its petition or pre-hearing statement, simply concluding that surface ownership is irrelevant to compliance with Rule 1003E. But the explicit language of Rule 1001C wholly undermines that conclusion. Next, I'd like to address stormwater management. Rule 1002F requires operators to, in good faith, implement and maintain appropriate BMPs intended to minimize erosion, sediment transport offsite, and site degradation. Again, the inspector in this case identified areas where he believed BMPs were insufficient, where slopes had been, where slopes had not been sufficiently stabilized, or where he believed erosion degradation was evident. He thus concluded that Keras's stormwater BMPs were missing or inadequate. In essence, the inspector imposed a performance standard. He determined Keras had not minimized erosion or degradation enough. However, the rule does not require operators to prevent erosion or instability, and the standard of degradation evident applied by the inspector is found nowhere in the rule. Instead, Rule 1002 F3 provides the operative standard. The sites at issue are in the post-construction stormwater management phase. During this phase, Rule 1002 F3 provides that stormwater management shall reflect good faith efforts by operators to select and implement BMPs intended to serve the purposes of this rule. That is, BMPs must be intended to minimize erosion, sediment transport, and site degradation. An operator does not need to eliminate site degradation to comply with the rule, and that standard would be impossible to comply with. Rule 1002F2 illustrates possible BMPs and further informs the standard. 1002F2C, the provision cited by the inspector, lists, quote, erosion controls designed to minimize erosion, end quote. The rule does not require BMPs to satisfy a particular performance standard, and it certainly doesn't require them to eliminate erosion or degradation. Rather, operators must select BMPs intended to or designed to address these issues. This language well reflects the commission's intent in promulgating the stormwater rules. The commission expected, as Mr. Neslin explained, staff to apply the tests of whether the operator has exercised a good faith effort to implement BMPs intended to serve the purposes of this rule. The rule was intended to fill a regulatory gap that existed after CDPHE stormwater construction permits lapsed. Thus, the Commission's goal was for operators to employ common sense and good engineering approaches to prevent run-on and run-off from oil and gas locations from entering surface water. And ultimately, the good faith implementation standard makes perfect sense. You know, we can't forget to see the forest for the trees here. These are best management practices. BMPs are used precisely in regulatory circumstances where performance standards wouldn't be administrable. Erosion and site stability are site-dependent issues that will vary widely across the state, and there is simply no workable metric to evaluate whether erosion has been minimized enough. Instead, operators are expected to choose site-appropriate BMPs and install and maintain them in good faith. That's the standard. 
If you find that appropriate BMPs have been implemented at the sites and that Keras endeavors in good faith to maintain them, you must find that the sites comply with Rule 1002 f Finally, regarding Keras's alternative request for variance, the language of Rule 502 c is clear. Keras must show that it has made a good faith effort to comply with Rules 1002 and 1003. The requested variance will not violate the basic intent of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act. The requested variance is necessary to avoid an undue hardship. That granting the variance will result in no net adverse impact to public health, safety, welfare, the environment, or wildlife resources. And finally, that the requested variance contains reasonable conditions of approval or other mitigation measures. I think the second and third factors merit some elaboration. The second factor requires that the variance not violate the basic intent of the act. As you consider this factor, remember two of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act's statutory purposes. One purpose is to regulate oil and gas in a manner that protects the public environment and wildlife resources. You'll hear testimony today explaining why Keras's requested variance would actually promote this goal by avoiding environmentally harmful operations and massive site disturbance in an area where vegetation is healthy and wildlife frequently use the area. Staff argues that Rule 1003 implicitly weighs the trade-offs between short-term impacts and long-term benefits of reclamation work. However, staff fails to appreciate that the balance of these impacts changes dramatically when interim reclamation operations are repeated with no benefit to the local ecosystem or the landowner. Another purpose of the act is to manage operations in a manner that balances development with wildlife conservation. I'd respectfully ask the commissioners to pay close attention to testimony regarding Keras's holistic grazing operations. These operations are really the paragon of an operator managing operations to promote wildlife while still utilizing the energy resource. Next, the third variance factor addresses undue hardship. Staff has cited case law stating that financial hardship alone is not enough to satisfy this factor. However, staff ignores that, that the very case that they've cited also defines undue hardship as unnecessary or unjust hardship. The court in that case was clear that the appropriate calculus here is balancing individual hardship with the public interest. Karis's application asserts more than mere financial hardship. Karis can and does undertake reclamation at its sites. The issue here is that massive reclamation operations and the associated emissions, disturbance, and water consumption are unnecessary here and unjust given Karis's reasonable reliance on the inspection record of the sites. In sum, Karis respectfully submits that the sites comply with rules 1002 and 1003. At the very least, Karis's use of these lands as the surface owner must be respected given the lack of any impacts to the environment or the public. But if the commission reaches the question of whether to grant a variance, the commissioners should recognize the outsized and unfair costs and impacts of additional interim reclamation relative to the lack of benefits. Thank you, I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Looking around to see if folks have questions. Okay, not seeing any. Um, Mr. Kirshner, I'm gonna recognize you. Uh, it was sort of kind of a double opening there or an opening and a closing, I'm not sure what, but I would give you an opportunity if you wanted to respond to Mr. Goltz um, at all. I thank you for the opportunity, um, Chair Robbins. I think that staff's going to get into the interpretation of the rules during its case in chief. Um, I would merely say at the outset that staff um, feels that the interpretation given here fails to appreciate the nuance of the rules as applied on the ground. And I'll leave it in that and, uh, at that until we get to our case in chief and we expand on how each of these rules are applied um, at each site. Thank you. Okay, um, very good. Uh, Mr. Neslin, um, it would probably be appropriate if, if, if you have them all to bring all of your witnesses on board and we can get them sworn in here to begin with, and then we would do away with that requirement. Mr. Kirshner, if your witnesses are available, I know you were probably were thinking you were going tomorrow morning, but if they're available, we could swear them in too, and then we can take care of that procedure procedurality. Chair Robbins, um, our witnesses are available. Um, hearing, uh, hearings Manager Larson, we would have Aaron Trujillo and Denise Arthur. Um, they should both be available in the Zoom. I don't know if they're parties. We, 
we're bringing all the witnesses in right now. So give us a moment and we'll have everyone in in just a bit. Mr. Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think we'll start with Karis's witnesses. So I'd ask that the witnesses for Karis, if you, when you are admitted to the meeting, if you could simply um, bring yourself on screen so we can see you and know that you're ready to be sworn in. Chairman, all of Karis's witnesses have now been added. Very good. If they could. Uh, at, at a minimum, unmute themselves. Uh, at a maximum, they could also un uh, video themselves. That would be great. All right. So I believe I'm I'm seeing four what I assume are Karis witnesses. Mr. Neslin, is that correct? You're muted, Mr. Okay. Neslin. Apologize. That is correct. We will have four <laughs> witnesses who will testify. Uh, and, and they have all unmuted them or they have all uh, uh, brought their cameras on. Thank you, appreciate that. Uh, for all those witnesses, I'm just gonna simply ask you to raise your hand on camera to state your name and then say that you swear to tell the truth. We'll go, to, go one at a time. We'll start with Mr. Russell, then Ms. Ryder, then Mr. Middleton, and then Mr. Andrews. So again, please just raise your hand in that order say your name and state that you swear to tell the truth and that's all we'll need from you. Go ahead, Mr. Russell. Yes, yes, sir, thank you. My name is Brent Russell and I swear to tell the truth. My name is Lindsay Ryder and I swear to tell the truth. Mr. Middleton. My name is Brent Middleton and I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. My name is John Andrews, and I swear to tell the truth. All right, thank you all. Uh, you should consider yourselves sworn in for the entirety of this hearing. We will not re-swear you each time you appear, if you appear more than once. And with that, um, we will turn to staff's witnesses. All right, Mr. Trujillo, we'll start with you. If you could raise your hand, uh, state your name, and say that you swear to tell the truth. Aaron Trujillo, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. Ms. Arthur? Uh, Denise Arthur, I swear to tell the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, again, uh, same, same admonishment I just gave to Karis's witnesses. Consider yourself under oath for the entirety of the hearing, so we won't re-swear you if you appear more than once. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, AAG Davenport. Uh, with the procedural swearing ends, we now will move to the case in chief, Mr. Neslin. Yes, uh, Karis calls as its first witness, Lindsay Ryder. I think Ms. Ryder needs to be unmuted. Hello, my name is Lindsay Ryder and I am the HS manager for Karis. I've held this position for three years. In this role, I'm responsible and accountable for developing and implementing environmental health and safety programs to comply with all regulatory requirements in the states of Colorado and Utah. I oversee 16 employees and contractors. I'd like to provide a little background on myself to give some perspective regarding my dedication to my position. I was born and raised in Western Colorado. I left to attend college at the University of Colorado in Boulder where I obtained my geology degree. I worked for the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research where we analyzed water, soil, and air samples. After graduating, I became a staff geologist working to clean up impacted soil and groundwater from leaky underground storage tanks. In 2006, I had an opportunity to move back home to Grand Junction, where I was employed as an environmental specialist, initially implementing CDPHE and COGCC stormwater regulations for an oil and gas operator. My entire family lives in Western Colorado, where we have homesteads in Meeker and Glade Park. 
I care very deeply about conserving and protecting the environment and my home. I've worked in the Piance Basin for 15 years now, building and implementing environmental health and safety programs to comply with federal, state, and local regulations. CARES takes both its regulatory responsibility and its responsibility as a West Slope landowner very seriously. We have tremendous respect and appreciation for the unique ecosystem in which we operate. We are not seeking to escape compliance or frustrate the COGCC by submitting a petition under Rule 507. Rather, CARES is seeking clarity regarding the COGCC 1000 series rules, which we believe are being inconsistently applied and implement, implemented without regard to site conditions and site history. CARES thought very carefully about why we be implemented clearly and consistently to provide predictability and finality to operators like Keras who acquire and subsequently manage assets in challenging terrain over many years. Many of Keras's locations are on private lands owned by Keras. Keras's rights as the surface owner must be taken seriously. We are hoping that this hearing will both clarify our obligation under the 1000 series rules and recognize our rights as, as a private service owner and steward of our lands. The two producing locations that we are reviewing today were inspected on multiple occasions during the past decade. And those inspection reports did not identify any violations of or require corrective actions for the interim reclamation and stormwater rules. Seven COGCC and Field inspection forms were completed for the D28 prior to 2021, and nine COGCC and field inspection forms were completed for the H29A prior to 2021. A single inspection date sometimes involves multiple inspection reports. This historical information is important because it signifies to Keras that the conditions of the sites were not in violation of revegetation or stormwater rules until they were inspected by Mr. Trujillo in 2021. Next slide, please. Thank you. The D28 is currently an active location. Let me go back one. Uh, the D28 is currently an active location with eight producing wells. As you can see on this timeline, the D28 was constructed by Encana Oil and Gas in 2007. It was drilled and completed in 2007. You can see there were reclamation events occurring at the, at the initiation of construction and again at NRM reclamation. You can see in green here, the COGC inspections that took place over that time. And then as the green in Canada occupation uh, ends, you'll see that Keras acquired these assets July 15th, 2017, when one additional COGC inspection occurred in 2021. And then you can see the failed inspection when it occurred March 9th, 2021. Next slide, please. The H29A is currently an active location with eight producing wells as well. Again, this location was constructed by Encana in 2006. It was drilled and completed in 2006 and seven. You can see the multiple COGC inspections that took place over that time frame and the reclamation events that were recorded by Encana. Keras acquired this asset again in July, 2017. You can see one additional COGCC inspection occurred in 2021, and then the failed inspection, March 9th, 2021. As part of the acquisition process, Keras engaged an environmental consulting firm to perform environmental due diligence on the assets it acquired from Noble, PDC, Marathon, and Canna, and XTO. In the due diligence process, potential liabilities such as deficient interim and final reclamation were identified and an environmental reserve was created to bring those locations into compliance. In each of these transactions, the final due diligence reports were used to negotiate the acquisition terms and to determine, to determine when, excuse me, and to determine the amount of the environmental reserve necessary to bring non-compliant locations into compliance. The due diligence process is an essential and heavily negotiated component of every acquisition. It is therefore critical that the COGCC inspection results be reliable and informative. 
No environmental defects were identified on the H29A or D28 in the Encana due diligence process. Keras has taken its commitment to reclamation very seriously. Since 2017, Keras has completed 133 reclamation projects with another 29 planned for 2022. These totals include interim reclamation following drilling and completion activities and final reclamation following well plugging and abandonment. Many of these projects involve locations that, that Keras acquired from other operators. 57 of the 133 reclamation projects involved acquired locations as well as seven, sorry, um, as well as 17 of the 29 projects planned for 2022. What that means is 46% of the fine of all reclamation projects completed since 2017 have been associated with bringing locations into compliance with state and federal reclamation requirements. Again, CARES is not an operator seeking to escape its regulatory obligation. In 2017, oh, did the slide change for you guys? We have a frozen slide. I apologize. I'm going to carry on while we try to get the slide deck to move. We've got the in 2017, Keras acquired Encana's assets in the Peons Basin. With locations lie. During the due diligence effort conducted by a third party contractor, the inspection records in the COGC's database were reviewed. Again, those records did not indicate any deficiency in interim reclamation or stormwater management at those locations. Are, do we have Ms. Ryder frozen or is that on my end? Ms. Frozen. Uh, Mr. Nesland, if you want to appear. Yes. Um, I, I wonder, Lindsay, if you can hear this, if you um, eliminate your video, your own video, would that allow you to, to unfreeze? Or do you need to call in again? I think we've lost her completely, Mr. Nesland. I assume she'll call in promptly. All right, let's Here. hold the time, Ms. Larson. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the internet on the Western Slope. Ms. Larson, keep a lookout for Ms. Ryder rejoining the meeting as a participant. Um. Secretary Larson, I received a text saying that um, Ms. Ryder and Mr. Middleton are trying to get into the hearing, but aren't able to. Okay. Um, are, are they using the Zoom link that is found on the agenda? They should be. Okay. That's how they, that's what they use to access initially. Yeah. Um, Let's do this in the interim. I'll send them panelists in that. Uh, Ms. Larson, Lindsay Ryder is in the meeting. Appears. Angelica is bringing her in right now.
I think we have found Mr. Middleton as well. Uh, hello again, Ms. Ryder. Yes. Uh, I believe you were at this location map slide. So if you want to go back in your notes and like get to where you started, even if you double overlap a little bit, that would be, that's okay. We just want to make sure we hear all of your testimony. Thank you very much. In 2017, Harris acquired in Canada assets in the Piance Basin, which included the minerals and surface within the North Parachute Ranch, where the H-29 and D-28 locations lie. During the due diligence effort conducted by a third-party contractor, the inspection records in COGCC's database were reviewed. Again, those records did not indicate any deficiency in interim reclamation or stormwater management at those locations. Based on the due diligence report and Karis's own inspection of the sites, Karis did not anticipate that previous determinations would be reversed, deeming sites non-compliant with the 1000 series rules. The challenge that Karis and many other operators in Colorado are facing is the inconsistent application of the COGCC 1000 series rules and inspection corrective actions that reflect a misinterpretation of the rules. These 1000 series rules have not changed. But what has clearly changed is the inspection staff's interpretation and application of the rules in ways that impose standards not contained in the rules. Inconsistent verbal and informal guidance have been presented to operators every few years. When an agency's regulatory stance changes but the rules do not, operators are at a loss for how to remain compliant. The retroactive application of new guidance is wrong, unfair, and forces operators to continually chase new interpretation. In the place of consistency and predictability, operators are forced to hit a moving compliance target as the interpretation of the rule changes from year to year and from inspection to inspection. When the goalposts continually move like this, operators feel like they're in a constant state of gotcha. Compliance becomes almost impossible with this approach as it puts a huge burden on the operate, on operators like Karis, who put in an extraordinary amount of time and energy into achieving compliance. As noted in our submission, the H-29A and the D-28 were constructed in 2006 and 7 by Encana. Interim reclamation plans were not required when these locations were permitted or constructed. No record of interim reclamation site plans could be found on the COGCC database. The sites were constructed on a historic mine bench shown on the slide that we are looking at now. The mine bench is a man-made structure that runs the length of about 7,200 feet along the northern edge of the east fork of Parachute Creek, spanning widths in excess of 600 feet, with a relatively flat upper bench and terrace lower slopes. There is no public access on or through the privately owned ranch. The entrance, entrance is gated with 24-hour surveillance. No one lives on the property. The mine bench is composed of spent shell from past oil shell retour operations and overburdened material removed from adjacent mine shafts. Construction of the well sites involved minimal leveling of the mine bench and limited disturbance of native slopes. Location records that were transferred from Encana to Karis in the acquisition indicate that reclamation of the sites to manage stormwater and further stabilize the site was completed at the time of construction in 2012 and again in 2016. In addition to acquiring these locations, upon transfer of the asset in 2017, Karis assumed responsibility for the open remediation project on the H-29A. Continue, Karis continues to conduct remedial work on a former drilling pit. The former pit occupies the northeastern corner of the well site and spans a distance of approximately 260 feet. The ongoing remediation activities preclude further reclamation of this portion of the pad where there are active remedial wells installed. Brett Middleton will further address remediation activities that are ongoing along the northern area of this location in his testimony. The COGCC inspection cited that the H-29A was not in compliance with 1003B. The inspection section under areas no longer in use received a failed status. And the corrective action states that Karis must conduct reclamation on areas not needed for production. And on the D-28, it was noted 
that it was observed in this inspection that uniform vegetation establishment is not progressing towards COGCC 1003 reclamation standards. The H29 has a total disturbance of 4.87 acres. The location was reduced to 2.75 acres of working surface and 2.12 acres of NRM reclaim. The working surface areas of the well site are necessary for equipment safety spacing, truck traffic, workovers, maintenance, and for ongoing operations and remediation activity. The average working surface of a typical multi-well pad in this region is between 2.5 and 3 acres. The H29 working surface falls in line with that average at 2.75 acres. Reasonably needed has not been clearly defined in Rule 1003. Operators have re received verbal guidance from COGC staff on how far the NRM reclaim should be from equipment. Those distances have varied between 75 and 100 feet over the years and have been inconsistently applied depending on the COGCC inspector and operator. For the safety of our employees and those accessing our locations, CARES considers the following activities when determining the working surface area. Wildfire potential and mitigation practices, future occupation potential, planned workover and other maintenance activities, remediation activities, including land farming and on-site remediation, equipment spacing distances, adequate and safe travel routes, snow removal and storage, et cetera. The agency, should be dis the agency should be sensitive to operators' insights and allow for these operational and safety practices when determining a safe and adequate working surface area. In, in any event, the reclaimed areas have been apparent since 2012. And at no time before this year did any COGCC inspection suggest that additional areas needed to be reclaimed. The COGCC inspector conducted his inspections of the H29A and the D28 on March 9, 2021. Early March in this area is typically in, still in winter conditions. The vegetation being assessed was dormant at the time of these inspections. Can you go back one slide, sorry. Putting aside the, that Karis would like to use these areas for operations, Karis does not believe that additional reclamation is warranted on the H29A for several other reasons. First, the corrective action is instructing Karis to revegetate the northwest and southeast portions of the site. But revegetation isn't the only way to comply with Rule 1003. Rule 1003E also considers interim reclamation complete when disturbed areas are built on, compacted, covered, paved, or otherwise stabilized in such a way as to minimize erosion to the extent practical. These sites, which overlay oil shell tailings, are already stabilized and do not show signs of erosion in the areas where the inspector criticized the lack of vegetation. The compacted gravel surface of the northwest portion of the site can be seen on this slide. With regard to the claims that vegetation is inadequate on the slopes, the reclaimed slopes are comparable to the reference areas outside of the pad disturbance. You can see how these reference slopes are naturally bare in many instances. This is true for the D28 location as well. Here, here we've included, next slide. Here we've included the COGCC inspection photo taken of the D28 slope in June. It is clear that the vegetation was comparable to the offsite vegetation prior to the hydro seeding. We believe that this location is in compliance with Rule 1003 and should not be required additional reclamation until final reclamation. As John Andrews, Karis' ranch manager, will further describe, Karis uses the mine bench as part of its holistic grazing operations which involves rotational grazing to promote wildlife habitat and control fire risk. Revegetation is currently adequate for these purposes. There is no indication of environmental harm here. The sites are on a manufactured man-made mine bench. There is no public access. No one lives near these sites or recreates near them. There is no indication of sediment transfer or erosion off site or evidence that any site destabilization poses a risk to the East Fork of Parachute Creek. 
Keras's annual baseline water sampling program indicates that there has, have been no known impacts to water quality in this area. Revegetation meets Rule 1003 standards and continues to progress despite the challenging conditions. If Keras is required to recontour and reseed additional areas of the already compacted well pad, a significant amount of fill material will need to be transported from offsite sources. The project would take approximately 20 days. The machine hours required to import the material, place it against the slopes, contour the material to redefine a three to one slope, distribute topsoil and seed are estimated at 1,090 hours and consumption of an estimated 8,480 gallons of diesel fuel. Burning this amount of diesel fuel would release approximately 190,000 pounds of CO2. This estimate does not include machine time and fuel utilized in efforts to apply fresh water to, to roads to control fugitive dust emissions. These impacts are significant for a site that is currently in a stable and safe condition. Now I want to address the stormwater corrective actions cited in the inspections. Please note that the H29A and the D28 slopes were reseeded and mulched on July 27, 2021 to comply with the stabilization and stormwater corrective actions issued in the inspection. You can see the coloration in the photos shown on the slide. The hydro seeding with a bonded fiber matrix, matrix mulch is a best management practice or BMP for stabilizing steeper slopes. The inspector's comment states that the D28 it was observed in this inspection that stormwater and erosion control measures are missing or insufficient to stabilize and protect slopes along the northern interim areas of the location and that erosion degradation was evident. The corrective action states that Keras must install or repair uh, required BMPs per rule 1002 F2C and ensure control measures are adequate for site conditions are installed in accordance with good engineering practice practices and are maintained in proper, proper functioning order. The corrective action is vague and leads no, one to believe that no stormwater controls are effectively in place. After 15 years, the location has held up quite well given the steep terrain in which Incana constructed the location. The location has been landformed in a way that incorporates natural drainage features. The location is sloped in such a way that water will drain towards the ditch below the cut slope and not off the location. The run-on protection ditch above the location carries the majority of the stormwater around the location and away from the pad surface. The location is seeded and stabilized with mulch. This is designed exactly to protect erosion of the cut slope. The slopes also appear to have been terraced to slow the velocity of water when precipitation hits them. The pad surface has been graveled and compacted. The access road that around, runs along the southern edge of the location has a compacted and vegetated berm that does not allow any water to move down the much larger slope on the mine ditch. All of these control measures are part of the treatment system for this location. The ap application of treatment trains work together to prevent erosion and offsite transportation of any pollutant source which is the ultimate objective in stormwater management. A compliance determination cannot be based on, a, on the performance of a single BMP. And despite the inspector's determination about revegetation, you can see the vegetation coverage is actually very good. Now we will move over to the H29A stormwater control. Best management practices include a well-vegetated ditch that runs, runs below the slope to protect it from erosion, mature vegetation that stabilizes the soil, and a culvert which any high flows are diverted and discharged to an armored slope. These BMPs all work together to protect the slope and site more generally by reducing erosion and preventing pollutants like sediment from leaving the location. Keras has also implemented administrative controls that include access restriction during storm events and maintenance protocols during seasonal precipitation timeframes. No sediment or pollutant source is leaving these locations. No impacts of water quality have occurred and the BMPs in place are adequate for the precipitation events that occur at this location. 
BJ Russell, our stormwater and reclamation specialist, will further comment on stormwater management in his testimony. I do want to add, Keras has Im implemented a robust stormwater program to comply with both CDPHE and COGCC regulations. We utilize ArcGIS for infield mapping and for producing site diagrams, a remote inspection program for real-time inspections and, and corrective action notifications, a work order process to track and close corrective actions with adequate documentation. We comply with the CDPHE 7, 14, and 30-day inspection frequency and the COGCC post-construction stormwater management requirements. All of our internal and external inspectors and construction staff have been certified through the CDOT CDPHE trainings. Our construction staff have a full-time maintenance program for lease roads and pads, which includes grading, blading, resurfacing, and BMP maintenance. All CARE staff attend an environmental awareness training in the spring of each year to review regulatory requirements, including stormwater management protocols. Keras hosted a full day stormwater training in 2019 after the new CDPHE stormwater permit went into effect. Keras invited all potential construction and reclamation contractors to help ensure that the new requirements would be passed along to anyone working on our locations. Most recently, we collaborated with Triton Environmental, a company that provides stormwater BMP material, seed, soil amendments, and mulching supplies on a workshop that was held yesterday. The workshop was developed for our staff and contractors in order to train new staff and refresh old staff on stormwater and reclamation requirements while also introducing new methods, products, and technique to help improve stormwater and reclamation performance. Again, Keras is not an operator seeking to escape its regulatory obligation. In summary, interim reclamation has been achieved and Keras' stormwater management program continues to comply with the rules. This is to, so despite the fact that the sites were constructed on a historic man-made disturbance, the prior CRGCC inspection records did not indicate any deficiency in interim reclamation or stormwater management at these locations, and the success of interim reclamation and stormwater management at these sites is still apparent today. Keras has maintained compacted or graveled surfaces that stabilized the northwest and southeast portions of the H-29, and in, in any case, veg, revegetation would interfere with the ongoing remediation. The northern slopes have been revegetated, and those sparse and small areas still reflect reference areas, which are often very sparse or bare. Additionally, Keras owns these sites and all the land around them. We manage them as part of the holistic grazing operation. Because the conditions of the sites are protective of the, of the environment and the public, the COGCC should defer to the intended uses. Keras's stormwater management on these two location, locations also comply with the rules. We have implemented BMPs at these sites that are appropriate for the conditions and designed to minimize erosion. We continue to maintain these BMPs and they are working. Staff cannot simply cherry pick small portions of the sites and claim that Keras's BMPs don't minimize erosion enough. That's not the rule. Ultimately, these locations will be final reclaimed when the wells are PMA. For now, the locations in their current state do not threaten to impact water quality or public health, safety, welfare, the environment, and wildlife resources in any way. In closing, Keras's objective is to comply with all applicable regulations. We have worked very hard to implement the new regulations that went into effect this past year. We respectfully request that COGCC apply the 1000 series rules consistently over time. If the COGCC decides to change how it interprets the rules, then it should issue new guidance that is developed with stakeholder engagement and the changed interpretation should not be unfairly and retroactively applied to our historic locations. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you for that testimony, Ms. Ryder. Um, commissioners sometimes have questions. I'm gonna suggest that we hold questions until after there has been an opportunity for cross-examination. Um, so if commissioners are okay with that, uh, we would turn to Mr. Kirshner at this point for any cross-examination that he may have. Thank you. And um, at the outset, Ms. Ryder, I want to thank you for your testimony and your presentation. Um, I want to 
say that we appreciate your dedication to the area and to the lands involved here. I'm just going to ask you some questions about your presentation and some of the exhibits that you presented. Um, so first, you started out kind of by talking about the due diligence involved and in reviewing previous inspection reports. Now, you told us that um, you reviewed those inspection reports and you didn't see any issues with stormwater protection. I think that goes to an important part of the rule here that I'd like to get into with you. Um, when it comes to stormwater protection, is it Karis's interpretation of the rule that if a previous inspection doesn't identify an issue with stormwater, those controls are therefore in compliance in perpetuity? No. I mean, as I mentioned, our stormwater program, we are continually observing, inspecting our locations, and we have a maintenance program already implemented. Um, so we wouldn't assume that we would do our inspections as our program um, indicates. Thank you. And Karis is aware of the requirement that those BMPs be both implemented and maintained in an ongoing fashion. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. You talked again about due diligence. Um, you talked about um, interim reclamation having been completed at the sites. Um, are you familiar with the requirements under the rules if an operator believes that interim reclamation has been completed? Uh, what are you referring to? Um, if I could, I'm going to share my screen briefly. Can you see um, what I'm showing here, um, this PDF? Ms. Ryder, sorry, I, I can't hear you. Yes, I can see that. Thank you. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Um, what I'm showing you here is rule 1003E3. Uh, and this rule requires that if operators believe interim reclamation is complete, the operator is required to submit a sundry notice, form four, describing the interim reclamation done at the site, any mitigation measures performed, uh, and include a series of photographs that would document that. You stated that Karis's belief is that interim reclamation has been completed. Um, in its due diligence when it acquired these sites, did CARES find any form four stating that interim reclamation had been completed? No, but my experience with the form four process is that uh, COGCC staff is very reluctant to approve any form fours for interim reclamation. Um, in the one attempt that we made to clear one, it took almost two years with the landowner requesting that the interim reclamation be released. Mr. Ryder, I'm I'm going to interrupt you because this is not in the scope of your testimony. Um, and if I can reclaim my time, thank you. Um, has Karis ever submitted a form four for interim reclamation at these sites? Not these locations, no. Okay. And finally, has Karis ever seen an inspection report or any communication from staff that says specifically that these sites have passed interim reclamation overall? No, but I do not believe that that is the process for any location. I've never received that correspondence from any on any location that we manage. You've never seen that on an inspection report, the blank that says overall interim reclamation? Um, it, it is very, very rare to see an interim reclamation pass. I, I, I honestly cannot tell you if I've seen one. I'm gonna move now to some of the photographs that you uh, showed us. Um, you showed us a number of photographs, both from the D28. Actually, let me, let me start here. You showed us briefly a couple of timelines um, and that plays into those photographs that you showed. You described some work that had been done at the sites. Um, I'll start with the D28. Specifically, um, your timeline called out some reseeding and some mulching work done on July 29th, 2021 and some weed treatment that was done on August 17th, 2021. Is that correct? Right. Would you say that the reseeding work and the mulching work goes directly to um, issues of interim reclamation, revegetation, and stormwater? Yes, we did that in response to the inspection and our okay. own stormwater management program inspections. Thank you. Um, now you referred, you kind of used these photographs to describe the conditions of the location. Um, you contrasted those with staff's observations, but the photographs you showed were from July 29th. That was after staff's visit, isn't that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. So the photographs you show don't provide an adequate picture of the location as staff observed it both on March 9th and July 22nd, is that correct? Yes, I suppose so. Okay. Um, and finally, 
um, has CARES filed any field inspection report resolution forms related to the work that was done in response to the corrective actions to the B-28? No. Okay. I'm going to move to the H-29A. Um, can you I, also can I add, just really quick, our, it is my understanding that the field inspection resolution forms are not required. Also, I just want to put that on the record. Um, we, do, we, we do typically do them, but because this was a sensitive case and we had submitted letters directly to the director, this, was, this location was being treated slightly different than how we would normally respond to correct action. I would um, just kind of at the outset, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that during our case in chief, but um, as of January 15th, those field inspection resolution forms are required, but we'll talk about that a little bit during our case in chief. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the H-29. Um, the, the pictures you showed of the H-29A also showed work done that was subsequent to staff's inspections. Is that correct? Yes. So the photos you showed of the H-29, those don't represent the conditions of the location when staff was on site. Is that correct? Um, that is correct. We did apply seed and mulch to these, these slopes. So Karis is before the commission today, um, and Karis is stating that Mr. Trujillo's impressions of the site, his documentation of the site, the corrective actions that he assigned, Karis is saying that those are incorrect, and yet Karis went out to the site and repaired the BMPs, um, seeded to do some revegetation work, and basically made efforts towards those corrective actions. Isn't that correct? That is correct. I wanna move a little bit um, to talk about your testimony about the areas that are required for production. Um, I'm going to show you, I hope this works because I'm not great at Zoom. I'm gonna show you um, one of Karis' exhibits. Can you see um, this map that I'm showing here, these aerial photos? Yes. Uh, do you recognize what I'm showing you here? Yes. Is this the H29A? Yes. And is this Karis's photo or is this staff's photo? Uh, I believe that is ours. Okay. Um, I'm gonna pan up here to this legend here and um, the darker shading is what Karis refers to as the working surface. The blue shading is what Karis refers to as total boundaries, the total disturbance boundaries, okay? So, um, Looking at this photo now, you talked about the area of the pad that's needed for working operations. I'm gonna, um, can you see where my pointer is over the west side of the location? Yes, I can. Karis's figure here acknowledges that this is part of the total disturbance, but not part of the working location. Is that correct? Yes, that's the gravel stabilized area. Yes. Okay. How would you characterize the vegetation in this location? Um, I would characterize it as sparse as you saw in my photos, but it is the gravel there is stabilized and compacted and there's no erosion coming from that location. And again, there's no, um, Karis is not alleging that this area is needed for production, is that correct? Um, Brett Middleton will address what the working surface area is intended for and there is a little bit of trickle over um, if we needed parking for our work over rig. Okay, thank you. And then um, I'm panning over here. Can you see this area? Is this the B28? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then um, this blue area, that's not this, this little shaded area, this blue area, this is what Karis refers to as the total disturbance boundary. Um, can you briefly characterize the vegetation um, at the portion of the site where my pointer is located? I would characterize that vegetation as very good currently. Okay. Thank you. I wanted to address one more thing. Um, you spoke at the end about, about Karis's concerns and, and impacts that are kind of um, involved in ongoing reclamation operations. You referred to film material being transported. You referred to machine hours being used. Are these concerns unique to Karis? Uh, that, those are typical construction costs, I believe. Okay. And, <laughs> Is it correct for me to say that every reclamation operation necessarily requires things like water use, um, mitigation of dust impacts, and the other things you cited? They typically do, if they're moving material from one location to another. And finally, um, you talked about the vegetation being dormant at the time of the March inspections. Um, you're aware that staff visited the location in July, on July 22nd, 20, uh, 2021, is that correct? That is correct. 
Was the vegetation dormant during that inspection? Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's all I have, Ms. Ryder. Very good. Uh, Mr. Neslin, do you have any um, additional questions of your witness? You'll need to unmute. Thank you, Chair, yes. Um, Ms. Ryder, why has Karis not submitted a Form 4 uh, for interim reclamation at the, at the site? It's not required and it's not a typical process for us because we're just inviting uh, the C COGCC inspection staff to issue whatever corrective action they feel like issuing. Um, it's not productive for us. It's typically very costly when we issue those. They're reluctant to, to pass in our reclamation. And, and do you have any understanding as to what the practice is of other operators in the peon space and operating near the areas with, with where you operate regarding submitting Form 4s for interim reclamation? I do not believe any operator is doing that for the same reason. Um, you answered several questions about photographs, um, both photographs taken uh, during the, the uh, early, I think early spring by Mr. Trujillo and then additional photographs taken both by Karis and by Mr. Trujillo in, in July. Um, it, did you have any concerns about the ability of the March photographs to reflect revegetation at the site? Yes, absolutely. That's why I included it in my testimony. I think that um, reclamation inspectors shouldn't be evaluating the success of revegetation when, when vegetation is dormant. Um, I agree that you know vegetation should be assessed during growing growing seasons. So the July timeframe, June, July, August makes much more sense. And why did Karis do hydro seeding uh, at at one of the sites last summer? Uh, I mean, one, we were trying to be a good steward and show that we you know want to comply and want to you know be cooperative on those issues. Additionally, though, we would have found some of those bare areas potentially needed a bit of mulch to be further stabilized. Um, it, was, it was a good faith effort um, in hopes that you know, we could find common ground here. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. Uh, Chair, I have no further questions at this time. Okay, um, I believe this witness is now available for questions from commissioners. I'll just start out. Um, Ms. Ryder, in you, this may have been part of your testimony. You had a lot of testimony that you read. Um, but um, getting back to the Form 4, no Form 4, and you're not aware of other operators doing that, what's your understanding of sort of the interim reclamation sign off sort of approach that is? happening on the ground in the West Slope or with you guys? Uh, I, I'm not aware that there is a process for interim reclamation sign off. Um, I, you know, I wasn't aware of it uh, with, from Encana's um, ownership of the sites. Um, I haven't seen it in our due diligence process for any of the assets that we've acquired. Um, as far as I know, we're, those requests are not being made. Okay. And the, the additional work that you did, you just answered, Mr. Neslin, that you were being a good steward. Amplify on, on that for me. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, you know, obviously this didn't become a petition, a deck action, a variance overnight. Um, has there been back and forth to try to work through this issue? Is, is, is that what was going on? No, you know, I mean, um, we receive a lot of corrective actions. And what we were starting to see was just a more aggressive approach of the reclamation staff going back to these historical sites, 
and requiring much more activity and much more, I would say, aggressive measures. Um, that is why we, we thought we need to bring this forth so that we know how this is going to take place on future locations. We need to understand what we are required to do because we would much rather be doing this work um, on our own accord, not in response to a corrective action from COGCC. We would like to know and fully understand what's, what is going to be required on every location um, so that we're not responding to these sorts of things. And we felt that these were a bit above and beyond what that good faith standard is in the rule. Um, we're here today to just get that clarification. Yes, we did hydro seed and hydro mulch low slopes in good faith as a response. In the event that we do need a landowner variance, we are in compliance with the stormwater requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, looking to fellow commissioners for questions. Um, I saw Commissioner McGowan and then Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Ms. Ryder, for your testimony. I just have a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I, I think I heard in testimony that it was important to have kind of consistency in inspections, not getting different results because you have a different inspector. But it, would it also be say, uh, would it, there also be a case where you might get a result from a different inspector because something has changed in the rules? So for example, I think what I'm hearing is that there was some updating of the storm water requirements. And so might it be the case that past inspections have shown that what you've been doing for best management practices for storm water were okay in the past, but as those rules evolved, for example, CDPHG updated their stormwater requirements, an, another inspector coming in or even the same inspector might come up with a different result. Uh, the CDPHG rules change for new construction. The COGCC rules have not changed for um, post-construction. So I mean, the rules for stormwater have not changed on this location. We continue to maintain the all the BMPs on this location as part of the post-construction stormwater management program that is required by COGCC, but there haven't been additional requirements there. Okay. Um, can I, 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 I think as I was reading through um, the background and the pre-hearing statements or whatever we, sorry, I'm not sure those we call them, but um, I, I feel like you're coming to the commission before you've allowed a process to play through and I'm just wondering if you could address that a little bit. So I, you know, in some kind of past things that have come in front of the commission, the corrective action is an opportunity to open the door to a conversation and to say, uh, we'd like to, you to come and view this site. We have pictures from when we purchased the site and it looked that way originally, um, or to your point, some of the things that you were sharing with the commission it, it's unclear to me that that dialogue has taken place with our staff to allow that to play through and for Karis to make its case and perhaps staff come to the same conclusion that you want the commission to come to. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. So in, in this case, um, I'm gonna tell you, our, our, our action was immediately just a letter to the director. And I'll tell you why, you know, the communication with the reclamation staff has deteriorated to a point where we, when we ask uh, questions, we never get called. If we request a phone call, we don't get a phone call back. We get an email. Um, when we try to ask questions through an email, we get more COAs put on um, the request. It's been very challenging to get clarity around our, um, like if we have a question about a corrective action. So our, our course of action on these was to take it to the director. When we, had, we addressed some of these issues through our trade organizations, sometimes we were just told, well, take it to the commissioners if you don't like our response. And that's where we're at today. We, you know, we fought similar issues. And, and in this case, we thought, you know what, it's time to get clarification from the commissioners on these issues because we're gonna keep having them if we don't. Uh, thank you. And then, um... Am, am I, I think that I understood your testimony to be that um, some, some of these reclamation, interim reclamation issues um, are not complete, that they, they might get addressed 
fully, I don't know if I'm saying this right, when you do final reclamation. So that maybe, I think what I hear you saying is the seeds, I'll use the seeding, the reseeding as an example, is, is good enough right now for interim reclamation. And then when Karis comes back and does final reclamation, that that would be improved upon. I'm not, I'm trying to make sure that I'm understanding what that testimony was about. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Right now, it is in an operating state. We are producing uh, wells on location. We have all the controls in place. It is not eroding, it's not polluting. Um, everything is in a stable condition. Um, we as a, a Karis will absolutely come back and reclaim, final reclaim these locations. Our intention is to reestablish the contours and address these areas that have been noted. Um, our, our intention is to bring in topsoil if there isn't enough available and fully revegetate these locations. Okay, thank you. And sorry, I, I'm hopping back to a previous question because it just, I, I just wanna be clear it, for this particular instance and what you're bringing to us now, you, you have not reached out to staff on these corrective actions and how you see things differently for this particular case. There's, there hasn't been that dialogue. There hasn't been a formal dialogue we, we may have called Miss Arthur very early on to ask some questions um, around some of these issues, but I, I don't have formal dialogue on this one. Okay, thank you. Mr. Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Ryder for the testimony. Um, I just have some questions to better understand the layout um, from your perspective. I think you had indicated that the working pad surface is, is about 2.75 acres, is that right? But then you had indicated that there's, a, I think, another two point some acres that was kind of interim recl reclamation or not necessarily working pad surface. That's correct. And that, and that additional two point something acres, is that compacted or is that vegetated? I'm just a little confused as to what the state of that is. So that, that is the, uh, the image that uh, we were just looking at there. Um, most of it is vegetation. There is a portion of it that is a compacted gravel surface and it's at the entrance of the location. Okay. And But it's not working pad surface, right? So it's not being utilized as a uh, right. Uh, and I say that kind of loosely because if we did have a, um, a large snow event, that would be an area we could potentially push snow um, to, to store it um, during winter operations. Because it's compacted and in an unstable condition, it could be used as a, as a space for that. And I appreciate you read my mind as far as which site I was talking about. I now realize I didn't indicate that, but it is H29A. Um, and uh, and then how, how close is that site to East Fork? I haven't done that measurement myself. Um, I'm sure somebody could figure that out pretty quickly, but it, it is, uh, the elevation is quite different from the, where the mine bench is and where East Fork sits. Okay. But I assume that as you're looking at stormwater management and particularly sedimentation, leaving site, that that's your primary concern is um, sedimentation heading towards the East Fork, right? Absolutely. And, and that's why I went into the detail that I provided about all of the best management practices that we employ there. Our, our goal really is to have no stormwater leaving that location. And one of the things that I thought was interesting from those pictures um, and having a little bit of experience with stormwater management with land use um, applications, but it appears that there's a couple of pretty significant drainages coming in from the hillside above this particular site that can put quite a bit of load onto this site, particularly across compacted areas. And I assume those are all being taken into consideration regarding stormwater management on this site. Both of those locations have run on diversions above the cut slope that you can see in the photos that are the diversions come on around and into some sediment retention areas. Okay. Okay. Um, and then just a little bit of uh, 
I'm trying to just understand your interpretation of the existing rules. And so in uh, 1003, there's a couple of different conversations in there about compaction. One is it talks about interim reclamation requiring, you know, ripping up compacted areas and revegetating. And then there's another area that could be interpreted as allowing compaction, although it's certainly not clear. And some of these two sections perhaps conflict. Um, what's your interpretation of that? You feel like compacted is appropriate or is revegetating a more appropriate um, state for interim reclamation? I think it depends on the, the use. Um, I, in the case of the H29, the compacted surface, I think it's just as sufficient as of what a revegetated slope would be. Um, I don't see them, the revegetated slope being better in this case. Um, obviously, during final reclamation, we, we do want revegetation, but for interim reclamation, I think a compacted surface is, is adequate and sufficient and complies. And then as far as performance versus prescriptive, um, and at least in my experience with stormwater management, it is a performance-based piece because there is so certain prescription things you can do, but you certainly, based on site conditions, based on different situations, you're, you're going to utilize different prescriptive measures in order to ultimately get to the performance standard, which is the elimination of stuff coming off of the site, for lack of a better term, uh, particularly sedimentation and or waste. Um, I mean, is it fair to say that stormwater management in as many ways a, a performance-based standard utilizing, you know, some prescriptive measures? Yes, I would, I would definitely agree with that. Okay. Uh, appreciate your testimony. It was helpful for me. Thank you. Questions from commissioners? Okay, uh, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I didn't have any further questions. I do not believe we have any further questions. Uh, I believe I've been informed that this was the one witness for this afternoon and that we would start back up in the morning, um, but I wanna check with the parties. Mr. Neslin. Um, Chair, Chair Robbins, that's, that is my ref recollection of what we had discussed earlier this week. Um, and, and we would be prepared to, you know, begin tomorrow morning at whatever time you wish. Uh, Mr. Kirshner. My recollection was that it was two witnesses, but if the commission wishes to break at this point, uh, we don't necessarily object to that. Obviously staff is prepared to continue with the hearing um, this afternoon, uh, as long as the commission is willing to go. Uh, commissioners, what's your pleasure? Um, go ahead, Commissioner Gonzalez. Thanks Chair. Yeah, I, I have a hard stop at 515, otherwise I'm, I'm I'm otherwise flexible, so uh, I'll leave it to, to you and to the parties. Mr. Neslin, if we were to go one more witness, do you know who that would be and how long that would be? <clears throat> that would be, yes, that would be Brett Middleton would testify next. Um, I, I suspect that you would be able to complete him within the next hour. Chair Robbins, um, can I ask hearing officer, or hearing manager Larson for just the time check, including um, Karis' portion of its opening? Certainly. So Karis has one hour, 20 minutes, and six seconds remaining. Staff has one hour and 57 minutes remaining. Thank you. And let me clarify, Chair Robbins, when I estimated one hour, that was not simply our direct. I was trying to allow time for Ross and commissioner questions and redirect um, in that estimate. Commissioner Messmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think if we can, I would certainly be interested in getting one more witness in this afternoon. Okay. Yeah. 
then why don't we do that? Um, why don't we take a five minute break um, and then we can come back and knock out that last witness for the afternoon. So come back at 3.33. Uh, I see that we have our witness. Um, I think we're waiting on Mr. Neslin. I'm sorry, Chair, I'm on. Oh, okay. Uh, we can't see you, but that's fine. Uh, okay. Do you, want, do you want to call your next witness? Yes, our next witness will be Brett Middleton of Karis. Hello, my name is Brett Middleton. I'm the environmental lead for Karis' uh, Colorado asset. The last two years, I've been responsible for program management of stormwater, SPCC, remediation, and incident response, along with my team of three in-house staff and supported by multiple external environmental construction and support companies. I've been employed with Karis for, for the uh, last four years and my previous title was Senior Environmental Specialist with my focus was on remediation, project management, and incident response. To provide a little background about myself, I graduated from Illinois State University with a bachelor's degree in science of environmental health sciences. After graduation, I moved to Chicago and began working for an environmental consulting firm, traveling around much of the US working on environmental projects in mining, chemical and oil refining, and railroad remediation and compliance. In 2006, I was provided an opportunity to move to Colorado and work in the oil and gas industry. Initially, my focus was on water quality, and from there I transitioned to site remediation, which has been my focus for the last 15 years. I've been with CARES for four years, and prior to that, I worked for Encana, the original operator of these locations. In 2021, with the change in the 900 series rules, CARES completed a comprehensive data review of the asset and identified all open spills, and remediations from previous operators. CARES developed an aggressive plan to remediate and close as many of the open liabilities as possible. In 2021, CARES has successfully closed 83 liabilities, including facility closures, spills, and remediation projects. An additional 50 liability requests for closure have been submitted and we are waiting on staff review and approval. CARES is actively managing 87 historic and recent facility closures, spills, and remediation projects. Of these, CARES has determined 32, 32 will take greater than one year to complete. CARES has identified the H29A historic pit closure as a remediation site, which will require multiple years to achieve closure. The first map I'm presenting is a 2021 aerial overview of the H29A site. The north is at the top of the screen and the access road can be seen at the bottom of the screen. In the center of the pad, there's eight producing wells, and to the south of these wells, there's two gas lift skids. Um, gas lift is utilized for, by forcing compressed air down the casing, which acts as a carrier to facilitate the transport of gas and liquid up the production tubing. To the left of the gas lift skids are chemical tanks and pumps containing corrosion inhibitor, which is injected into the well to add protection to well tubing and associated flow lines. The bottom left corner of the pad contains two metering skids for measuring flow into the gathering system. The top right corner of the pad, there's a historic pit and remediation site. The next site will zoom that feature. In the top right corner, you'll see a black rectangle which represents this historic pit boundary. And there'll be purple dots 
which have proposed additional soil borings, which I'll discuss later. I've reviewed Canada's historic excuse, records. Excuse me, Mr. Middleton, I, I believe you're, you're, uh, you're behind a slide. Is my map not progressing? Sorry. I think there's a bit of a delay. Yeah. Restarting screen, screen sharing, apologies. Okay, sorry about that. The black rectangle represents a historic pit boundary, and the purple dots are proposed additional soil borings, which I'll discuss later. I've reviewed in Canis historic records, and with my own knowledge, here's my understanding of the H29 remediation project. The project began in 2012 when Incana initiated closure of the completions pit. The pit was emptied and above liner solids were disposed of. The pit liner was removed and pit assessment activities began and visual stainings of soils were removed for disposal. The site was drilled in 20, 20, 2013, excuse me, to determine subsurface soil impacts. At this time, soil vapor extraction wells, SVE for short, were installed to initiate in situ hydrocarbon remediation. These wells can be seen in several photos in the exhibits. I have provided one example here. This photo shows an SVE well behind a concrete barrier with a wind powered air exchange device attached to it. In 2017, CARES acquired the Piance asset from Incana and took over remediation activities of the H29A site. In 2021, CARES hired a consulting company and their senior geological engineer to complete a comprehensive site review and develop a site investigation plan. To, des to design a vertical and horizontal drilling assessment plan for the remediation site. Based on this assessment, CARES plans to drill additional soil borings at the location shown on the map. This remediation is not utilized for production activities and has, been and has barricades in place to protect the SVE wells. The COGCC has requested that CARES conduct additional site reclamation activities to reduce pad size of the location footprint which Lindsay previously presented on. However, by reclaiming the northwestern and southeastern portions of the pad, CARES would not be able to complete necessary future production activities, including well maintenance, work over, and plug and abandonment activities. Rule 602K further constrains uh, by requiring a minimum distance of 100 feet from the wellhead for vehicles not necessary for drilling production or well servicing. In order to provide safe turnaround with trailers and large equipment, additional spacing is often necessary. I'm going to present one of many possible site configurations to you to provide an example of how the site equipment could be laid out based on work over activities I have seen during past visits. So on this, on this slide here, the center of the pad is our eight wellheads. Um, in the top right corner. Sorry, Mr. Middleton, we can't see the exhibit you're describing. Sorry. Oh, great. there's something now, but it doesn't, I don't think it matches what you're saying. Are you, okay. So this should be the H29A pad that we're seeing with wellheads in the center. There should be a orange rectangle. In yes. The right hand corner. Thank you. Okay. So that orange re rectangle represents the remediation site and the SVE wells within that site. Uh, Below that is the access that comes into location on the far left side. As you can see here, this is, uh, there's a lower access to get onto the pad. The pad is actually built higher than the road. So vehicles have to make a large sweep to get into there. Um, smaller pickups have no issue with this. Larger semis take a much larger approach to get into the location and they do access into some of that uh, 
left area that was previously mentioned and uh, there was concerns about. Um, so I've also added two circles on the location. The center location circle has a 75 foot well setback and the circle to the left is where our thermogen is located, which also has a BMP for care setback because that is a gas fired um, uh, piece of equipment. So a thermogen produces uh, electricity, which then powers communication for the location. If Keras is to complete work over activities, numerous pieces of equipment are brought to the location. I'm going to illustrate what the site layout could look like for a replacing tubing or removing solids within tubing string on a single location. The first one we have here is a yellow box representing the um, uh, workover rig that would come in to do maintenance on a well. Uh, just for reference, that workover rig is 70 feet in size. The next box I've located on, locate on the site is for the accumulator. The purpose of this is a, a trailer that gets brought on location. It has the power to operate the BOP, which is your blowout prevention device. Uh, the next thing I've located on the, on the map is a um, in the, the blue box up on the top left, which is the rig pump. Uh, that is used for um, pumping water downhole in the event we have to kill the well. Next box located on there is the rig tank. Uh, the rig tank contains fluid for that, um, for the rig pump to operate on. Uh, the next two boxes I place are both frack tanks. Uh, these two frack tanks will also contain fluid on location. Uh, to be noted, all these tanks must stay outside of the 75 foot buffers. The next box I've put on here is the green rectangle, which is to the left of the wellheads. This represents a booster unit which is used to facilitate mineral and scale and solid removal. A gray box has been placed below the well heads, and this represents a pipe wrangler. A pipe wrangler is used to stand up tubing for rig use. Next, I've placed a small gray box, uh, a rectangle, which is on location. This is where we stack pipe out. It's our pipe rack, and it can be seen to the left there. Uh, next look box that was put on there is two uh, pipe floats. Those are two red rectangles. Those are up in the top left corner below the rig tanks. Uh, those pipe floats there are semi-truck uh, trailers and those are what transport pipe on and off location. And then finally, I've represented a tan box on the far right side of location. I think it's delayed there, sorry. That tan box is a general uh, area that represents our mobile office, temporary restrooms, facilities, um, miscellaneous equipment staging and vehicle parking. Um, that's also where safety meetings would take place for anything that's occurring on location. So as you can see in this approximately 2.5 acre site, it fills up pretty quickly with well maintenance equipment, particularly when a remediation site is taking up a large portion of the pad. The interim reclamation and pad sizing is based off of setbacks and, and known well maintenance activity to safely compete on -site, complete on-site tasks. In looking through Karis's records, the H29A has had workovers on site six times and the adjacent well pad to the east has had 11 workovers over the life of these wells. Karis should not be required to undertake additional reclamation, which would interfere with the pit remediation and well maintenance activities. In my conclusion, I would like to state that all the area on this location is absolutely necessary for future safe operation on this location. Okay. Um, this point, uh, Mr. Kirshner, do you have a uh, cross? Thank you. Um, I also want to appreciate you showing the picture of the dog. It was very cute. Um, so I'm going to share my screen one more time. Hopefully it works. Can you see this aerial that I'm showing? I can. Okay. And um, can you identify this? Sorry, could you identify what I'm looking at? Yes. That's the H29A well site. And Karis has labeled, um, as I went over with Ms. Ryder, Karis has labeled this blue area as the total disturbance area and this darker area here as the working area. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I'm going to show you um, another image. One moment. Um, 
can you see um, this aerial photo? I can. And just kind of generally, can you identify what this shows? Uh, so we're looking at the pad site. Uh, wellheads being in the bottom, kind of what I uh, laid out there. I'm not sure what the blue boxes are identifying. Um, That's okay. Um, I, but this is the H29A, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So these, um, what I'm showing you here, it's labeled as approximate areas of locations disturbance that are not necessary for production. Now, I recognize there's probably some distance between Keras and staff on exactly which portions of the location are no longer needed. But it also seems like there's some, some overlap here, right? Um, this Western triangle here. Um, Keras would agree with staff that this is no longer needed for production, correct? Uh, that section of, of the location is not used for regular production, correct? Okay. And staff um, obviously permitted Keras to keep this access area here um, for getting equipment on site. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, I know there's some disagreements about the extent of, of the area here, um, but it seems like the parties agree. Can you see where my pointer is? I can. Okay. It seems like the parties agree that this area, for instance, is no longer needed for production. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And just one more thing. You talked a little bit about the remediation project that's been ongoing for a long time at this location. Um, if this image represents the approximate extent of the areas that staff would like to see reclaimed, does, are, is staff asking Keras to reclaim the area of the remediation or the soil bores? Uh, of the remediation area? No, they're not asking for that. One thing I would like to clarify, you asked about the area, and I'm, I'm assuming when your ham was on the vegetated area, you were meaning that area was not for use, not the blue area? Right. I, I think there's a dispute between Keras and staff as to whether this entire area is required for production. So I'm not talking about that area. Okay. Yeah, the vegetated area we are no longer using. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, so it's been Keras's testimony here today that interim reclamation is complete um, and that everything is, is done and ready at these sites and this, that the commission should simply declare that Keras has already reclaimed this area. Um, has Keras filed anything to let staff know that this area has been reclaimed, that these areas no longer needed for production are fully revegetated um, and ready for reinspection? Uh, to my understanding, that submittal would have been done by the previous operator at the time of reclamation. Okay. And once again, obviously there's a contrast between the two aerials that I showed you. The, the areas that staff believes may be necessary are not necessarily the same as, as what Keras says, but why doesn't Keras simply file a field infection report resolution form, um, say we've, ex we've done this to the extent and present some of the evidence that you've shown um, about what they need for ongoing production operations. Um, yeah, I guess I would point to what was already uh, mentioned by Lindsay is um, I don't think that's been effective and there hasn't been a clear path forward um, for ever receiving an interim reclamation to be complete that I'm aware okay. of. Um, I appreciate your testimony and I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Can you redirect Mr. Neslin? Yes, Mr. Middleton, could you please bring up your last uh, exhibit that you uh, spoke to regard with, with, with the uh, polygons and, and setback lines? Yes, one second. Okay, I think that's it there. Mr. Uh, Mr. Middleton, what is the effect of the remediation area on the northeastern portion of the pad? What effect does that have on the area that is available for interim, might be available for interim reclamation in the um, southeastern portion or western portions of the pad? The southeastern portion, um, as I've got um, depicted here, there's the gray box. That's a staging area that we would use um, in the event we were doing work. The other thing I would like to add is this representation I put in was, was just designed off of working on 
the farthest north and western well. If we were to work on the southeastern well, everything would rotate and the rig would then be pointing on that end of the location. Rig tanks would then have to move over to that area and we would move the staging um, area up into the north um, west corner of the pad, essentially reversing everything. And you're limited with how much you can do on site. You know, you have, we have piping constraints um, and you know, sizing. You know, this, this might look like it's a large area, but when you look at the scale, we're only looking at 300 feet as the bar. That entire site, you know, when you put a 70 foot rig on it with 75 foot up setbacks, and then with the remediation cell in the northern portion of the pad, there's, there's not a lot of working area here. It's really pretty limited. The arrow on the um, uh, southwestern portion of the site, the concave arrow, what does that reflect? Yeah, so that area there, that arrow there, I, I should have did a better job of explaining that. So basically what we have is where that's pointing to is our pipe rack. So when you're doing a work over and you're moving tubing, um, or you're removing tubing from the well, you stack it on the pipe rack. If you're gonna put new tubing in, all that old tubing then gets moved over to the pipe float, which is the semi trucks. And all that's done by forklift. So you have to have an access for forklifts to maneuver around. Now we can still drive past that and you can access that site for production and things that are still going on from the rest of our team. But it is an entire work area where a forklift has to have clear. Remember these sticks of pipe are you know, 40 feet long. There's, there's a significant amount of turning radius necessary to move those. And, and finally, Mr. Middleton, the um, area on the far Northwest, which I think Mr. Kirshner referred to as a triangular area. Um, it, it, when you account for the turn in from the road, um, do you know what the approximate size of that area is? Uh, I have not measured that area. So I, I cannot be? answer that right now. All right. Uh, nothing further at this time. Unmute. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Looking to my fellow commissioners to see if folks have questions. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions at this point in time. All right. Um, well, I think that we decided we would do one more witness a little quicker than we thought. Um, just for framing the stage for the rest of this, Mr. Neslin, you have one more witness, is that right, or two? Two more witnesses, Chair Robbins. Was, was that a two? Sorry. Yes, sir. Two. Okay. And then you've got two witnesses in the morning, Mr. Kirshner as well. That's correct, Chair Robbins. Um, we're going to have two witnesses. Okay. Uh, time check, Ms. Larson? Yes, one moment. So Karis has one hour, six minutes, and 14 seconds remaining, and staff has one hour and 53 minutes remaining. Okay. Um, I think we have then reached where we're gonna to get to today and would look for a motion, unless there's further discussion from commissioners, but a motion to continue this matter to tomorrow morning. I believe we're set to reconvene at 9 a.m. So moved. Second. All right. Uh, thank, we wanna thank the parties for their presentations um, so far. We will look forward to hearing from the remaining witnesses tomorrow, and then we would move into deliberations uh, uh, after closing statements. Um, and so we have a motion and a second to continue to 9 a.m. tomorrow. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are uh, adjourned until tomorrow morning. Everybody have a safe night. <laughs>